Principles of Geology, Chapter 28, Part 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jonathan Reed. Principles of Geology by Charles Lyle. Chapter 28, Part 2. Thermal Waters Augmented. It is stated by Grimaldi that the thermal waters of St. Euphemia in Terra di Amato, which first burst out during the earthquake of 1638, acquired in February 1783 an augmentation both in quantity and degree of heat. This fact appears to indicate a connection between the heat of the interior and the fissures caused by the Calabrian earthquakes, notwithstanding the absence of volcanic rocks, either ancient or modern, in that district. Bounding of detached masses into the air. The violence of the movement of the ground upwards was singularly illustrated by what the academicians call the sbalzo, or bounding into the air to the height of several yards, of masses slightly adhering to the surface. In some towns, a great part of the pavement stones were thrown up and found lying with their lower sides uppermost. In these cases, we must suppose that they were propelled upwards by the momentum which they had acquired and that the adhesion of one end of the mass being greater than that of the other, a rotary motion had been communicated to them. When the stone was projected to a sufficient height to perform somewhat more than a quarter of a revolution in the air, it pitched down on its edge and fell with its lower side uppermost. Effects of Earthquakes on the Excavations of Valleys The next class of effects to be considered are those more immediately connected with the formation of valleys, in which the action of water was often combined with that of the earthquake. The country agitated was composed, as before stated, chiefly of argillaceous strata, intersected by deep, narrow valleys, sometimes from 500 to 600 feet deep. As the boundary cliffs were in great part vertical, it will readily be conceived that, amidst the various movements of the earth, the precipices overhanging rivers, being without support on one side, were often thrown down. We find, indeed, that inundations produced by obstructions in river courses are among the most disastrous consequences of great earthquakes in all parts of the world, for the alluvial plains in the bottoms of valleys are usually the most fertile and well-peopled parts of the whole country, and whether the site of a town is above or below a temporary barrier in the channel of a river, it is exposed to injury by the waters either of a lake or flood. Landslips from each side of the deep valley or ravine of Terra Nuova, enormous masses of the adjoining flat country were detached and cast down into the course of the river, so as to give rise to great lakes. Oaks, olive trees, vineyards, and corn were often seen growing at the bottom of the ravine, as little injured as their former companions, which still continued to flourish in the plain above, at least 500 feet higher and at the distance of about three quarters of a mile. In one part of this ravine was an enormous mass, 200 feet high and about 400 feet at its base, which had been detached by some former earthquake. It is well attested that this mass traveled down the ravine nearly four miles, having been put in motion by the earthquake of the 5th of February. Hamilton, after examining the spot, declared that this phenomenon might be accounted for by the declivity of the valley, the great abundance of the rain which fell, and the great weight of the alluvial matter which pressed behind it. Dolomieu also alludes to the fresh impulse derived from other masses falling and pressing upon the rear of those first set in motion. The first account sent to Naples of the two great slides or landslips above alluded to, which caused a great lake near Terra Nuova, was couched in these words, Two mountains on the opposite sides of a valley walked from their original position until they met in the middle of the plain, and there, joining together, they intercepted the course of a river, etc. The expressions here used resemble singularly those applied to phenomena probably very analogous, which are said to have occurred at Fez during the great Lisbon earthquake, as also in Jamaica and Java at other periods. Not far from Soriano, which was leveled to the ground by the great shock of February, a small valley containing a beautiful olive grove called Fra Ramundo underwent a most extraordinary revolution. 
innumerable fissures first traverse the river plain in all directions and absorbed the water until the argillaceous substratum became soaked, so that a great part of it was reduced to a state of fluid paste. Strange alterations in the outline of the ground were the consequence, as the soil to a great depth was easily molded into any form. In addition to this change, the ruins of the neighboring hills were precipitated into the hollow, and while many olives were uprooted, others remained growing on the fallen masses, and inclined at various angles. The small river Carity was entirely concealed for many days, and when at length it reappeared, it had shaped for itself an entirely new channel. Buildings transported entire to great distances. Near Seminara, an extensive olive ground and orchard were hurled to a distance of 200 feet into a valley 60 feet in depth. At the same time, a deep chasm was riven in another part of the high platform from which the orchard had been detached, and the river immediately entered the fissure, leaving its former bed completely dry. A small inhabited house, standing on the mass of earth carried down into the valley, went along with it entire and without injury to the inhabitants. The olive trees also continued to grow on the land which had slid into the valley and bore the same year an abundant crop of fruit. Two tracts of land on which a great part of the town of Polistena stood, consisting of some hundreds of houses, were detached into a contiguous ravine and nearly across it about half a mile from their original site. And what is most extraordinary, several of the inhabitants were dug out from the ruins alive and unhurt. Two tenements near Melito, called the Messini and Vaticano, occupying an extent of ground about a mile long and half a mile broad, were carried for a mile down a valley. A thatched cottage, together with large olive and mulberry trees, most of which remained erect, were carried uninjured to this extraordinary distance. According to Hamilton, the surface removed had been long undermined by rivulets, which were afterwards in full view on the bare spot deserted by the tenements. The earthquake seems to have opened a passage in the adjoining argillaceous hills, which admitted water charged with loose soil into the subterranean channels of the rivulets immediately under the tenements, so that the foundations of the ground set in motion by the earthquake were loosened. Another example of subsidence where the edifices were not destroyed is mentioned by Grimaldi as having taken place in the city of Caranzaro, the capital of the province of that name. The houses in the quarter called San Giuseppe subsided with the ground to various depths from two to four feet, but the buildings remained uninjured. It would be tedious, and our space would not permit us, to follow the different authors through their local details of landslips produced in minor valleys, but they are highly interesting as showing to how great an extent the power of rivers to widen valleys and to carry away large portions of soil towards the sea is increased where earthquakes are of periodical occurrence. Among other territories, that of Sincafrondi was greatly convulsed, various portions of soil being raised or sunk, and innumerable fissures traversing the country in all directions. Along the flanks of a small valley in this district, there appears to have been an almost uninterrupted line of landslips. Currents of Mud Near San Lucido, among other places, the soil is described as having been dissolved, so that large torrents of mud inundated all the low grounds like lava. Just emerging from this mud, the tops only of trees and of the ruins of farmhouses were seen. Two miles from Loreana, the swampy soil in two ravines became filled with calcareous matter, which oozed out from the ground immediately before the first great shock. This mud, rapidly accumulating, began ere long to roll onward like a flood of lava into the valley, where the two streams uniting moved forward with increased impetus from east to west. It now presented a breadth of 225 feet by 15 in depth, and before it ceased to move, covered a surface equal in length to an Italian mile. In its progress, it overwhelmed a flock of 30 goats, and tore up by the roots many olive and mulberry trees, which floated like ships upon its surface. When this calcareous lava had ceased to move, it gradually became dry and hard, during which process the mass was lowered seven feet and a half. It contained fragments of earth of a ferruginous color and emitting a sulfurous smell. Fall of the Sea Cliffs Along the seacoast of the Straits of Messina, near the celebrated Rock of Scylla, 
the fall of huge masses detached from the bold and lofty cliffs overwhelmed many villas and gardens. At Gian Greco, a continuous line of cliff for a mile in length was thrown down. Great agitation was frequently observed in the bed of the sea during the shocks, and, on those parts of the coast where the movement was most violent, all kinds of fish were taken in abundance and with unusual facility. Some rare species, as that called Cicciarelli, which usually lie buried in the sand, were taken on the surface of the waters in great quantity. The sea is said to have boiled up near Messina, and to have been agitated as if by a copious discharge of vapors from its bottom. Shore near Scylla inundated. The prince of Scylla had persuaded a great part of his vassals to betake themselves to their fishing boats for safety, and he himself had gone on board. On the night of the 5th of February, when some of the people were sleeping in the boats, and others on a level plain slightly elevated above the sea, the earth rocked, and suddenly a great mass was torn from the contiguous Mount Jachi and thrown down with a dreadful crash upon the plain. Immediately afterwards, the sea, rising more than twenty feet above the level of this low tract, rolled foaming over it and swept away the multitude. It then retreated, but soon rushed back again with greater violence, bringing with it some of the people and animals it had carried away. At the same time, every boat was sunk or dashed against the beach, and some of them were swept far inland. The aged prince, with 1,430 of his people, was destroyed. State of Stromboli and Etna during the shocks. The inhabitants of Pizzo remarked that on the 5th of February, 1783, when the first great shock afflicted Calabria, the volcano of Stromboli, which is in full view of that town and at the distance of about 50 miles, smoked less and threw up a less quantity of inflamed matter than it had done for some years previously. On the other hand, the great crater of Etna is said to have given out a considerable quantity of vapor towards the beginning and Stromboli towards the close of the commotions. But, as no eruption happened from either of these great vents during the whole earthquake, the sources of the Calabrian convulsions and of the volcanic fires of Etna and Stromboli appear to be very independent of each other, unless, indeed, they have the same mutual relation as Vesuvius and the volcanoes of the Phlegrian fields and Ischia, a violent disturbance in one district serving as a safety valve to the other and both never being in full activity at once. Excavation of Valleys It is impossible for the geologist to consider attentively the effect of this single earthquake of 1783 and to look forward to the alterations in the physical condition of the country to which a continued series of such movements will hereafter give rise without perceiving that the formation of valleys by running water can never be understood if we consider the question independently of the agency of earthquakes. It must not be imagined that rivers only begin to act when a country is already elevated far above the level of the sea, for their action must of necessity be most powerful while land is rising and sinking by successive movements. Whether Calabria is now undergoing any considerable change of relative level in regard to the sea, or is upon the whole nearly stationary, is a question which our observations, confined almost entirely to the last half century, cannot possibly enable us to determine. But we know that strata containing species of shells identical with those now living in the contiguous parts of the Mediterranean have been raised in that country, as they have in Sicily, to the height of several thousand feet. Now, those geologists who grant that the present course of nature in the inanimate world has continued the same since the existing species of animals were in being, will not feel surprised that the Calabrian streams and rivers have cut out of such comparatively modern strata a great system of valleys, varying in depth from 50 to 600 feet and often several miles wide, if they consider how numerous may have been the shocks which accompanied the uplifting of those recent marine strata to so prodigious a height. Some speculators, indeed, who disregard the analogy of existing nature, and who are always ready to assume that her forces were more energetic in bygone ages, may dispense with a long series of movements and suppose that Calabria rose like an exhalation from the deep, after the manner of Milton's pandemonium. But such a hypothesis would deprive them of that peculiar removing force required to form a regular system of deep and wide valleys, 
for time, which they are so unwilling to assume, is essential to the operation. Time must be allowed in the intervals between distinct convulsions for running water to clear away the ruins caused by landslips. Otherwise, the fallen masses will serve as buttresses and prevent the succeeding earthquake from exerting its full power. The sides of the valley must be again cut away by the stream and made to form precipices and overhanging cliffs before the next shock can take effect in the same manner. Possibly the direction of the succeeding shock may not coincide with that of the valley, a great extent of adjacent country being equally shaken. Still, it will usually happen that no permanent geographical change will be produced except in valleys. In them alone will occur landslips from the boundary cliffs, and these will frequently divert the stream from its accustomed course, causing the original ravine to become both wider and more tortuous in its direction. If a single convulsion of extreme violence should agitate at once an entire hydrographical basin, or if the shock should follow each other too rapidly, the previously existing valleys would be annihilated, instead of being modified and enlarged. Every stream might in that case be compelled to begin its operations anew, and to shape out new channels, instead of continuing to deepen and widen those already excavated. But if the subterranean movements have been intermittent, and if sufficient periods have always intervened between the severer shocks to allow the drainage of the country to be nearly restored to its original state, then are both the kind and degree of force supplied by which running water may hollow out valleys of any depth or size consistent with the elevation above the sea which the districts drained by them may have attained. When we read of the drying up and desertion of the channels of rivers, the accounts most frequently refer to their deflection into some other part of the same alluvial plain, perhaps several miles distant. Under certain circumstances, a change of level may undoubtedly force the water to flow over into some distinct hydrographical basin, but even then it will fall immediately into some other system of valleys already formed. We learn from history that ever since the first Greek colonists settled in Calabria, that region has been subject to devastation by earthquakes, and for the last century and a half, ten years have seldom elapsed without a shock. But the severer convulsions have not only been separated by intervals of 20, 50, or 100 years, but have not affected precisely the same points when they recurred. Thus, the earthquake of 1783, although confined within the same geographical limits as that of 1638, and not very inferior in violence, visited, according to Grimaldi, very different districts. The points where the local intensity of the forces developed being thus perpetually varied, more time is allowed for the removal of separate mountain masses thrown into river channels by each shock. Number of persons who perished during the earthquake. The number of persons who perished during the earthquake in the two Calabrias in Sicily is estimated by Hamilton at about 40,000 and about 20,000 more died by epidemics, which were caused by insufficient nourishment, exposure to the atmosphere, and malaria arising from the new stagnant lakes and pools. By far, the greater number were buried under the ruins of their houses, but many were burnt to death in the conflagrations, which almost invariably followed the shocks. These fires raged the more violently in some cities, such as Oppido, from the immense magazines of oil which were consumed. Many persons were engulfed in deep fissures, especially the peasants when flying across the open country, and their skeletons may perhaps be buried in the earth to this day at the depth of several hundred feet. When Dolomio visited Messina after the shock of February 5th, he describes the city as still presenting, at least at a distance, an imperfect image of its ancient splendor. Every house was injured, but the walls were standing. The whole population had taken refuge in wooden huts in the neighborhood, and all was solitude and silence in the streets. It seemed as if the city had been desolated by the plague, and the impression made upon his feelings was that of melancholy and sadness. But when I passed over to Calabria and first beheld Polistena, the scene of horror almost deprived me of my faculties. My mind was filled with mingled compassion and terror. Nothing had escaped. All was leveled with the dust. 
Not a single house or piece of wall remained. On all sides were heaps of stone so destitute of form that they gave no conception of their ever having been a town on the spot. The stench of the dead bodies still rose from the ruins. I conversed with many persons who had been buried for three, four, and even for five days. I questioned them respecting their sensations in so dreadful a situation, and they agreed that of all the physical evils they endured, thirst was the most intolerable, and that their mental agony was increased by the idea that they were abandoned by their friends, who might have rendered them assistance. It is supposed that about a fourth part of the inhabitants of Polistena and of some other towns were buried alive, and might have been saved had there been no want of hands. But in so general a calamity, where each was occupied with his own misfortunes or those of his family, and could rarely be obtained. Neither tears, nor supplications, nor promises of high rewards were listened to. Many acts of self-devotion, prompted by parental and conjugal tenderness, or by friendship, or the gratitude of faithful servants, are recorded. But individual exertions were, for the most part, ineffectual. It frequently happened that persons in search of those most dear to them could hear their moans, could recognize their voices, were certain of the exact spot where they lay buried beneath their feet, yet could afford them no succor. The piled mass resisted all their strength and rendered their efforts of no avail. At Terra Nuova, four Augustan monks, who had taken refuge in a vaulted sacristy, the arch of which continued to support an immense pile of ruins, made their cries heard for the space of four days. Only one of the brethren of the whole convent was saved, and of what avail was his strength to remove the enormous weight of rubbish which had overwhelmed his companions? He heard their voices die away gradually, and when afterwards their four corpses were disinterred, they were found clasped in each other's arms. Affecting narratives are preserved of mothers saved after the fifth, sixth, and even seventh day of their interment, when their infants or children had perished with hunger. It might have been imagined that the sight of suffering such as these would have been sufficient to awaken sentiments of humanity and pity in the most savage breasts. But while some acts of heroism are related, nothing could exceed the general atrocity of conduct displayed by the Calabrian peasants. They abandoned the farms and flocked in great numbers into the towns, not to rescue their countrymen from a lingering death, but to plunder. They dashed through the streets, fearless of danger, amid tottering walls and clouds of dust, trampling beneath their feet the bodies of the wounded and half-buried, and often stripping them, while yet living, of their clothes. Concluding Remarks but to enter more fully into these details would be foreign to the purpose of the present work, and several volumes would be required to give the reader a just idea of the sufferings which the inhabitants of many populous districts have undergone during the earthquakes of the last 150 years. A bare mention of the loss of life, as that 50 or 100,000 souls perished in one catastrophe, conveys to the reader no idea of the extent of misery inflicted. We must learn from the narratives of eyewitnesses the various forms in which death was encountered, the numbers who escaped with loss of limbs or serious bodily injuries, and the multitude who were suddenly reduced to penury and want. It has often been remarked that the dread of earthquakes is strongest in the minds of those who have experienced them most frequently, whereas in the case of almost every other danger, familiarity with peril renders men intrepid. The reason is obvious. Scarcely any part of the mischief apprehended in this instance is imaginary. The first shock is often the most destructive, and, as it may occur in the dead of the night, or if by day without giving the least warning of its approach, no forethought can guard against it. And when the convulsion has begun, no skill or courage or presence of mind can point out the path of safety. During the intervals of uncertain duration between the more fatal shocks, slight tremors of the soil are not unfrequent, and as these sometimes precede more violent convulsions, they become a source of anxiety and alarm. The terror arising from this cause alone is of itself 
no inconsiderable evil. Although sentiments of pure religion are frequently awakened by these awful visitations, yet we more commonly find that an habitual state of fear, a sense of helplessness, and a belief in the futility of all human exertions prepare the minds of the vulgar for the influence of a demoralizing superstition. Where earthquakes are frequent, there can never be perfect security of property under the best government. Industry cannot be assured of reaping the fruits of its labor, and the most daring acts of outrage may occasionally be perpetrated with impunity when the arm of the law is paralyzed by the general consternation. It is hardly necessary to add that the progress of civilization and national wealth must be retarded by convulsions which level cities to the ground, destroy harbors, render roads impassable, and cause the most cultivated valley plains to be covered with lakes or the ruins of adjoining hills. Those geologists who imagined that at remote periods ere man became a sojourner on earth, the volcanic agency was more energetic than now, should be careful to found their opinion on strict geological evidence and not permit themselves to be biased, as they have often been, by a notion that the disturbing force would probably be mitigated for the sake of man. I shall endeavor to point out in the sequel that the general tendency of subterranean movements, when their effects are considered for a sufficient lapse of ages, is eminently beneficial, and that they constitute an essential part of that mechanism by which the integrity of the habitable surface is preserved, and the very existence and perpetuation of dry land secured. Why the working of this same machinery should be attended with so much evil is a mystery far beyond the reach of our philosophy, and must probably remain so until we are permitted to investigate not our planet alone and its inhabitants, but other parts of the moral and material universe with which they may be connected. Could our survey embrace other worlds, and the events not of a few centuries only, but of periods as indefinite as those with which geology renders us familiar, some apparent contradictions might be reconciled, and some difficulties would doubtless be cleared up. But even then, as our capacities are finite, while the scheme of the universe may be infinite, both in time and space, it is presumptuous to suppose that all sources of doubt and perplexity would ever be removed. On the contrary, they might, perhaps, go on augmenting in number, although our confidence in the wisdom of the plan of nature should increase at the same time. For it has been justly said that the greater the circle of light, the greater the boundary of darkness by which it is surrounded. End of chapter 28, part 2. Recording by Jonathan Reed. Chapter 29, part 1 of Principles of Geology. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Principles of Geology by Charles Lyell. Section 70. Chapter 29. Earthquakes. Continued. Earthquake of Java, 1772. Truncation of a lofty cone. Saint Domingo, 1770. Lisbon, 1755. Great area over which the shocks extended. Retreat of the sea. Proposed explanations. Conception Bay, 1750. Permanent elevation. Peru, 1746. Java, 1699. Rivers obstructed by landslips. Subsidence in Sicily, 1693. Malacca, 1693. Jamaica, 1692. Large tracts engulfed. Portion of Port Royal sunk. Amount of change in the last 150 years. Elevation and subsidence of land in Bay of Bai. Evidence of the same afforded by the Temple of Serapis. In the preceding chapters, we have considered a small part only of those earthquakes which have occurred during the last 70 years, of which accurate and authentic descriptions happen to have been recorded. In examining those of earlier date, we find their number so great that allusion can be made to a few only respecting which information of peculiar geological interest has been obtained. Java, 1772, truncation of a lofty cone. In the year 1772, Papanda Yang, formerly one of the loftiest volcanoes in the islands of Java, was in eruption. Before all the inhabitants on the declivities of the mountain could save themselves by flight, the ground began to give way, and a great part of the volcano fell in and disappeared. 
It is estimated that an extent of ground of the mountain itself and its immediate environs, 15 miles long and full six broad, was by this commotion swallowed up in the bowels of the earth. Forty villages were destroyed, some being engulfed and some covered by the substances thrown out on this occasion, and 2,957 of the inhabitants perished. A proportionate number of cattle were also killed, and most of the plantations of cotton, indigo, and coffee in the adjacent districts were buried under the volcanic matter. This catastrophe appears to have resembled, although on a grander scale, that of the ancient Vesuvius in the year 79. The cone was reduced in height from 9,000 to about 5,000 feet, and as vapor still escaped from the crater in its summit, a new cone may one day rise out of the ruins of the ancient mountain, as the modern Vesuvius has risen from the remains of Soma. Saint Domingo, 1770. During a tremendous earthquake which destroyed a great part of Saint Domingo, innumerable fissures were caused throughout the islands, from which mephitic vapors emanated and produced an epidemic. Hot springs burst forth in many places where there had been no water before, but after a time they ceased to flow. In a previous earthquake in November 1751, a violent shock destroyed the capital, Port-au-Prince, and part of the coast, 20 leagues in length, sunk down and has ever since formed a bay of the sea. Hindustan, 1762. The town of Chittagong in Bengal was violently shaken by an earthquake on the 2nd of April, 1762, the earth opening in many places and throwing up water and mud of a sulfurous smell. At a place called Bardavan, a large river was dried up, and at Bachara, near the sea, a tract of ground sunk down and 200 people with all their cattle were lost. It is said that 60 square miles of the Chittagong coast suddenly and permanently subsided during this earthquake, and that Ses Lung Tom, one of the Mug Mountains, entirely disappeared, and another sunk so low that its summit only remained visible. Four hills are also described as having been variously rent asunder, leaving open chasms from 30 to 60 feet in width. Towns which subsided several cubits were overflowed with water, among others Deep Gong, which was submerged to a depth of seven cubits. Two volcanoes are said to have opened in the Secta Kunda Hills. The shock was also felt at Calcutta. While the Chittagong coast was sinking, a corresponding rise of the ground took place at the islands of Ramri and at Jeduba. Lisbon, 1755. In no part of the volcanic region of southern Europe has so tremendous an earthquake occurred in modern times as that which began on the 1st of November, 1755, at Lisbon. A sound of thunder was heard underground, and immediately afterwards a violent shock threw down the greater part of that city. In the course of about six minutes, 60,000 persons perished. The sea first retired and laid the bar dry. It then rolled in, rising 50 feet or more above its ordinary level. The mountains of Arabida, Estrella, Julio, Marvan and Sintra, being some of the largest in Portugal, were impetuously shaken, as it were, from their very foundations and some of them opened at their summits, which were split and rent in a wonderful manner, huge masses of them being thrown down into the subjacent valleys. Flames are related to have issued from these mountains, which are supposed to have been electric. They are also said to have smoked, but vast clouds of dust may have given rise to this appearance. The area over which this convulsion extended is very remarkable. It has been computed, says Humboldt, that on the 1st of November, 1755, a portion of the Earth's surface four times greater than the extent of Europe was simultaneously shaken. The shock was felt in the Alps and on the coast of Sweden, in small island lakes on the shores of the Baltic, in Thuringia and in the flat country of northern Germany. The thermal springs of Toplitz dried up and again returned, inundating everything with water discolored by ochre. In the islands of Antigua, Barbados and Martinique in the West Indies, where the tide usually rises little more than two feet, it suddenly rose above 20 feet, the water being discolored and of an inky blackness. The movement was also sensible in the Great Lakes of Canada. At Algiers and Fez in the north of Africa, the agitation of the earth was as violent as in Spain and Portugal. And, at the distance of eight leagues from Morocco, a village with the inhabitants to the number of about 8,000 or 10,000 persons are said to have been swallowed up the earth soon afterwards closing over them. Subsidence of the Key Among other extraordinary events related to have occurred at Lisbon during the catastrophe was the subsidence of a new key built entirely of marble at an immense expense. A great concourse of people had collected there for safety, as a spot where they might be beyond the reach of falling ruins, but suddenly the key sank down with all the people on it, 
Not one of the dead bodies ever floated to the surface. A great number of boats and small vessels anchored near it, all full of people, were swallowed up, as in a whirlpool. No fragments of these wrecks ever rose again to the surface, and the water in the place where the key had stood is stated in many accounts to be unfathomable. But Whitebird says he ascertained it to be 100 fathoms. Circumstantial as are the contemporary narratives, I learned from a correspondent, Mr. F. Freeman, in 1841, that no part of the Tagus was then more than 30 feet deep at high tide, and an examination of the position of the new quay and the memorials preserved of the time and manner in which it was built rendered the statement of so great a substance in 1755 quite unintelligible. Perhaps a deep, narrow chasm, such as was before described in Calabria, opened and closed again in the bed of the Tagus, after swallowing up some incumbent buildings and vessels. We have already seen that such openings may collapse after the shock suddenly, or, in places where the strata are of a soft and yielding materials, very gradually. According to the observations made at Lisbon in 1837 by Mr. Sharp, the destroying effects of this earthquake were confined to the tertiary strata and were most violently on the blue clay on which the lower part of the city is constructed. Not a building, he says, on the secondary limestone or the basalt was injured. Shocks felt at sea. The shock was felt at sea, on the deck of a ship to the west of Lisbon, and produced very much the same sensation as on dry land. Of St. Lucar, the captain of the ship Nancy, felt his vessel so violently shaken that he thought he had struck the ground, but on having the lead, found a great depth of water. Captain Clark from Denia, in latitude 36 degrees 24 minutes north, between 9 and 10 in the morning, had his ship shaken and strained as if she had struck upon a rock, so that the seams of the deck opened and the compass was overturned in the binnacle. Another ship, 40 leagues west of St. Vincent, experienced so violent a concussion that the men were thrown a foot and a half perpendicularly up from the deck. Rate at which the movement traveled. The agitation of lakes, rivers and springs in Great Britain was remarkable. At Loch Lomond in Scotland, for example, the water without the least apparent cause rose against its banks and then subsided below its usual level. The greatest perpendicular height of this swell was 2 feet 4 inches. It is said that the movement of this earthquake was undulatory and that it traveled at the rate of 20 miles a minute, its velocity being calculated by the intervals between the time when the first shock was felt at Lisbon and its time of occurrence at other distant places. Great Wave and Retreat of the Sea A great wave swept over the coast of Spain and is said to have been 60 feet high at Cadiz. At Tangier in Africa, it rose and fell 18 times on the coast. At Funchal in Madeira, it rose full 15 feet perpendicular above high water mark, although the tide, which ebbs and flows there 7 feet, was then at half ebb. Besides entering the city and committing great havoc, it overflowed other seaports in the island. At Kinsale in Ireland, a body of water rushed into the harbour, whirled round several vessels and poured into the marketplace. It was before stated that the sea first retired at Lisbon, and this retreat of the ocean from the shore at the commencement of an earthquake and its subsequent return in a violent wave is a common occurrence. In order to account for the phenomenon, Michel imagined a subsidence at the bottom of the sea from the giving way of the roof of some cavity in consequence of a vacuum produced by the condensation of steam. Such condensation, he observes, might be the first effect of the introduction of a large body of water into fissures and cavities already filled with steam, before there has been sufficient time for the heat of the incandescent lava to turn so large a supply of water into steam, which being so accomplished causes a greater explosion. Another proposed explanation is the sudden rise of the land which would cause the sea to abandon immediately the ancient line of coast, and if the shore, after being thus heaved up, should fall again to its original level, the ocean would return. This theory, however, will not account for the facts observed during the Lisbon earthquake, for the retreat preceded the wave not only on the coast of Portugal, but also at the islands of Madeira and several other places. If the upheaving of the coast of Portugal had caused the retreat, the motion of the waters when propagated to Madeira would have produced a wave previous to the retreat. Nor could the motion of the waters at Madeira have been caused by a different local earthquake, for the shock traveled from Lisbon to Madeira in two hours, which agrees with the time which it required to reach other places equally distant. The following is another solution of the problem which has been offered. Suppose a portion of the bed of the sea to be suddenly upheaved. The first effect will be to raise over the elevated part of a body of water, the momentum of which will carry it much above the level it will afterwards assume. 
causing a drought or a receding of the water from the neighboring coasts, followed immediately by the return of the displaced water, which will also be impelled by its momentum much further and higher on the coast than its former level. Mr. Darwin, when alluding to similar waves on the coast of Chile, states his opinion that the whole phenomenon is due to a common undulation in the water proceeding from a line or point of disturbance some little way distant. If the waves, he says, sent off from the paddles of a steam vessel be watched breaking on the sloping shore of a still river, the water will be seen first to retire two or three feet, and then to return in little breakers, precisely analogous to those consequent on an earthquake. He also adds that the earthquake wave occurs some time after the shock, the water at first retiring both from the shores of the mainland and of outlying islands, and then returning in mountainous breakers. Their size is modified by the form of the neighboring coast, for it is ascertained in South America that places situated at the head of shoaling bays have suffered most, whereas towns like Valparaíso, seated close on the border of a profound ocean, have never been inundated, though severely shaken by earthquakes. More recently, February 1846. Mr. Mallet, in his memoir above cited, has endeavoured to bring to bear on this difficult subject the more advanced knowledge obtained of late years respecting the true theory of waves. He conceives that when the origin of the shock is beneath the deep ocean, one wave is propagated through the land, and another, moving with inferior velocity, is formed on the surface of the ocean. This last rolls in upon the land long after the earth wave has arrived and spent itself. However irreconcilable it may be to our common notions of solid bodies, to imagine them capable of transmitting with such extreme velocity motions analogous to tidal waves, it seems nevertheless certain that such undulations are produced, and it is supposed that when the shock passes a given point, each particle of the solid earth describes an ellipse in space. The facility with which all the particles of a solid mass can be made to vibrate may be illustrated, says Gay-Lussac, by many familiar examples. If we apply the ear to one end of a long wooden beam, and listen attentively when the other end is struck by a pin's head, we hear the shock distinctly, which shows that every fiber throughout the whole length has been made to vibrate. The rattling of carriages on the pavement shakes the largest edifices. And, in the quarries underneath some quarters in Paris, it is found that the movement is communicated through a considerable thickness of rock. The great sea wave originating directly over the center of disturbance is propagated, as Michel correctly stated, in every direction, like the circle upon a pond when a pebble is dropped into it, the different rates at which it moves depending, as he also suggested, on variations in the depth of the water. This wave of the sea, says Mr. Mallet, is raised by the impulse of the shock immediately below it, which in great earthquakes lifts up the ground two or three feet perpendicularly. The velocity of the shock, or earth wave, is greater because it depends upon a function of the elasticity of the crust of the earth, whereas the velocity of the sea wave depends upon a function of the depth of the sea. Although the shock in its passage under the deep ocean gives no trace of its progress, it no sooner gets into soundings or shallow water than it gives rise to another and smaller wave of the sea. It carries, as it were, upon its back this lesser aqueous undulation, a long, narrow ridge of water which corresponds in form and velocity to itself, being pushed up by the partial elevation of the bottom. It is this small wave, called technically the forced sea wave, which communicates the earthquake shock to ships at sea, as if they had struck upon a rock. It breaks upon a coast at the same moment that the shock reaches it, and sometimes it may cause an apparent slight recession from the shore, followed by its flowing up somewhat higher than the usual tide mark. This will happen where the beach is very sloping, as is usual where the sea is shallow, for then the velocity of the low, flat earth wave is such that it slips, as it were, from under the undulation in the fluid above. It does this at the moment of reaching the beach, which it elevates by a vertical height equal to its own, and as instantly lets drop again to its former level. While the shock propagated through the solid earth has thus traveled with extra rapidity to the land, the great sea wave has been following at a slower pace, though advancing at the rate of several miles a minute. It consists in the deep ocean of a long, low swell of enormous volume, having an equal slope before and behind, and that so gentle that it might pass under a ship without being noticed. But when it reaches the edge of soundings, its front slope, like that of a tidal wave under similar circumstances, becomes short and steep while its rear slope is long and gentle. If there be water of some depth close into shore, this great wave may roll in, long after the shock, and do little damage, 
but if the shore be shelving, there will be first a retreat of the water, and then the wave will break upon the beach and roll in far upon the land. The various opinions which have been offered by Michel and later writers respecting the remote causes of earthquake shocks in the interior of the earth will more properly be discussed in the 32nd chapter. Chile, 1751. On the 24th of May, 1751, the ancient town of Concepcion, otherwise called Penco, was totally destroyed by an earthquake and the sea rolled over it. The ancient port was rendered entirely useless and the inhabitants built another town about 10 miles from the sea coast in order to be beyond the reach of similar inundations. At the same time, a colony recently settled on the seashore of Juan Fernandez was almost entirely overwhelmed by a wave which broke upon the shore. It has been already stated that in 1835 or 84 years after the destruction of Penco, the same coast was overwhelmed by a similar flood from the sea during an earthquake, and it is also known that 21 years before, or in 1730, a like wave rolled over its fated shores, in which many of the inhabitants perished. A series of similar catastrophes has also been tracked back as far as the year 1590, beyond which we have no memorials save those of oral tradition. Molina, who has recorded the customs and legends of the Aborigines, tells us that the Araucarian Indians, a tribe inhabiting the country between the Andes and the Pacific, including the part now called Chile, had among them a tradition of a great deluge in which only a few persons were saved who took refuge upon a high mountain called Teg Teg, the Thundering, which had three points. Whenever a violent earthquake occurs, these people fly for safety to the mountains, assigning as a reason that they are fearful after the shock that the sea will again return and deluge the world. Notwithstanding the tendency of writers in his day to refer all traditionary inundations to one remote period, Molina remarks that this flood of the Araucarians was probably very different from that of Noah. We have indeed no means of conjecturing how long this same tribe had flourished in Chile, but we can scarcely doubt that if its experience reached back even for three or four centuries, several inroads of the oceans must have occurred within that period. But the memory of a succession of physical events, similar in kind though distinct in time, can never be preserved by a people destitute of written annals. Before two or three generations have passed away, all dates are forgotten, and even the events themselves, unless they have given origin to some customs or religious rites and ceremonies. Oftentimes the incidents of many different earthquakes and floods become blended together in the same narrative, and in such cases the single catastrophe is described in terms so exaggerated or is so disguised by mythological fictions as to be utterly valueless to the antiquary or philosopher. Proofs of elevation of 24 feet During a late survey of Conception Bay, Captain Beachy and Sir E. Belcher discovered that the ancient harbour, which formerly admitted all large merchant vessels which went round the Cape, is now occupied by a reef of sandstone certain points of which project above the sea at low water, the greater part being very shallow. A tract of a mile and a half in length, where according to the report of the inhabitants the water was formerly four or five fathoms deep, is now a shoal, consisting, as our hydrographers found, of hard sandstone, so that it cannot be supposed to have been formed by recent deposits of the river Biobio, an arm of which carries down loose micaceous sand into the same bay. It is impossible at this distance of time to affirm that the bed of the sea was uplifted at once to the height of 24 feet during the single earthquake of 1751, because of other movements may have occurred subsequently. But it is said that ever since the shock of 1751, no vessels have been able to approach within a mile and a half of the ancient port of Penco. In proof of the former elevation of the coast near Penco, our surveyors found, above high water mark, an enormous bed of shells of the same species as those now living in the bay, filled with micaceous sand, like that which the Bio, Bio now conveys to the bay. These shells, as well as others, which cover the adjoining hills of mica schists to the height of several hundred feet, have lately been examined by experienced conchologists in London, and identified with those taken at the same time in a living state from the bay and its neighbourhood. Ulloa, therefore, was perfectly correct in his statement that, at various heights above the sea between Talcahuano and Concepcion, mines were found of various sorts of shells used for lime of the very same kinds as those found in the adjoining sea. Among them he mentions the great muscle called Shoros, and two other which he describes. Some of these, he says, are entire, and others broken. They occur at the bottom of the sea in four, six, ten, or twelve fathom water, where they adhere to a sea plant called Cochayuyo. 
they are taken in dredges and have no resemblance to those found on the shore or in shallow water. Yet, beds of them occur at various heights on the hills. I was the more pleased with the sight, he adds, as it appeared to me a convincing proof of the universality of the deluge, although I am not ignorant that some have attributed their position to other causes. It has, however, been ascertained that the foundation of the castle of Penco was so low in 1835, or at so inconsiderable an elevation above the highest spring tides as to discountenance the idea of any permanent upheaval in modern times on the site of that ancient port but no exact measures or levelings appears as yet to have been made to determine this point, which is the more worthy of investigation, because it may throw some light on an opinion often promulgated of late years that there is a tendency in the Chilean coast, after each upheaval, to sink gradually and return towards its former position. End of part one. Chapter 29 of Principles of Geology. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Principles of Geology by Charles Lyell. Section 71. Peru, 1746. Peru was visited on the 28th of October, 1746, by a tremendous earthquake. In the first 24 hours, 200 shocks were experienced. The ocean twice retired and returned impetuously upon the land. Lima was destroyed, and part of the coast near Callao was converted into a bay. Four other harbors, among which were Cavalla and Guanape, shared the same fate. There were 23 ships and vessels, great and small, in the harbor of Callao, of which 19 were sunk and the other four, among which was a frigate called Saint Fermin, were carried by the force of the waves to a great distance up the country and left on dry ground at a considerable height above the sea. The number of inhabitants in this city amounted to 4,000, 200 only escaped, 22 of whom were saved on a small fragment of the fort of Vera Cruz, which remained as the only memorial of the town after this dreadful inundation. Other portions of its site were completely covered with heaps of sand and gravel. A volcano in Lucanas burst forth the same night, and such quantities of water descended from the cone that the whole country was overflowed, and, in the mountaineer Pataz, called Conversiones de Cajamarquilla, three other volcanoes burst out, and frightful torrents of water swept down their sides. There are several records of prior convulsions in Peru, accompanied by similar inroads in the sea, one of which happened 59 years before, in 1687, when the ocean, according to Ulloa, first retired and then returned in a mountainous wave, overwhelming Callao and its environs with the miserable inhabitants. The same wave, according to Lionel Wafer, carried sheep a league into the country and drowned men and beasts for 50 leagues along the shore. Inundations of still earlier dates are carefully recorded by Ulloa, Wafer, Acosta and various writers who describe them as having expended their chief fury, some on one part of the coast and some on another. But all authentic accounts cease when we ascend to the era of the conquest of Peru by the Spaniards. The ancient Peruvians, although far removed from barbarism, were without written annals, and therefore unable to preserve a distinct recollection of a long series of natural events. They had, however, according to Antonio de Herrera, who in the beginning of the 17th century investigated their antiquities, a tradition that many years before the reign of the Incas, at a time when the country was very populous, there happened a great flood, the sea breaking beyond its bounds, so that the land was covered with water and all the people perished. To these the Guacas, inhabiting the vale of Jausca, and the natives of Chiquito in the province of Callao, add that some persons remained in the hollows and caves of the highest mountains, who again peopled the land. Others of the mountain people affirm that all perished in the deluge, only six persons being saved on a float from whom descended all the inhabitants of that country. On the mainland near Lima, and on the neighboring island of St. Lorenzo, Mr. Darwin found proofs that the ancient bed of the sea had been raised to the height of more than 80 feet above water within the human epoch, strata having been discovered at that altitude, containing pieces of cotton thread and plated rush, together with seaweed and marine shells. The same author learned from Mr. Gill, a civil engineer, that he discovered in the interior near Lima, between Casma and Juarez, the dried-up channel of a large river, sometimes worn through solid rock, 
which instead of continually ascending towards its source, has in one place a steep downward slope in that direction, for a ridge or line of hills has been uplifted directly across the bed of the stream, which is now arched. By these changes, the water has been turned into some other course, and a district once fertile and still covered with ruins and bearing the marks of ancient cultivation has been converted into a desert. Java, 1699. On the 5th of January, 1699, a terrible earthquake visited Java, and no less than 208 considerable shocks were reckoned. Many houses in Batavia were overturned, and the flame and noise of a volcanic eruption were seen and heard in that city, which were afterwards found to proceed from Mount Salek, a volcano six days' journey distant. Next morning, the Batavian river, which has its rise from that mountain, became very high and muddy, and brought down abundance of bushes and trees half burned. The channel of the river being stopped up, the water overflowed the country round the gardens about the town and some of the streets, so that the fishes lay dead in them. All the fish in the river except the carps were killed by the mud and turbid water. A great number of drowned buffaloes, tigers, rhinoceros, deer, apes and other wild beasts were brought down by the current. And, notwithstanding, observes one of the writers, that a crocodile is amphibious. Several of them were found dead among the rest. It is stated that seven hills bounding the river sank down, by which is merely meant, as by similar expressions in the description of the Calabrian earthquakes, seven great landslips. These hills, descending some from one side of the valley and some from the other, filled the channel, and the waters then, finding their way under the mass, flowed out thick and muddy. The Tangarand River was also dammed up by nine hills, and in its channel were large quantities of drift trees. Seven of its tributaries are also said to have been covered up with earth. A high track of forest land between the two great rivers before mentioned is described as having been changed into an open country destitute of trees, the surface being spread over with fine red clay. This part of the account may perhaps merely refer to the sliding down of woody tracts into the valleys, as happened to so many extensive vineyards and olive grounds in Calabria in 1783. The close packing of large trees in the Batavian River is represented as very remarkable, and it attests in a striking manner the destruction of soil bordering the valleys which had been caused by floods and landslips. Quito, 1698. In Quito, on the 19th of July, 1698, during an earthquake, a great part of the crater and summit of the volcano Quarguarajo fell in, and a stream of water and mud issued from the broken sides of the hill. Sicily, 1693. Shocks of earthquakes spread over all Sicily in 1693, and on the 11th of January, the city of Catania and 49 other places were leveled to the ground, and about 100,000 people killed. The bottom of the sea, says Vicentino Bonajutus, sunk down considerably, both in ports, enclosed bays, and open parts of the coast, and water bubbled up along the shores. Numerous long fissures of various breaths were caused, which threw out sulfurous water, and one of them in the plain of Catania, the delta of the Cimeto, at a distance of four miles from the sea, sent forth water as salty as the sea. The stone buildings of a street in the city of Noto, for the length of half a mile, sunk into the ground and remained hanging on one side. In another street, an opening large enough to swallow a man and a horse appeared. Malacca, 1693. The small isle of Sorea, which consists of one great volcano, was in eruption in the year 1693. Different parts of the cone fell one after the other into a deep crater until almost half the space of the island was converted into a fire lake. Most of the inhabitants fled to Banda, but great pieces of the mountain continued to fall down so that the lake of lava became wider, and finally the whole population was compelled to emigrate. It is stated that in proportion as the burning lake increased in size, the earthquakes were less vehement. Jamaica, 1692 in the year 1692, the island of Jamaica was visited by a violent earthquake. The ground swelled and heaved like a rolling sea, and was traversed by numerous cracks, two or three hundred of which were often seen at a time, opening and then closing rapidly again. Many people were swallowed up in these rents, some the earth caught by the middle and squeezed to death. The heads of others only appeared above ground, and some were first engulfed and then cast up again with great quantities of water. Such was the devastation that even in Port Royal, then the capital, 
where more houses are said to have been left standing than in the whole island besides. Three quarters of the buildings, together with the ground they stood on, sunk down with their inhabitants entirely underwater. Subsidence in the harbor. The large storehouses on the harbor side subsided so as to be 24, 36, and 48 feet underwater, yet many of them appear to have remained standing, for it is stated that, after the earthquake, the mastheads of several ships wrecked in the harbor, together with the chimney tops of houses, were just seen projecting above the waves. A tract of land around the town, about a thousand acres in extent, sunk down in less than one minute during the first shock, and the sea immediately rolled in. The Swan frigate, which was repairing in the wharf, was driven over the tops of many buildings, and then thrown upon one of the roofs through which it broke. The breadth of one of the streets is said to have been doubled by the earthquake. According to Sir H. de la Beck, the part of Port Royal described as having sunk was built upon newly formed land, consisting of sand, in which piles had been driven, and the settlement of this loose sand, charged with the weight of heavy houses, may, he suggests, have given rise to the subsidence alluded to. There have undoubtedly been instances in Calabria and elsewhere of slides of land on which the houses have still remained standing, and it is possible that such may have been the case at Port Royal. The fact, at least, of submergence is unquestionable, for I was informed by the late Admiral Sir Charles Hamilton that he frequently saw the submerged houses of Port Royal in the year 1780, in that part of the harbour which lies between the town and the usual anchorage of men of war. Brian Edwards also says in his History of the West Indies that in 1793 the ruins were visible in clear weather from the boats which sailed over them. Lastly, Lieutenant B. Jeffrey R. N. tells me that being engaged in a survey between the years 1824 and 1835, he repeatedly visited the site in question, where the depth of the water is from four to six fathoms, and whenever there was but little wind, perceived distinct traces of houses. He saw these more clearly when he used the instrument called the diver's eye, which is let down below the ripple of the wave. At several thousand places in Jamaica, the earth is related to have opened, on the north of the island, several plantations with their inhabitants were swallowed up and the lake appeared in their place, covering above a thousand acres, which afterwards dried up, leaving nothing but sand and gravel, without the least sign that there had ever been a house or a tree there. Several tenements at Yellows were buried under landslips, and one plantation was removed half a mile from its place, the crops continuing to grow upon it uninjured. Between Spanish Town and Sixteen Mile Walk, the high and perpendicular cliffs bounding the river fell in, stopped the passage of the river, and flooded the latter place for nine days, so that the people concluded it had been sunk as Port Royal was. But the flood at length subsided, for the river had found some new passage at a great distance. Mountains Shattered The blue and other of the highest mountains are declared to have been strangely torn and rent, they appeared shattered and half-naked, no longer affording a fine green prospect as before, but stripped of their woods and natural verdure. The rivers on these mountains first ceased to flow for about twenty-four hours, and then brought down into the sea, at Port Royal and other places, several hundred thousand tons of timber which looked like floating islands on the ocean. The trees were in general barked, most of their branches having been torn off in the descent, it is particularly remarked in these, as in the narratives of so many earthquakes, that fish were taken in great numbers on the coast during the shocks. The correspondence of Sir Hans Lone, which collected with care the accounts of eyewitnesses of the catastrophe, refer constantly to subsidences, and some suppose the whole of Jamaica to have sunk down. Reflections on the amount of change in the last 160 years. I have now only enumerated some few of the earthquakes of the last 160 years, respecting which facts illustrative of geological inquiries are on record. Even if my limits permitted, it would be an unprofitable task to examine all the obscure and ambiguous narratives of similar events of earlier epochs, although if the places were now examined by geologists well practiced in the art of interpreting the monuments of physical changes, many events which have happened within the historical era might doubtless be still determined with precision. It must not be imagined that in the above sketch of the occurrences of a short period I have given an account of all or even the greater part of the mutations which the earth has undergone by the agency of subterranean movements. Thus, for example, the earthquake of Aleppo in the present century 
and of Syria in the middle of the 18th would doubtless have afforded numerous phenomena of great geological importance had those catastrophes been described by scientific observers. The shocks in Syria, 1759, were protracted for three months throughout a space of 10,000 square leagues, an area compared to which that of the Calabria earthquake in 1783 was insignificant. Akon, Safat, Balbek, Damascus, Sidon, Tripoli, and many other places were almost entirely leveled to the ground. Many thousands of the inhabitants perished in each, and in the valley of Balbek alone, 20,000 men are said to have been victims of the convulsion. In the absence of scientific accounts, it would be as irrelevant to our present purpose to enter into a detailed account of such calamities as to follow the track of an invading army, to enumerate the cities burned or razed to the ground, and reckon the number of individuals who perished by famine or the sword. Deficiency of Historical Records If such then be the amount of ascertained changes in the last 160 years, notwithstanding the extreme deficiency of our records during that brief period, how important must we presume the physical revolutions to have been in the course of 30 or 40 centuries during which some countries habitually convulsed by earthquakes have been peopled by civilized nations? Towns engulfed during one earthquake may, by repeated shocks, have sunk to great depths beneath the surface, while the ruins remain as imperishable as the hardest rocks in which they are enclosed. Buildings and cities submerged for a time beneath seas or lakes and covered with sedimentary deposits must in some places have been re-elevated to considerable heights above the level of the ocean. The signs of these events have probably been rendered visible by subsequent mutations, as by the encroachments of the sea upon the coast, by deep excavations made by torrents and rivers, by the opening of new ravines and chasms, and other effects of natural agents, so active in districts agitated by subterranean movements. If it be asked why, if such wonderful monuments exist, so few have hitherto been brought to light, we reply, because they have not been searched for. In order to rescue from oblivion the memorials of former occurrences, the inquirer must know what he may reasonably expect to discover, and under what peculiar local circumstances. He must be acquainted with the action and effect of physical causes, in order to recognize, explain, and describe correctly the phenomena when they present themselves. The best known of the great volcanic regions of which the boundaries were sketched in the 22nd chapter is that which includes southern Europe, northern Africa, and central Asia. Yet nearly the whole, even of this region, must be laid down in a geological map as terra incognita. Even Calabria may be regarded as unexplored, as also Spain, Portugal, the Barbary states, the Ionian Isles, Asia Minor, Cyprus, Syria, and the countries between the Caspian and Black Seas. We are in truth beginning to obtain some insight into one small spot of that great zone of volcanic disturbance, the district around Naples, a tract by no means remarkable for the violence of the earthquakes which have convulsed it. If in this part of Campania we are unable to establish that considerable changes in the relative level of land and sea have taken place since the Christian era, it is all that we could have expected. And it is to the recent antiquarian and geological research, not to history, that we are principally indebted for the information. I shall now proceed to lay before the reader some of the results of modern investigations in the Bay of Bai and the adjoining coast. Temple of Jupiter, Serapis. This celebrated monument of antiquity, a representation of which is given in the frontispiece, affords in itself alone unequivocal evidence that the relative level of land and sea has changed twice at Puzzuoli since the Christian era, and each movement, both of elevation and subsidence, has exceeded 20 feet. Before examining these proofs, I may observe that a geological examination of the coast of Bailly, both on the north and south of Puzzuoli, establishes, in the most satisfactory manner, an elevation at no remote period of more than 20 feet, and at one point of more than 30 feet, and evidence of this change would have been complete if even the temple had to this day remained undiscovered. Coast south of Puzzuoli If we coast along the shore from Naples to Puzzuoli, we find on approaching the latter place that the lofty and precipitous cliffs of indurated tuff, resembling that of which Naples is built, retire slightly from the sea and that a low-level tract of fertile land of a very different aspect intervenes between the present sea beach 
and what was evidently the ancient line of coast. The Indon cliff may be seen opposite the small island of Nisida, about two miles and a half southeast of Puzuoli, where, at a height of 32 feet above the level of the sea, Mr. Barbaggio observed an ancient mark, such as might have been worn by the waves, and, upon further examination, discovered that, along that line, the face of the perpendicular rock, consisting of very hard tuff, was covered with barnacles, balano sulcatus, and drilled by boring testacea. Some of the hollows of the lithotomy contained the shells, while others were filled with the valves of a species of area. Nearer to Puzuoli, the England cliff is 80 feet high, and as perpendicular as if it was still undermined by the waves. At its base, a new deposit constituting the fertile tract above alluded to attains a height of about 20 feet above the sea, and since it is composed of regular sedimentary deposits, contained marine shells. Its position proves that subsequently to its formation, there has been a change of more than 20 feet in the relative level of land and sea. The sea encroaches on these new incoherent strata, and as the soil is valuable, a wall has been built for its protection. But when I visited the spot in 1828, the waves had swept away part of this rampart, and exposed to view a regular series of strata of tough, more or less argillaceous, alternating with beds of pumice and lapilli, and containing great abundance of marine shells, of species now common on this coast, and amongst them Cardium rusticum, Austria edulis, Donax trunculus, and others. The strata vary from about a foot to a foot and a half in thickness, and one of them contains abundantly remains of works of art, tiles, squares of mosaic pavement of different colors, and small sculptured ornaments perfectly uninjured. Intermixed with these, I collected some teeth of the pig and ox. These fragments of building occur below as well as above strata containing marine shells. Puzuoli itself stands chiefly on a promontory of the older tophaceous formation, which cuts off the new deposit, although I detected a small patch of the latter in a garden under the town. From the town, the ruins of a mole called Caligula's Bridge ran out into the sea. This mole, which is believed to be 18 centuries old, consists of a number of piers and arches, 13 of which are now standing, and two others appear to have been overthrown. Mr. Babash found on the sixth pier perforations of the lithotomy, four feet above the level of the sea, and, near the termination of the mole on the last pier but one, marks of the same, ten feet above the level of the sea together with great numbers of balani and flustra. The depth of the sea at very small distance from most of the piers is from 30 to 50 feet. End of section 71。Chapter 29 of Principles of Geology This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Principles of Geology by Charles Lyell. Section 72. Coast to north of Puzuoli. If we then pass to the north of Puzuoli and examine the coast between that town and Monte Nuovo, we find a repetition of analogous phenomena. The sloping sides of Monte Barbaro slant down within a short distance of the coast and terminate in an island cliff of moderate elevation, to which the geologist perceives at once that the sea must at some former period have extended. Between this cliff and the sea is a low plain or terrace called La Starza, corresponding to that before described on the southeast of the town. And, as the sea encroaches rapidly, fresh sections of the strata may readily be obtained, of which the annexed is an example. First section of about one feet, vegetable soil. On a second section of about one feet and a half, horizontal beds of pumice and scoriae, with broken fragments of unrolled bricks, bones of animals and marine shells. The third section of about ten feet, beds of lapilli containing abundance of marine shells, principally Quardium rusticum donax trunculus, Austria edulis, Tritunculatum, and Buccinum serratum, broccoli the beds varying in thickness from 1 to 18 inches. The fourth section, of about 1 feet and a half, argillaceous tuff containing bricks and fragments of buildings not rounded by attrition. The thickness of many of these beds varies greatly as we trace them along the shore, and sometimes the whole group rises to a greater height than at the point above described. 
The surface of the tract which they compose appears to slope gently upwards towards the base of the old cliffs. Now, if such appearances presented themselves on the coast of England, a geologist might endeavor to seek an explanation in some local change in the set of the tides and currents, but there are scarce any tides in the Mediterranean, and to suppose the sea to have sunk generally from twenty to twenty-five feet since the shores of Campania were covered with sumptuous buildings is an hypothesis obviously untenable. The observations indeed made during modern surveys on the molds and cothons docks constructed by the ancients in various ports of the Mediterranean have proved that there has been no sensible variation of level in that sea during the last two thousand years. Thus we arrive without the aid of the celebrated temple at the conclusion that the recent marine deposit of Tuzwali was upraised in modern times above the level of the sea, and that not only this change of position, but the accumulation of the modern strata was posterior to the destruction of many edifices of which they contain the embedded remains. If we next examine the evidence afforded by the temple itself, it appears from the most authentic accounts that the three pillars now standing erect continue down to the middle of the last century, almost buried in the new marine strata. The upper part of each protruding several feet above the surface was concealed by bushes, and had not attracted, until the year 1749, the notice of antiquaries, but when the soil was removed in 1750, they were seen to form part of the remains of a splendid edifice, the pavement of which was still preserved, and upon it lay a number of columns of African breccia and of granite. The original plan of the building could be traced distinctly, and it was of a quadrangular form, seventy feet in diameter, and the roof had been supported by forty-six noble columns, twenty-four of granite, and the rest of marble. The large court was surrounded by apartments supposed to have been used as bathing rooms, for a thermal spring still used for medicinal purposes issues just behind the building, and the water of this spring appears to have been originally conveyed by a marble duct, still extant, into the chambers, and then across the pavement by a groove an inch or two deep, to a conduit made of Roman brickwork, by which it gained the sea. Many antiquaries have entered into elaborate discussions as to the date to which this edifice was consecrated. It is admitted that, among other images found in excavating the ruins, there was one of the god Serapis, and that Puzuoli a marble column was dug up, on which was carved an ancient inscription of the date of the building of Rome, 648, or 105 before Christ, entitled Lex Pariete Faciundo. This inscription, written in very obscure Latin, sets forth a contract between the municipality of the town and a company of builders who undertook to keep in repair certain public edifices, the Temple of Serapis being mentioned amongst the rest, and described as being near or towards the sea, Mare Vorsum. Sir Edmund Head, after studying in 1828 the topography and antiquities of this district and the Greek, Roman and Italian writers on the subject, informed me that at Alexandria on the Nile, the chief seat of the worship of Serapis, there was a Serapeum of the same form as this temple at Puzuoli, and surrounded in like manner by chambers in which the devotees were accustomed to pass the night in the hope of receiving during sleep a revelation from the god as to the nature and cure of their diseases. Hence it was very natural that the priests of Serapis, a pantheistic divinity who, among other other patients, had appropriated to himself the attributes of Esculapius, should regard the hot springs as a suitable appendage to the temple, although the original Serapeum of Alexandria could boast no such medicinal waters. Signor Carelli and others, in objecting to these views, have insisted on the fact that the worship of Serapis, which we know prevailed at Rome in the days of Catullus, in the first century before Christ, was prohibited by the Roman Senate during the reign of the Emperor Tiberius. But there is still little doubt that during the reigns of that emperor's successors, the shrines of the Egyptian god were again thronged by zealous votaries, and in no place more so than at Puteoli, now Puzuoli, one of the principal marts for the produce of Alexandria. Without entering further into an inquiry which is not strictly geological, I shall designate this valuable relic of antiquity by its generally received name and proceed to consider the memorials of physical changes inscribed on the three standing columns in the most legible characters by the hand of nature. These pillars, which have been carved each out of a single block of marble, are 43 inches and a half in height. 
a horizontal fissure nearly intersects one of the columns. The other two are entire. They are slightly out of the perpendicular, inclining somewhat to the southwest, that is, towards the sea. Their surface is smooth and uninjured, to the height of about 12 feet above their pedestals. Above these is a zone about 9 feet in height, where the marble has been pierced by a species of marine perforating bivalve, Lithodomus. The holes of these animals are pear-shaped, the external opening being minute and gradually increased downwards. At the bottom of the cavities, many shells are still found, notwithstanding the great numbers that have been taken out by visitors. In many of the valves, a species of arca, an animal which conceals itself in small hollows, occur. The perforations are so considerable in depth and size that they manifest a long-continued abode of the lithotomy in the columns, for, as the inhabitant grows older and increases inside, it bores a larger cavity to correspond with the increased magnitude of its shell. We must consequently infer a long-continued immersion of the pillars in sea water at a time when the lower part was covered up and protected by marine, fresh water and volcanic strata, afterwards to be described, and by the rubbish of buildings. The highest part, at the same time, projecting above the waters and being consequently weathered, but not materially injured. On the pavement of the temple lie some columns of marble, which are also perforated in certain parts. One, for example, to the length of eight feet, while for the length of four feet it is uninjured. Several of these broken columns are eaten in two not only on the exterior, but on the cross fracture, and on some of them other marine animals, serpulae, etc., have fixed themselves. All the granite pillars are untouched by lithotomy. The platform of the temple, which is not perfectly even, was, when I visited it in 1828, about one foot below high water mark, for there are small tides in the Bay of Naples and the sea, which was only 100 feet distant, soaked through the intervening soil. The upper part of the perforations, therefore, were at least 23 feet above high water mark, and it is clear that the columns must have continued for a long time in an erect position, immersed in salt water, and then the submerged portion must have been upraised to the height of about 23 feet above the level of the sea. By excavations carried on in 1828, below the marble pavement on which the columns stand, another costly pavement of mosaic was found, at a depth of about five feet below the upper one. The existence of these two pavements at different levels clearly implies some subsidence previously to the building of the more modern temple, which had rendered it necessary to construct the new floor at a higher level. We have already seen that a temple of Serapis existed long before the Christian era, the change of level just mentioned must have taken place some time before the end of the second century, for inscriptions have been found in the temple from which we learned that Septimus Severus adorned its walls with precious marbles between the years 194 and 211 of our era, and the Emperor Alexander Severus displayed the like munificence between the years 222 and 235. From that era, there is an entire dearth of historical information for a period of more than 12 centuries, except the significant fact that Alaric and his Goths sacked Puzzuoli in 456, and that Genseric did the like in 545. Yet we have fortunately a series of natural archives self-registered during the Dark Ages, by which many events which occurred in and about the temple are revealed to us. These natural records consist partly of deposits which envelop the pillars below the zone of lithodomous perforations, and partially of those which surround the outer walls of the temple. Mr. Babbage, after a minute examination of these, has shown that incrustations on the walls of the exterior chambers and on the floor of the building demonstrate that the pavement did not sink down suddenly, but was depressed by a gradual movement. The sea first entered the court or atrium and mingled its waters partially with those of the hot spring, from this brackish medium, a dark calcareous precipitate was thrown down, which became, in the course of time, more than two feet thick, including some serpulae in it. The presence of these annelids teaches us that the water was salt or brackish. After this period, the temple was filled up with an irregular mass of volcanic tuff, probably derived from an eruption of the neighboring crater of the Solfatar to the height of from five to nine feet above the pavement. 
Over these, again, a purely freshwater deposit of carbonate of lime accumulated with an uneven bottom, since it necessarily accommodated itself to the irregular outline of the upper surface of the volcanic shower before thrown down. To the top of the same deposit a freshwater limestone was perfectly even and flat, bespeaking an ancient water level. It is suggested by Mr. Babarge that this freshwater lake may have been caused by the fall of ashes which choked up the channel previously communicating with the sea, so that the hot spring threw down calcareous matter in the atrium without any marine intermixture. To the freshwater limestone succeeded another irregular mass of volcanic ashes and rubbish, some of it perhaps washed in by the waves of the sea during a storm, its surface rising to 10 or 11 feet above the pavement. And thus we arrive at the period of greatest depression expressed in the accompanying diagram, when the lower half of the pillars were enveloped in the deposits above enumerated, and the uppermost 20 feet were exposed in the atmosphere, the remaining or middle portion, about 9 feet long, being for years immersed in salt water and drilled by perforating bivalves. After this period, other strata consisting of showers of volcanic ashes and materials washed in during storms, covered up the pillars to the height of some places of 35 feet above the pavement. The exact time when these enveloping masses were heaped up, and how much of them were formed during submergence, and how much after the re-elevation of the temple, cannot be made out with certainty. The period of deep submergence was certainly antecedent to the close of the 15th century. Professor James Forbes has reminded us of a passage in an old Italian writer, Lofredo, who says that in 1530, or 50 years before he wrote, which was in 1580, the sea washed the base of the hills which rise from the flat land called La Starza, so that, to quote his words, a person might then have fished from the site of those ruins which are now called the Stadium. But we know from another evidence that the upward movement had begun before 1530, for the canonico Andrea di Giorgio cites two authentic documents in illustration of this point. The first, dated October 1503, is a deed written in Italian by which Ferdinand and Isabella grant to the University of Puzzuoli a portion of land where the sea is drying up, che va secando il mare. The second, a document in Italian dated May 23, 1511, or nearly 80 years after, by which Ferdinand grants to the city a certain territory around Puzzuoli where the ground is dried up from the sea, the Sicatum. The principal elevation, however, of the low tract unquestionably took place at the time of the great eruption of Monte Nuovo in 1538. That event and the earthquakes which preceded it have been already described. And we have seen that two of the eyewitnesses of the convulsion, Falconi and Giacomo di Toledo, agree in declaring that the sea abandoned a considerable tract of the shore, so that fish were taken by the inhabitants. And among other things, Falconi mentions that he saw two springs in the newly discovered ruins. The flat land which first upraised must have been more extensive than now, for the sea encroaches somewhat rapidly both to the north and southeast of Pozzuoli. The coast had, when I examined it in 1828, given way more than a foot in a twelve month, and I was assured by fishermen in the bay that it has lost ground near Puzzuoli to the extent of thirty feet within their memory. It is, moreover, very probable that the land rose to a greater height at first before it ceased to move upwards than the level at which it was observed to stand when the temple was rediscovered in 1749. For we learn from a memoir of Nicolini published in 1838 that since the beginning of the 19th century the temple of Serapis has subsided more than two feet. That learned architect visited the ruins frequently for the sake of making drawings in the beginning of the year 1807 and was in the habit of remaining there throughout the day, yet never saw the pavement overflowed by the sea, except occasionally when the south wind blew violently. On his return, sixteen years after, to superintend some excavations ordered by the king of Naples, he found the pavement covered up by seawater twice every day at high tide, so that he was obliged to place a line of stones to stand upon. This induced him to make a series of observations from October 1822 to July 1838, by which means he ascertained that the ground had been and was sinking at the average rate of about seven millimeters a year, or about one inch in four years so that in 1838 fish were caught every day on that part of the pavement where in 1807 there was never a drop of water in calm weather. 
On inquiring still more recently as to the condition of the temple and the continuance of the sinking of the ground, I learned from Signor Saki in a letter dated June 1852 that the downward movement has ceased for several years or has at least become almost inappressible. During an examination undertaken by him at my request in the summer of that year, 1852, he observed that the rising tide spread first over the seaward side of the flat surface of the pedestals of each column, confirming the fact previously noticed by others that they are out of the perpendicular. And he also remarked that the water gained unequally on the base of each pillar, in such a manner as to prove that they have neither the same amount of inclination nor lean precisely in the same direction. From what was said before, we saw that the marine shells in the strata forming the plain called La Starza, considered separately, established the fact of an upheaval of the ground to the height of 23 feet and upwards. The temple proves much more, because it could not have been built originally under water, and must therefore have sunk down 20 feet at least below the waves, to be afterwards restored to its original position. Yet if such was the order of events, we ought to meet with other independent signs of a like subsidence around the margin of a bay, one so studded with buildings as the Bay of Bahi. Accordingly, memorials of such submergence are not wanting. About a mile northwest of the Temple of Serapis, and about 500 feet from the shore, are the ruins of a Temple of Neptune and others of a Temple of the Nymphs, now underwater. The columns of the former edifice stand erect in five feet of water, their upper portions just rising to the surface of the sea. The pedestals are doubtless buried in the sand or mud, so that if this part of the bottom of the bay should hereafter be elevated, the exhumation of these temples might take place after the manner of that of Serapis. Both these buildings probably participated in the movement which raised the Sarza, but either they were deeper underwater than the temple of Serapis, or they were not raised up again to so great a height. There are also two Roman roads underwater in the bay, one reaching from Puzzuoli to the Lucrine Lake, which may still be seen, and the other near the castle of Bai. The ancient mole, too, of Puzuoli, before alluded to, has the water up to a considerable height of the arches, whereas Brieslak just observes, it is next to certain that the piers must formerly have reached the surface before the springing of the arches, so that, although the phenomena before described prove that this mole has been uplifted ten feet above the level at which it once stood, it is still evident that it has not yet been restored to its original position. A modern writer also reminds us that these effects are not so local as some would have us to believe, for on the opposite side of the Bay of Naples, on the Sorrentine coast, which as well as Puzzuoli is subject to earthquakes, a road with some fragments of Roman buildings, is covered to some depth by the sea. In the island of Capri also, which is situated some way out at sea, in the opening of the Bay of Naples, one of the palaces of Tiberius is now covered with water. That buildings should have been submerged and afterwards upheaved without being entirely reduced to a heap of ruins will appear no anomaly when we recollect that in the year 1819, when the delta of the Indus sunk down, the houses within the fort of Sindre subsided beneath the waves without being overthrown. In like manner, in the year 1692, the buildings round the harbour of Port Royal in Jamaica descended suddenly to the depth of between 30 and 50 feet under the sea without falling. Even on small portions of land uh, transported to a distance of a mile down a declivity, tenements like those near Mileto in Calabria were carried entire. At Valparaiso, buildings were left standing in 1822, when their foundations, together with a long tract of the Chilean coast, were permanently upraised to the height of several feet. It is still more easy to conceive that an edifice may escape falling during the upheaval or subsidence of land if the walls are supported on the exterior and interior with a deposit like that which surrounded and filled to the height of 10 or 11 feet the temple of Serapis, all the time it was sinking, and which enveloped it to more than twice that height when it was rising again to its original level. We can scarcely avoid the conclusion, as Mr. Babbage has hinted, that the action of heat is in some way or other the cause of the phenomena of the change of level of the temple, its own hot spring, its immediate contiguity to the Solfatara, its nearness to the Monte Nuovo, the hot spring at the baths of Nero on the opposite side of the Bay of Bahia, the boiling springs and ancient volcanoes of Ischia on one side and Vesuvius on the other, 
are the most prominent of a multitude of facts which point to that conclusion. And when we reflect on the dates of the principal oscillations of level and the volcanic history of the country before described, we seem to discover a connection between each era of upheaval and a local development of volcanic heat, and again between each era of depression and the local quiescence or dormant conditions of the subterranean igneous causes. Thus, for example, before the Christian era, when so many events were in frequent eruption in Ischia, and when Avernus and other points in the flagrant fields were celebrated for their volcanic aspect and character, the ground on which the temple stood was several feet above water. Vesuvius was then regarded as a spent volcano, but when after the Christian era the fires of that mountain were rekindled, scarcely a single outburst was ever witnessed in Ischia or around the Bay of Bai. Then the temple was sinking. Vesuvius, at that subsequent period, became nearly dormant for five centuries preceding the great outbreak of 1631, and in that interval the Solfatarua was in eruption, 1198, Ischia in 1302, and Monte Nuovo was formed in 1538. Then the foundations on which the temple stood were rising again. Lastly, Vesuvius once more became a most active event, and has been so ever since and during the same lapse of time, the area of the temple, so far as we know anything of its history, has been subsiding. This phenomena would agree well with the hypothesis that when the subterranean heat is on the increase, and when lava is forming without obtaining an easy vent, like that afforded by a great habitual chimney such as Vesuvius, the incumbent surface is uplifted, but when the heated rocks below are cooling and contracting, the sheets of lava are slowly consolidating and diminishing in volume. Then the incumbent land subsides. Signor Nicolini, when he ascertained in 1838 that the relative levels of the floor of the temple and of the sea were slowly changing from ear to ear, embraced the opinion that it was the sea which was rising. But Signor Capocci successfully controverted this view appealing to many appearances which attest the local character of the movements of the adjoining country, besides the historical fact that in 1538, when the sea retired permanently 200 yards from the ancient shore at Puzzuoli, there was no simultaneous retreat of the waters from Naples, Castelmare and Ischia. Permanence of the Ocean's Level in concluding this subject, I may observe that the interminable controversies to which the phenomena of the Bay of Bai give rise have sprung from an extreme reluctance to admit that the land, rather than the sea, is subject alternately to rise and fall. Had it been assumed that the level of the ocean was invariable on the ground that no fluctuations have yet been clearly established, and that, on the other hand, the continents are inconstant in their level, as has been demonstrated by the most unequivocal proofs again and again from the time of Strabo to our own times, the appearances of the temple at Puzzuoli could never have been regarded as enigmatical. Even if contemporary accounts had not distinctly attested the, the uprising of the coast, this explanation should have been proposed in the first instance as the most natural, instead of being now adopted unwillingly when all others have failed. To the strong prejudices still existing in regard to the mobility of the land, we may attribute the rarity of such discoveries as have been recently brought to light in the Bay of Bai and the Bay of Conception. A false theory, it is well known, may render us blind to facts which are opposed to our prepossessions, or may conceal from us their true import when we behold them. But it is time that the geologist should, in some degree, overcome those first unnatural impressions which induced the poets of old to select the rock as the emblem of firmness, the sea as the image of inconstancy. Our modern poet, in a more philosophical spirit, saw in the sea the image of eternity, and has finally contrasted the fleeting existence of the successive empires which have flourished and fallen on the borders of the ocean, with its own unchanged stability. Their decay has dried up realms to deserts, not so thou unchangeable, save to thy wild waves play. Time writes no wrinkle on thine azure brow, such as creation's dawn beheld, thou rollest now. Child Harold, Canto 4 End of chapter 29 and section 72
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Principles of Geology by Charles Lyell. Chapter 30 Elevation and Subsidence of Land Without Earthquakes. Changes in the relative level of land and sea in regions not volcanic. Opinion of Celsius that the waters of the Baltic Sea and Northern Ocean were sinking. Objections raised to his opinion. Proofs of the stability of the sea level in the Baltic. Playfair's hypothesis that the land was rising in Sweden. Opinion of von Buch. Marks cut on the rocks. Survey of these in 1820. Facility of detecting slight alterations of level on coast of Sweden. Shores of the ocean also rising. Area upheaved. Shelly deposits of the Udavala. Of Stockholm, containing fossil shells characteristic of the Baltic. Subsidence in south of Sweden. Fishing hut buried under marine strata. Upheaval in Sweden, not always in horizontal plains. Sinking of land in Greenland. Bearing of these facts on geology. We have now considered the phenomena of volcanoes and earthquakes according to the division of the subject before proposed, and have next to turn our attention to those slow and insensible changes in the relative level of land and sea which take place in countries remote from volcanoes, and where no violent earthquakes have occurred within the period of human observation. Early in the last century, the Swedish naturalist Celsius expressed his opinion that the waters, both of the Baltic and Northern Ocean, were gradually subsiding. From numerous observations, he inferred that the rate of depression was about 50 Swedish inches in a century. In support of this position, he alleged that there were many rocks both on the shores of the Baltic and the ocean known to have been once sunken reefs and dangerous to navigators, but which were in his time above water, that the waters of the Gulf of Bothnia had been gradually converted into land, several ancient ports having been changed into inland cities, small islands joined to the continent, and old fishing grounds deserted as being too shallow or entirely dried up. Celsius also maintained that the evidence of the change rested not only on modern observations, but on the authority of the ancient geographers, who had stated that Scandinavia was formerly an island. This island, he argued, must in the course of centuries, by the gradual retreat of the sea, have become connected with the continent, an event which he supposed to have happened after the time of Pliny and before the ninth century of our era. To this argument it was objected that the ancients were so ignorant of the geography of the most northern parts of Europe that their authority was entitled to no weight, and that the representation of Scandinavia as an island might with more propriety be adduced to prove the scantiness of their information than to confirm so bold an hypothesis. It was also remarked that if the land which connected Scandinavia with the main continent was laid dry between the time of Pliny and the ninth century, to the extent to which it is known to have risen above the sea at the latter period, the rate of depression could not have been uniform, as was pretended, for it ought to have fallen much more rapidly between the ninth and eighteenth centuries. Many of the proofs relied on by Celsius and his followers were immediately controverted by several philosophers, who saw clearly that a fall of the sea in any one region could not take place without a general sinking of the waters over the whole globe. They denied that this was the fact, or that the depression was universal, even in the Baltic. In proof of the stability of the level of that sea, they appealed to the position of the island Saltholm, not far from Copenhagen. This island is so low that in autumn and winter it is permanently overflowed, and it is only dry in summer, when it serves for pasturing cattle. 
it appears from the documents of the year 1280 that Saltholm was then also in the same state and exactly on a level with the mean height of the sea, instead of having been about twenty feet under water, as it ought to have been, according to the computation of Celsius. Several towns also on the shores of the Baltic, as Lübeck, Wismar, Rostock, Stralsund, and others, after six and even eight hundred years, are as little elevated above the sea as at the era of their foundation, being now close to the water's edge. The lowest part of Danzig was no higher than the mean level of the sea in the year 1000, and after eight centuries its relative position remains exactly the same. Several of the examples of the gain of land and shallowing of the sea pointed out by Celsius, and afterwards by Linnaeus, who embraced the same opinions, were ascribed by others to the deposition of sediment at points where rivers entered, and undoubtedly Celsius had not sufficiently distinguished between changes due to these causes and such as would arise if the waters of the ocean itself were diminishing. Many large rivers descending from a mountainous country, at the head of the Gulf of Bothnia, enter the sea charged with sand, mud, and pebbles, and it was said that in these places the low land had advanced rapidly, especially near Tornio. At Pitio, also, half a mile had been gained in forty-five years, at Lulio no less than a mile in twenty-eight years. Facts which might all be admitted consistently with the assumptions that the level of the Baltic had remained unchanged, like that of the Adriatic, during a period when the plains of the Po and the Adige have greatly extended their area. It was also alleged that certain insular rocks, once entirely covered with water, had at length protruded themselves above the waves, and grown, in the course of a century and a half, to be eight feet high. The following attempt was made to explain away this phenomenon. In the Baltic, large erratic blocks, as well as sand and smaller stones which lie on shoals, are liable every year to be frozen into the ice, where the sea freezes to the depth of five or six feet. On the melting of the snow in spring, when the sea rises about half a fathom, numerous ice islands float away, bearing up these rocky fragments so as to convey them to a distance, and if they are driven by the waves upon shoals, they may convert them into islands by depositing the blocks. If stranded upon low islands, they may considerably augment their height. Roalius also, and some other Swedish naturalists, affirmed that some islands were lower than formerly, and that by reference to this kind of evidence there was equally good reason for contending that the level of the Baltic was gradually rising. They also added another curious proof of the permanency of the water level, at some points at least for many centuries. On the Finland coast were some large pines, growing close to the water's edge. These were cut down, and by counting the concentric rings of annual growth, as seen in a transverse section of the trunk, it was demonstrated that they had stood there for four hundred years. Now, according to the Celsian hypothesis, the sea had sunk about fifteen feet during that period, in which case the germination and early growth of these pines must have been, for many seasons, below the level of the water. In like manner, it was asserted that the lower walls of many ancient castles, such as those of Sonderberg and Abo, reached then to the water's edge, and must therefore, according to the theory of Celsius, have been originally constructed below the level of the sea. In reply to this last argument, Colonel Halström, a Swedish engineer, well acquainted with the Finland coast, assured me that the base of the walls of the castle of Abo is now ten feet above the water, so that there may have been a considerable rise of the land at that point, since the building was erected. Playfair, in his illustrations of the Hottonian theory, in 1802, admitted the sufficiency of the proofs adduced by Celsius, but attributed the change of level to the movement of the land, rather than to a diminution of the waters. He observed, quote, that in order to depress or elevate the absolute level of the sea by a given quantity in any one place, 
we must depress or elevate it by the same quantity over the whole surface of the earth, whereas no such necessity exists with respect to the elevation or depression of the land. Unquote. The hypothesis of the rising of the land, he adds, agrees well with the Huttonian theory, which holds that our continents are subject to be acted upon by the expansive forces of the mineral regions, that by these forces they have been actually raised up and are sustained by them in their present situation. In the year 1807, von Buch, after returning from a tour in Scandinavia, announced his conviction that the whole country, from Frederikshall in Norway to Abo in Finland, and perhaps as far as St. Petersburg, was slowly and insensibly rising. He also suggested that Sweden may rise more than Norway, and the northern more than the southern part. He was led to these conclusions principally by information obtained from the inhabitants and pilots, and in part by the occurrence of marine shells of recent species, which he had found at several points on the coast of Norway, above the level of the sea. He also mentions the marks set on the rocks. Von Buch, therefore, has the merit of being the first geologist who, after a personal examination of the evidence, declared in favor of the rise of land in Scandinavia. The attention excited by this subject in the early part of the last century induced many philosophers in Sweden to endeavor to determine, by accurate observations, whether the standard level of the Baltic was really subject to periodical variations, and under their direction, lines or grooves indicating the ordinary level of the water on a calm day, together with the date of the year, were chiseled out upon the rocks. In 1820-21, to 21, all the marks made before those years were examined by the officers of the pilotage establishment of Sweden, and in their report to the Royal Academy of Stockholm, they declared that on comparing the level of the sea at the time of their observations with that indicated by the ancient marks, they found that the Baltic was lower relatively to the land in certain places, but the amount of change during equal periods of time had not been everywhere the same. During their survey, they cut new marks for the guidance of future observers several of which I had an opportunity of examining fourteen years after, in the summer of 1834, and in that interval the land appeared to me to have risen, at certain places north of Stockholm, four or five inches. I also convinced myself, during my visit to Sweden, after conversing with many civil engineers, pilots, and fishermen, and after examining some of the ancient marks, that the evidence formally adduced in favor of the change of level both on the coasts of Sweden and Finland was full and satisfactory. The alteration of level evidently diminishes as we proceed from the northern parts of the Gulf of Bothnia towards the south, being very slight around Stockholm. Some writers have indeed represented the rate of depression of the waters at Stockholm as very considerable, because certain houses in that city, which are built on piles, have sunk down within the memory of persons still living, so as to be out of the perpendicular. And this, in consequence of the tops of the piles, giving way and decaying, owing to a fall of the waters which has exposed them to be alternately wet and dry. The houses alluded to are situated on the borders of Lake Mailer, a large lake, the outlet of which joins the Baltic, in the middle of Stockholm. This lake is certainly lower than formerly, but the principal cause of the change is not the elevation of the land, but the removal of two old bridges, built on piles, which formerly obstructed the discharge of the fresh water into the sea. Another cause is the opening in the year 1819 of a new canal, at Sattertelge, a place south of Stockholm, by means of which a new line of communication was formed between Lake Mailer and the Baltic. It will naturally be asked, 
whether the mean level of a sea like the baltic can ever be determined so exactly as to permit us to appreciate a variation of level amounting only to one or two feet in reply i may observe that except near the Cattegat, there are no tides in the baltic and it is only when particular winds have prevailed for several days in succession or at certain seasons when there has been an unusually abundant influx of river water or when these causes have combined that this sea is made to rise two or three feet above its standard level the fluctuations due to these causes are nearly the same from year to year so that the pilots and fishermen believe and apparently with reason that they can mark a deviation even of a few inches from the ordinary or mean height of the waters there are moreover peculiarities in the configuration of the shores of norway and sweden which facilitate in a remarkable degree the appreciation of slight changes in the relative level of land and water it has often been said that there are two coasts the inner and an outer one the inner being the shore of the main land the outer one a fringe of countless rocky islands of all dimensions called the share boats and small vessels make their coasting voyages within this share for here they may sail in smooth water even when the sea without is strongly agitated but the navigation is very intricate and the pilot must possess a perfect acquaintance with the breadth and depth of every narrow channel and the position of innumerable sunken rocks if on such a coast the land rises one or two feet in the course of a half a century the minute topography of the share is entirely altered to a stranger indeed who revisits it after an interval of many years its general aspect remains the same but the inhabitant finds that he can no longer penetrate with his boat through channels which he formerly passed and he can tell of countless other changes in the height and breadth of isolated rocks now exposed but once only seen through clear water. The rocks of Gneiss, mica schist, and quartz are usually very hard on this coast, slow to decompose, and when protected from the breakers, remaining for ages unaltered in their form. Hence it is easy to mark the stages of their progressive emergence by the aid of natural and artificial marks imprinted on them besides the summits of fixed rocks there are numerous erratic blocks of vast size strewed over the shoals and islands in the schwer which have been probably drifted by the ice in the manner before suggested all these are observed to have increased in height and dimension with the last half century some which were formerly known as dangerous sunken rocks are now only hidden when the water is highest on their first appearance they usually present a smooth bare rounded protuberance a few feet or yards in diameter and a single seagull often appropriates to itself this resting place resorting there to devour its prey similar points in the meantime have grown to long reefs and are constantly whitened by a multitude of sea fowl while others have been changed from a reef annually submerged to a small islet on which a few lichens a fir seedling and a few blades of grass attest that the shoal has at length been fairly changed into dry land thousands of wooded islands around show the great alterations which time can work in the course of centuries also the spaces intervening between the existing islands may be laid dry and become grassy plains encircled by heights well clothed with lofty firs this last step of the process by which long fjords and narrow channels once separating wooded islands are now deserted by the sea has been exemplified within the memory of living witnesses on several parts of the coast had the apparent fall of the waters been observed in the Baltic only, we might have endeavored to explain the phenomenon by local causes affecting that sea alone. For instance, the channel by which the Baltic discharges its surplus waters into the Atlantic 
might be supposed to have been gradually widened and deepened by the waves and currents in which case a fall of the water like the water alluded to in lake mailer might have occurred but the lowering of level would in that case have been uniform and universal and the waters could not have sunk at Tornio, while they retained their former level at copenhagen such an explanation is also untenable on other grounds for it is a fact as celsius long ago affirmed that the alteration of level extends to the western shores of sweden bordering the ocean the signs of elevation observed between Odevela and gothenburg were as well established as those on the shores of the bothnian gulf among the places where they may be studied are the islands of marstrand and gulholmen the last mentioned locality being one of those particularly pointed out by celsius the inhabitants there and elsewhere affirm that the rate of the sinking of the sea or elevation of the land varies in different and adjoining districts being greatest at points where the land is low but in this they are deceived for they measure the amount of rise by the area gained which is most considerable where the land descends with a gentle slope into the sea. In the same manner, some advocates of the Celsian theory formally appealed to the increase of lands near the mouths of rivers, not sufficiently adverting to the fact that if the bed of the sea is rising, the change will always be most sensible where the bottom has been previously rendered shallow, whereas at a distance from these points, where the scarped granitic cliffs plunge at once into deep water a much greater amount of elevation is necessary to produce an equally conspicuous change as to the area in northern europe which is subject to this slow upheaving movement we have not as yet sufficient data for estimating it correctly it seems probable however that it reaches from gothenburg to tornio and from thence to the north cape the rate of elevation increasing always as we proceed farther northwards the two extremities of this line are more than a thousand geographical miles distant from each other and as both terminate in the ocean we know not how much farther the motion may be prolonged under water as to the breadth of the tract its limits are equally uncertain though it evidently extends across the widest parts of the gulf of bothnia and may probably stretch far into the interior both of Sweden and Finland. Now, if the elevation continue, a larger part of the Gulf of Bothnia will be turned into land, as also more of the ocean off the west coast of Sweden between Gothenburg and Uddevalla. And on the other hand, if the change has been going on for thousands of years at the rate of several feet in a century, large tracts of what is now land must have been submarine in periods comparatively modern. It is natural, therefore, to inquire whether there are any signs of the recent sojourn of the sea on districts now inland. The answer is most satisfactory. Near Udavala and the neighboring coastland, we find upraised deposits of shells belonging to species such as now live in the ocean, while on the opposite or eastern side of Sweden near Stockholm, Gefla, and other places bordering the Bothnian Gulf, there are analogous beds containing shells of species characteristic of the Baltic. Von Buch announced in 1807 that he had discovered in Norway and at Uddevalla in Sweden beds of shells of existing species at considerable heights above the sea. Since that time, other naturalists have confirmed his observation, and according to Strong, Deposits occur at an elevation of more than 400 feet above the sea in the northern part of Norway. Mr. Alex Broniart, when he visited Udavala, ascertained that one of the principal masses of shells, that of Kapelbakken, is raised more than 200 feet above the sea, resting on rocks of gneiss, all the species being identical with those now inhabiting the contiguous ocean. The same naturalist also stated that on examining with care the surface of the gneiss immediately above the ancient shelly deposit, he found barnacles, baleni, adhering to the rocks, showing that the sea had remained there for a long time. 
it was fortunate enough to be able to verify this observation by finding in the summer of 1834 at Curid, about two miles north of Udavala, and at the height of more than a hundred feet above the sea, a surface of gneiss, newly laid upon by the partial removal of a mass of shells used largely in the district for making lime and repairing the roads. So firmly did these barnacles adhere to the gneiss that I broke off portions of the rock with the shells attached. The face of the gneiss was also encrusted with small zoophytes, Celopera. But had these or the barnacles been exposed in the atmosphere ever since the elevation of the rocks above the sea, they would doubtless have decomposed and been obliterated. End of section 73「Chapter Thirty, Part Two of Principles of Geology. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Principles of Geology by Charles Lyell. Chapter Thirty, Part Two. The town of Udavala stands at the head of a narrow creek overhung by steep and barren rocks of gneiss of which all the adjacent country is composed, except in the low grounds and bottoms of valleys where strata of sand, clay, and marl frequently hide the fundamental rocks. To these newer and horizontal deposits, the fossil shells above mentioned belong, and similar marine remains are found at various heights above the sea on the opposite island of Orust, the extreme distance from the sea to which such fossils extend is as yet unknown, but they have been already found at Tralhattan in digging the canal there, and still farther inland on the northern borders of Lake Werner, fifty miles from the sea, at an elevation of two hundred feet near Lake Rogvarpen. To pass the Baltic, I observed near its shores, at Sotertelje, sixteen miles southwest of Stockholm, strata of sand clay and marl more than a hundred feet high and containing shells of species now inhabiting the bothnian gulf these consist partly of marine and partly of freshwater species but they are few in number the brackishness of the water appearing to be very unfavorable to the development of testacea the most abundant species are the common cockle and the common mussel and periwinkle of our shores, Cardium eduli, Mytilus edulis, and Litorina litoria, together with a small telina, T. baltica, and a few minute univalves allied to Paludina ulva. These live in the same water as Limnius, a neritina, in fluviatilis and some other freshwater shells. But the marine mollusks of the Baltic above mentioned, although very numerous in individuals, are dwarfish in size, scarcely ever attaining a third of the average dimensions which they acquire in the salter waters of the ocean. By this character alone, a geologist would generally be able to recognize an assemblage of Baltic fossils as distinguished from those derived from a deposit in the ocean. The absence also of oysters, barnacles, whelks, scallops, limpets, ostria, balanus, buccinum, pectin, patella, and many other forms abounding alike in the sea near Udavala and in the fossiliferous deposits of modern date on that coast, supplies an additional negative character of the greatest value distinguishing assemblages of Baltic from those of oceanic shells. Now the strata containing Baltic shells are found in many localities near Stockholm, Uppsala, and Gefla, and will probably be discovered elsewhere around the borders of the Bothnian Gulf, for I have seen similar remains brought from Finland, in marl resembling that found near Stockholm. The utmost distance to which these deposits have yet been traced inland is on the southern shores of Lake Mailer, at a place seventy miles from the sea. Hence it appears from the distinct assemblage of fossil shells found on the eastern and western coasts of Sweden that the Baltic has been for a long period 
separated as now from the ocean, although the intervening tract of land was once much narrower, even after both seas had become inhabited by all the existing species of testacea. As no accurate observations on the rise of the Swedish coast refer to periods more remote than a century and a half from the present time, and as traditional information, and that derived from ancient buildings on the coast, do not enable the antiquary to trace back any monuments of change for more than five or six centuries, we cannot declare whether the rate of the upheaving force is uniform during very long periods. In those districts where the fossil shells are found at the height of more than 200 feet above the ocean, as at Udavala, Orest, and Lake Rogvarpen, the present rate of rise seems less than four feet in a century. Even at that rate, it would have required 5,000 years to lift up those deposits. But as the movement is now very different in different places, it may also have varied much in intensity at different eras. We have, moreover, yet to learn not only whether the motion proceeds always at the same rate, but also whether it has been uniformly in one direction. The level of the land may oscillate, and for centuries there may be a depression, and afterwards a re-elevation of the same district. Some phenomena in the neighborhood of Stockholm appear to me only explicable on the supposition of the alternate rising and sinking of the ground since the country was inhabited by man. In digging a canal in 1819 at Sartre about 16 miles to the south of Stockholm, to unite Lake Mueller with the Baltic, marine strata, containing fossil shells of Baltic species, were passed through. At a depth of about 60 feet, they came down upon what seems to have been a buried fishing hut, constructed of wood in a state of decomposition, which soon crumbled away on exposure to the air. The lowest part, however, which has stood on a level with the sea, was in a more perfect state of preservation. On the floor of this hut was a rude fireplace, consisting of a ring of stones, and within this there were cinders and charred wood. On the outside lay boughs of the fir, cut as with an axe, with the leaves or needles still attached. It seems very difficult to explain the position of this buried hut without imagining, as in the case of the Temple of Serapis, first a subsidence to the depth of more than sixty feet, then a re-elevation. During that period of submergence, the hut must have been covered over with gravel and shelly marl, under which not only the hut, but several vessels also were found of a very antique form, and having their timbers fastened together by wooden pegs instead of nails. Whether any of the land in Norway is now rising must be determined by future investigations. Marine fossil shells of recent species have been collected from inland places near Drontheim, but Mr. Everest, in his travels through Norway, informs us that the small island of Munkholm, which is an insulated rock in the harbor of Drontheim, affords conclusive evidence of the land having in that region remained stationary for the last eight centuries. The area of this isle does not exceed that of a small village, and by an official survey its highest point has been determined to be 23 feet above the mean high-water mark, that is, the mean between neap and spring tides. Now a monastery was founded there by Knut the Great, A.D. 1028, and 33 years before that time it was in use as a common place of execution, according to the assumed average rate of rise in Sweden, about 40 inches in a century, we should be obliged to suppose that this island had been 3 feet 8 inches below high water mark when it was originally chosen as the site of the monastery. Professor Kielhauer of Christiania, after collecting the observations of his predecessors respecting former changes of level in Norway and combining them with his own, has made the fact of a general change of level at a modern period, that is to say, within the period of the actual testaceous fauna, very evident. He infers that the whole country from Cape Lindesnes to Cape North, and beyond that as far as the fortress of Vardhus, has been gradually upraised, 
and on the southeast coast the elevation has amounted to more than 600 feet. The marks which denote the ancient coastline are so nearly horizontal that the deviation from horizontality, although the measurements have been made at a great number of points, is too small to be appreciated. More recently, 1844, however, it appears from the researches of M. Bravet, member of the French Scientific Commission of the North, that in the Gulf of Altin in Finnmark, the most northerly part of Norway, there are two distinct lines of upraised ancient sea coast, one above the other, which are not parallel, and both of them imply that within a distance of fifty miles a considerable slope can be detected in such a direction as to show that the ancient shores have undergone a greater amount of upheaval in proportion as we advance inland. It has already been stated that in proceeding from the North Cape to Stockholm, the rate of upheaval diminishes from several feet to a few inches in a century. To the south of Stockholm, the upward movement ceases, and at length, in Scania, or the southernmost part of Sweden, it appears to give place to a movement in an opposite direction. In proof of this fact, Professor Nilsson observes, in the first place, that there are no elevated beds of recent marine shells in Scania like those farther to the north. Secondly, Linnaeus, with a view of ascertaining whether the waters of the Baltic were retiring from the Scanian shore, measured in 1749 the distance between the sea and a large stone near Trelleborg. This same stone was, in 1836, a hundred feet nearer the water's edge than in Linnaeus's time, or 87 years before. Thirdly, there is also a submerged peat moss, consisting of land and freshwater plants, beneath the sea at a point to which no peat could have been drifted down by any river. Fourthly, and what is still more conclusive, it is found that in seaport towns all along the coast of Scania, there are streets below the high water level of the Baltic, and in some cases below the level of the lowest tide. Thus, when the wind is high at Malmo, the water overflows one of the present streets, and some years ago some excavations showed an ancient street in the same place eight feet lower, and it was then seen that there had been an artificial raising of the ground, doubtless in consequence of that subsidence. There is also a street in Trelleborg and another at Scanor, a few inches below high water mark, and a street in Stad is exactly on a level with the sea, at which it could not have been originally built. The inferences deduced from the foregoing facts are in perfect harmony with the proofs brought to light by two Danish investigators, Dr. Pingel and Captain Gra, of the sinking down of part of the west coast of Greenland for a space of more than 600 miles from north to south. The observations of Captain Gra were made during a survey of Greenland in 1823-24, to 24, and afterwards in 1828-29. to 29. Those by Dr. Pingel were made in 1830-32. to 32. It appears from various signs and traditions that the coast has been subsiding for the last four centuries, from the firth called Igalico, in latitude 60 degrees 43 minutes north, to Disco Bay, extending to nearly the 69th degree of north latitude. Ancient buildings on low rocky islands and on the shore of the mainland have been gradually submerged, and experience has taught the aboriginal Greenlander never to build his hut near the water's edge. In one case, the Moravian settlers have been obliged, more than once, to move inland the poles upon which their large boats were set, and the old poles still remain beneath the water as silent witnesses of the change. The probable cause of the movements above alluded to, whether of elevation or depression, will be more appropriately discussed in the following chapters, when the origin of subterranean heat is considered. But I may remark here that the rise of Scandinavia has naturally been regarded as a very singular and scarcely credible phenomenon, because no region on the globe has been more free within the times of authentic history from violent earthquakes. In common, indeed, with our own island, and with almost every spot on the globe, 
some movements have been at different periods experienced, both in Norway and Sweden, but some of these, as for example during the Lisbon earthquake in 1755, may have been mere vibrations or undulatory movements of the Earth's crust prolonged from a great distance. Others, however, have been sufficiently local to indicate a source of disturbance immediately under the country itself. Notwithstanding these shocks, Scandinavia has, upon the whole, been as tranquil in modern times, as free from subterranean convulsions, as any region of equal extent on the globe. There is also another circumstance which has made the change of level in Sweden appear anomalous, and has, for a long time, caused the proofs of the fact to be received with reluctance. Volcanic action, as we have seen, is usually intermittent, and the variations of level to which it has given rise have taken place by starts, not by a prolonged and insensible movement similar to that experienced in Sweden. Yet, as we enlarge our experience of modern changes, we discover instances in which the volcanic eruption, the earthquake, and the permanent rise or fall of land, whether slow or sudden, are all connected. The union of these various circumstances was exemplified in the case of the Temple of Serapis described in the last chapter, and we might derive other illustrations from the events of the present century in South America. Some writers indeed have imagined that there is geological evidence in Norway of the sudden upheaval of land to a considerable height at successive periods, since the era when the sea was inhabited by the living species of Testacea. They point in proof to certain horizontal lines of inland cliffs and sea beaches containing recent shells at various heights above the level of the sea. But these appearances when truly interpreted, simply prove that there have been long pauses in the process of upheaval or subsidence. They mark eras at which the level of the sea has remained stationary for ages, and during which new strata were deposited near the shore in some places, while in others the waves and currents had time to hollow out rocks, undermine cliffs, and throw up long ranges of shingle. They undoubtedly show that the movement has not been always uniform, or continuous, but they do not establish the fact of any sudden alterations of level. When we are once assured of the reality of the gradual rise of a large region, it enables us to account for many geological appearances otherwise of very difficult explanation. There are large continental tracts and high tablelands where the strata are nearly horizontal, bearing no marks of having been thrown up by violent convulsions, nor by a series of movements such as those which occur in the Andes and cause the earth to be rent open and raised or depressed from time to time while large masses are engulfed in subterranean cavities. The result of a series of such earthquakes might be to produce in great lapse of ages a country of shattered, inclined, and perhaps vertical strata, but a movement like that of Scandinavia will cause the bed of the sea and all the strata recently formed in it to be upheaved so gradually that it would merely seem as if the ocean had formerly stood at a higher level and had slowly and tranquilly sunk down to its present bed. The fact also of a very gradual and insensible elevation of land may explain many geological movements of denudation on a grand scale. If, for example instead of the hard granitic rocks of Norway and Sweden, a large part of the bed of the Atlantic, consisting chiefly of soft strata, should rise up century after century at the rate of about half an inch or an inch in a year, how easily might oceanic currents sweep away the thin film of matter thus brought up annually within the sphere of aqueous denudation. The tract, when it finally emerged, might present tablelands and ridges of horizontal strata, with intervening valleys and vast plains, where originally, and during its period of submergence, the surface was level and nearly uniform. These speculations relate to superficial changes, but others must be continually in progress in the subterranean regions. The foundations of the country, thus gradually uplifted in Sweden, 
must be undergoing important modifications. Whether we ascribe these to the expansion of solid matter by continually increasing heat, or to the liquefaction of rock, or to the crystallization of a dense fluid, or the accumulation of pent-up gases, in whatever conjectures we indulge, we can never doubt for a moment that at some unknown depth beneath Sweden and the Baltic, the structure of the globe is in our own times becoming changed from day to day throughout a space probably more than a thousand miles in length and several hundred in breadth end of chapter thirty end of section seventy four chapter thirty one of principles of geology this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lisa S. Ware. Chapter 31. Causes of Earthquakes and Volcanoes. It will hardly be questioned, after the description before given of the phenomena of earthquakes and volcanoes, that both of these agents have, to a certain extent, a common origin, and I may now therefore proceed to inquire into their probable causes. But first, it may be well to recapitulate some of those points of relation and analogy which led naturally to the conclusion that they spring from a common source. The regions convulsed by violent earthquakes include within them the site of all the active volcanoes. Earthquakes, sometimes local, sometimes extending over vast areas, often precede volcanic eruptions. The subterranean movement and the eruption return again and again, at irregular intervals of time and with unequal degrees of force, to the same spots. The action of either may continue for a few hours or for several consecutive years. Paroxysmal convulsions are usually followed in both cases by long periods of tranquility. Thermal and mineral springs are abundant in countries of earthquakes and active volcanoes. Lastly, hot springs situated in districts considerably distant from volcanic vents have been observed to have their temperature suddenly raised and the volume of their water augmented by subterranean movements. All these appearances are evidently more or less connected with the passage of heat from the interior of the earth to the surface, and where there are active volcanoes, there must exist, at some unknown depth below, enormous masses of matter intensely heated and, in many instances, in a constant state of fusion. We have first, then, to inquire, whence is this heat derived? It has long been a favorite conjecture that the whole of our planet was originally in a state of igneous fusion, and that the central parts still retain a great portion of their primitive heat. Some have imagined, with the late Sir W. Herschel, that the elementary matter of the Earth may have been first in a gaseous state, resembling those nebulae which we behold in the heavens, and which are of dimensions so vast that some of them would fill the orbits of the remotest planets of our system. The increased power of the telescope has of late years resolved the greater number of these nebulous appearances into clusters of stars, but so long as they were confidently supposed to consist of aeriform matter, it was a favorite conjecture that they might, if concentrated, form solid spheres, and it was also imagined that the evolution of heat attendant on condensation might retain the materials of the new globes in a state of igneous fusion. Without dwelling on such speculations, which can only have a distant bearing on geology, we may consider how far the spheroidal form of the earth affords sufficient ground for presuming that its primitive condition was one of universal fluidity. The discussion of this question would be superfluous were the doctrine of original fluidity less popular, for it may well be asked why the globe should be supposed to have had a pristine shape different from the present one. Why the terrestrial materials, when first called into existence or assembled together in one place, should not have been subject to rotation so as to assume at once that form which alone could retain their several parts in a state of equilibrium. Let us, however, concede that the statical figure may be a modification of some other pre-existing form, and suppose the globe to have been at first a perfect and quiescent sphere, covered with a uniform ocean. What would happen when it was made to turn round on its axis with its present velocity? This problem has been considered by Playfair in his illustrations, and he has decided that if the surface of the Earth, as laid down in Hutton's theory, 
has been repeatedly changed by the transportation of the detrius of the land to the bottom of the sea, the figure of the planet must, in that case, whatever it may have been originally, be brought at length to coincide with the spheroid of equilibrium. Sir John Herschel also, in reference to the same hypothesis, observes, a centrifugal force would in that case be generated whose general tendency would be to urge the water at every point of the surface to recede from the axis. A rotation might indeed be conceived so swift as to flit the whole ocean from the surface like water from a mop, but this would require a far greater velocity than what we now speak of. In the case supposed, the weight of the water would still keep it on the earth and the tendency to recede from the axis could only be satisfied, therefore, by the water leaving the poles and flowing towards the equator, there heaping itself up in a ridge and being retained in opposition to its weight or natural tendency towards the center by the pressure thus caused. This, however, could not take place without laying dry the polar regions so that perturbant land would appear at the poles and a zone of ocean be disposed around the equator. This would be the first or immediate effect, let us now see what would afterwards happen if things were allowed to take their natural course. The sea is constantly beating on the land, grinding it down and scattering its worn-off particles and fragments in the state of sand and pebbles over its bed. Geological facts afford abundant proof that the existing continents have all of them undergone this process even more than once and been entirely torn in fragments or reduced to powder and submerged and reconstructed. Land, in this view of the subject, loses its attribute of fixity. As a mass, it might hold together in opposition to forces which the water freely obeys, but in its state of successive or simultaneous degradation, when disseminated through the water, in the state of sand or mud, it is subject to all the impulses of that fluid. In the lapse of time, then, the protuberant land would be destroyed and spread over the bottom of the ocean, filling up the lower parts and tending continually to remodel the surface of the solid nucleus in correspondence with the form of equilibrium. Thus, after a sufficient lapse of time, in the case of an earth in rotation, the polar protuberances would gradually be cut down and disappear, being transferred to the equator, as being then the deepest sea, till the earth would assume by degrees the form we observe it to have, that of a flattened or oblate ellipsoid. We are far from meaning here to trace the process by which the earth really assumed its actual form. All we intend is to show that this is the form to which, under a condition of a rotation on its axis, it must tend, and which it would attain even if originally and, so to speak, perversely constituted otherwise. In this passage, the author has contemplated the superficial effects of aqueous causes only, but neither he nor Playfair seem to have followed out the same inquiry with reference to another part of Hutton's system, namely, that which assumes the successive fusion by heat of different parts of the solid earth. Yet the progress of geology has continually strengthened the evidence in favor of the doctrine that local variations of temperature have melted one part after another of the earth's crust, and this influence has perhaps extended downwards to the very center. If, therefore, before the globe had assumed its present form, it was made to revolve on its axis, all matter to which freedom of motion was given by fusion must, before consolidating, have been impelled towards the equatorial regions in obedience to the centrifugal force. Thus, lava flowing out in superficial streams would have its motion retarded when its direction was towards the pole, accelerated when towards the equator. Or, if lakes and seas of lava existed beneath the Earth's crust in equatorial regions, as probably now beneath the Peruvian Andes, the imprisoned fluid would force outwards and permanently upheave the overlying rocks. The statical figure, therefore, of the terrestrial spheroid, of which the longest diameter exceeds the shortest by about 25 miles, may have been the result of gradual and even of existing causes and not of a primitive, universal, and simultaneous fluidity. Experiments made with the pendulum and observations on the manner in which the Earth attracts the moon have shown that our planet is not an empty sphere, but, on the contrary, that its interior, whether solid or fluid, has a higher specific gravity than the exterior. It has also been inferred that there is a regular increase in density from the surface towards the center, 
and that the equatorial perturbance is continued inwards, that is to say that layers of equal density are arranged elliptically and symmetrically from the exterior to the center. These conclusions, however, have been deduced rather as a consequence of the hypothesis of primitive and simultaneous fluidity than proved by experiment. The inequalities in the moon's motion, by which some have endeavored to confirm them, are so extremely slight that the opinion can be regarded as little more than a probable conjecture. The mean density of the Earth has been computed by Laplace to be about five and a half, or more than five times that of water. Now the specific gravity of many of our rocks is from two and a half to three, and the greater part of the metals range between that density and 21. Hence, some have imagined that the terrestrial nucleus may be metallic, that it may correspond, for example, with the specific gravity of iron, which is about seven. But here, a curious question arises in regard to the form which materials, whether fluid or solid, might assume if subjected to the enormous pressure which must obtain at the Earth's center. Water, if it continued to decrease in volume according to the rate of compressibility deduced from experiment, would have its density doubled at the depth of 93 miles and be as heavy as mercury at the depth of 362 miles. Dr. Young computed that, at the Earth's center, steel would be compressed into one-fourth and stone into one-eighth of its bulk. It is more than probable, however, that after a certain degree of condensation, the compressibility of bodies may be governed by laws altogether different from those which we can put to the test of experiment. But the limit is still undetermined and the subject is involved in such obscurity that we cannot wonder at the variety of notions which have been entertained respecting the nature and conditions of the central nucleus. Some have conceived it to be fluid, others solid. Some have imagined it to have a cavernous structure and have endeavored to confirm this opinion by appealing to observed irregularities in the vibrations of the pendulum in certain countries. An attempt has recently been made by Mr. Hopkins to determine the least thickness which can be assigned to the solid crust of the globe if we assume the whole to have been once perfectly fluid and a certain portion of the exterior to have acquired solidity by gradual refrigeration. This result he has endeavored to obtain by a new solution of the delicate problem of the processional motion of the pole of the Earth. It is well known that while the Earth revolves around the Sun, the direction of its axis remains very nearly the same, i.e. its different positions in space are all nearly parallel to each other. This parallelism, however, is not accurately preserved, so that the axis, instead of coming exactly into the position which it occupied a year before, becomes inclined to it at a very small angle, but always retaining very nearly the same inclination to the plane of the Earth's orbit. This motion of the pole changes the position of the equinoxes by about 50 seconds annually, and always in the same direction. Thus, the pole star, after a certain time, will entirely lose its claim to that appellation, until in the course of somewhat more than 25,000 years, the Earth's axis shall again occupy its present angular position, and again point very nearly, as now, to the pole star. This motion of the axis is called precession. It is caused by the attraction of the sun and moon, and principally the moon, on the protuberant parts of the Earth's equator, and if these parts were solid to a great depth, the motion thus produced would differ considerably from that which would exist if they were perfectly fluid, and encrusted over with a thin shell only a few miles thick. In other words, the disturbing action of the moon will not be the same upon a globe all solid and upon one nearly all fluid, or it will not be the same upon a globe in which the solid shell forms one half of the mass and another in which it forms only one tenth. Mr. Hopkins has, therefore, calculated the amount of precessional motion which would result if we assume the Earth to be constituted as above stated, i.e., fluid internally and enveloped by a solid shell, and he finds that the amount will not agree with the observed motion unless the crust of the Earth be of a certain thickness. In calculating the exact amount, some ambiguity arises in consequence of our ignorance of the effect of pressure in promoting the solidification of matter at high temperatures. The hypothesis least favorable for a great thickness is found to be that which assumes the pressure to produce no effect on the process of solidification. Even on this extreme assumption, the thickness of the solid crust must be nearly 400 miles, and this would lead to the remarkable result that the proportion of the solid to the fluid part would be as 49 to 51, or, to speak in round numbers, there would be nearly as much solid as fluid matter in the globe. 
The conclusion, however, which Mr. Hopkins announces as that to which his researchers have finally conducted him, is thus expressed. Upon the whole, then, we may venture to assert that the minimum thickness of the crust of the globe, which can be deemed consistent with the observed amount of precession, cannot be less than one-fourth or one-fifth of the Earth's radius. That is from 800 to 1,000 miles. It will be remarked that this is a minimum, and any still greater amount would be quite consistent with the actual phenomena, the calculations not being opposed to the supposition of the general solidity of the entire globe. Nor do they preclude us from imagining that great lakes or seas of melted matter may be distributed through a shell 400 or 800 miles thick, provided they be so enclosed as to move with it, whatever motion of rotation may be communicated by the disturbing forces of the sun and moon. Central Heat the hypothesis of internal fluidity calls for the more attentive consideration as it has been found that the heat in mines augments in proportion as we descend. Observations have been made, not only on the temperature of the air in mines, but on that of the rocks and on the water issuing from them. The mean rate of increase, calculated from results obtained in six of the deepest coal mines in Durham and Northumberland, is one degree Fahrenheit for a descent of 44 English feet. A series of observations made in several of the principal lead and silver mines in Saxony gave one degree Fahrenheit for every 65 feet. In this case, the bulb of the thermometer was introduced into cavities purposely cut in the solid rock at depths varying from 200 to above 900 feet. But in other mines of the same country, it was necessary to descend thrice as far for each degree of temperature. A thermometer was fixed in the rock of the Dolcoth mine in Cornwall by Mr. Fox at the great depth of 1,380 feet and frequently observed during 18 months. The mean temperature was 68 degrees Fahrenheit, that of the surface being 50 degrees, which gives one degree for every 75 feet. Kupfer, after an extensive comparison of the results in different countries, makes the increase one degree Fahrenheit for about every 37 English feet. M. Cordier announces, as the result of his experiments and observations on the temperature of the interior of the earth, that the heat increases rapidly with the depth, but the increase does not follow the same law over the whole earth, being twice or three times as much in one country as in another, and these differences are not in constant relation either with the latitudes or longitudes of places. He is of opinion, however, that the increase would not be overstated at one degree centigrade for every 25 meters or about one degree Fahrenheit for every 45 feet. The experimental well bored at Grinnell near Paris gave about one degree Fahrenheit for every 60 English feet when they had reached a depth of 1,312 feet. Some writers have endeavored to refer to these phenomena, which, however discordant as to the ratio of increasing heat, appear all to point one way, to the condensation of air constantly descending from the surface into the mines for the air under pressure would give out latent heat on the same principle as it becomes colder where rarefied in the higher regions of the atmosphere. But, besides that the quantity of heat is greater than could be supposed to flow from this source, the argument has been answered in a satisfactory manner by Mr. Fox, who has shown that in the mines of Cornwall the ascending have generally a higher temperature than the descending aerial currents. The difference between them was found to vary from 9 degrees to 17 degrees Fahrenheit, a proof that, instead of imparting heat, these currents actually carry off a large quantity from the mines. If we adopt M. Cordia's estimate of 1 degree Fahrenheit for every 45 feet of depth as the mean result, and assume, with the advocates of central fluidity, that the increasing temperature is continued downwards, we should reach the ordinary boiling point of water at about 2 miles below the surface, and at a depth of about 24 miles should arrive at the melting point of iron, a heat sufficient to fuse almost every known substance. The temperature of melted iron was estimated at 21,000 degrees Fahrenheit by Wedgwood, but his pyrometer gives, as is now demonstrated, very erroneous results. Professor Daniel ascertained that the point of fusion is 2,786 degrees Fahrenheit. According to Mr. Daniel's scale, we ought to encounter the internal melted matter before penetrating through a thickness represented by that of the outer circular line in the annex diagram, Figure 92. Whereas, if the other or less correct scale be adopted, we should meet with it at some point between the two circles, the space between them, together with the lines themselves, representing a crust of 200 miles in depth. 
In either case, we must be prepared to maintain that a temperature many times greater than that sufficient to melt the most refractory substances known to us is sustained at the center of the globe, while a comparatively thin crust resting upon the fluid remains unmelted, or is even, according to M. Cordier, increasing in thickness by the continual addition of new internal layers solidified during the process of refrigeration. The mathematical calculations of Fourier on the passage of heat through conducting bodies have been since appealed to in support of these views, for he has shown that it is compatible with theory that the present temperature of the surface might coexist with an intense heat at a certain depth below. But his reasoning seems to be confined to the conduction of heat through solid bodies, and the conditions of the problem are wholly altered when we reason about a fluid nucleus, as we must do if it be assumed that the heat augments from the surface to the interior according to the rate observed in mines. For when the heat of the lower portion of a fluid is increased, a circulation begins throughout the mass by the ascent of hotter and the descent of colder currents. And this circulation, which is quite distinct from the mode in which heat is propagated through solid bodies, must evidently occur in the supposed central ocean if the laws of fluid and of heat are the same there as upon the surface. In Mr. Daniel's experiments for obtaining a measure of the heat of bodies at their point of fusion, he invariably found that it was impossible to raise the heat of a large crucible of melted iron, gold, or silver a single degree beyond the melting point, so long as a bar of the respective metals was kept immersed in the fluid portions. So in regard to other substances, however great the quantities fused, their temperature could not be raised while any solid pieces immersed in them remained unmelted, every accession of heat being instantly absorbed during their liquefaction. These results are, in fact, no more than the extension of a principle previously established, that so long as a fragment of ice remains in water, we cannot raise the temperature of the water above 32 degrees Fahrenheit. If, then, the heat of the Earth's center amount to 450 degrees Fahrenheit, as M. Cordier deems highly probable, that is to say, about 20 times the heat of melted iron, even according to Wedgwood's scale, and upwards of 160 times according to the improved pyrometer, it is clear that the upper parts of the fluid mass could not long have a temperature only just sufficient to melt rocks. There must be a continual tendency towards a uniform heat, and until this were accomplished, by the interchange of portions of fluid of different densities, the surface could not begin to consolidate. Nor, on the hypothesis of primitive fluidity, can we conceive any crust to have been formed until the whole planet had cooled down to about the temperature of incipient fusion. It cannot be objected that hydrostatic pressure would prevent a tendency to equalization of temperature, for, as far as observations have yet been made, it is found that the waters of deep lakes and seas are governed by the same laws as a shallow pool, and no experiments indicate that solids resist fusion under high pressure. The arguments indeed, now controverted, always proceed on the admission that the internal nucleus is in a state of fusion. It may be said that we may stand upon the hardened surface of a lava current while it is still in motion, nay, may descend into the crater of Vesuvius after an eruption and stand on the scoriae while every crevice shows that the rock is red hot two or three feet below us, and at a somewhat greater depth all is, perhaps, in a state of fusion. May not, then, a much more intense heat be expected at the depth of several hundred yards or miles? The answer is that until a great quantity of heat has been given off, either by the emission of lava or in a latent form by the evolution of steam and gas, the melted matter continues to boil in the crater of a volcano. But ebullition ceases when there is no longer a sufficient supply of heat from below. And then a crust of lava may form on the top and showers of scoria may then descend upon the surface and remain unmelted. If the internal heat be raised again, ebullition will recommence and soon fuse the superficial crust. So, in the case of the moving current, we may safely assume that no part of the liquid beneath the hardened surface is much above the temperature sufficient to retain it in a state of fluidity. It may assist us in forming a clearer view of the doctrine now controverted if we consider what would happen were a globe of homogeneous composition placed under circumstances analogous in regard to the distribution of heat to those above stated. If the whole planet, for example, were composed of water covered with a spheroidal crust of ice 50 miles thick 
and with an interior ocean having a central heat about 200 times that of the melting point of ice, or 6,400 degrees Fahrenheit, and if, between the surface and the center, there was every intermediate degree of temperature between that of melting ice and that of the central nucleus, could such a state of things last for a moment? If it must be conceded, in this case, that the whole spheroid would be instantly in a state of violent ebullition, that the ice, instead of being strengthened annually by new internal layers, would soon melt and form part of an atmosphere of steam, on what principle can it be maintained that analogous effects would not follow in regard to the Earth under the conditions assumed in the theory of central heat? M. Cordier admits that there must be tides in the internal melted ocean. But their effect, he says, has become feeble, although originally, when the fluidity of the globe was perfect, the rise and fall of these ancient land tides could not have been less than from 13 to 16 feet. Now, granting for a moment that these tides have become so feeble as to be incapable of causing the fissured shell of the earth to be first uplifted and then depressed every six hours, still may we not ask whether, during eruptions, the lava, which is supposed to communicate with a great central ocean, would not rise and fall sensibly in a crater such as Stromboli, where there is always melted matter in a state of ebullition? Whether chemical changes may produce volcanic heat. Having now explained the reasons which have induced me to question the hypothesis of central heat as the primary source of volcanic action, it remains to consider what has been termed the chemical theory of volcanoes. It is well known that many, perhaps all, of the substances of which the Earth is composed are continually undergoing chemical changes. To what depth these processes may be continued downwards must, in a great degree, be matter of conjecture. But there is no reason to suspect that, if we could descend to a great distance from the surface, we should find elementary substances differing essentially from those with which we are acquainted. All the solid, fluid, and gaseous bodies known to us consist of a very small number of these elementary substances variously combined. The total number of elements at present known is less than 60, and not half of these enter into the composition of the more abundant and organic productions. Some portions of such compounds are daily undergoing decomposition, and their constituent parts being set free are passing into new combinations. These processes are by no means confined to minerals at the Earth's surface and are very often accompanied by the evolution of heat, which is intense in proportion to the rapidity of the combinations. At the same time, there is a development of electricity. The spontaneous combustion of beds of bituminous shale and of refuse coal thrown out of mines is generally due to the decomposition of pyrites, and it is the contact of air and water which brings about the change. Heat results from the oxidation of the sulfur and iron, though on what principle heat is generated when two or more bodies having a strong affinity for each other unite suddenly is wholly unexplained. Electricity as a source of volcanic heat. It has already been stated that chemical changes develop electricity which, in its turn, becomes a powerful disturbing cause. As a chemical agent, says Davy, its silent and slow operation in the economy of nature is much more important than its grand and impressive operation in lightning and thunder. It may be considered not only as directly producing an infinite variety of changes, but as influencing almost all which take place. It would seem, indeed, that chemical attraction itself is only a peculiar form of the exhibition of electrical attraction. Now that it has been demonstrated that magnetism and electricity are always associated and are perhaps only different conditions of the same power, the phenomena of terrestrial magnetism have become of no ordinary interest to the geologist. Soon after the first great discoveries of Ostert and electromagnetism, Ampere suggested that all the phenomena of the magnetic needle might be explained by supposing currents of electricity to circulate constantly in the shell of the globe in directions parallel to the magnetic equator. This theory has acquired additional consistency the farther we have advanced in science, and according to the experiments of Mr. Fox on the electromagnetic properties of metalliferous veins, some trace of electric current seems to have been detected in the interior of the Earth. Some philosophers ascribe these currents to the chemical action going on in the superficial parts of the globe to which air and water have the readiest access, while others refer them, in part at least, to thermoelectricity excited by the solar rays on the surface of the Earth during its rotation. 
successive parts of the atmosphere, land, and sea being exposed to the influence of the sun and then cooled again in the night. That this idea is not a mere speculation is proved by the correspondence of the diurnal variations of the magnet with the apparent motion of the sun, and by the greater amount of variation in summer than in winter, and during the day than in the night. M. de la Rive, although conceding that such minor variations of the needle may be due to thermoelectricity, contends that the general phenomena of terrestrial magnetism must be attributed to currents far more intense, which, though liable to secular fluctuations, act with much greater constancy and regularity than the causes which produce the diurnal variations. The remark seems just. Yet it is difficult to assign limits to the accumulated influence even of a very feeble force constantly acting on the whole surface of the earth. The subject, however, must evidently remain obscure until we become acquainted with the causes which give a determinate direction to the supposed electric currents. Already, the experiments of Faraday on the rotation of magnets have led him to speculate on the manner in which the earth, when once it had become magnetic, might produce electric currents within itself, in consequence of its diurnal rotation. We have seen also in a former chapter, page 129, that the recent observations of Schwab, 1852, have led Colonel Sabine to the discovery of a connection between certain periodical changes which take place in the spots on the sun and a certain cycle of variations in terrestrial magnetism. These seem to point to the existence of a solar magnetic period and suggest the idea of the sun's magnetism exerting an influence on the mass of our planet. In regard to thermoelectricity, I may remark that it may be generated by great inequalities of temperature arising from a partial distribution of volcanic heat. Wherever, for example, masses of rock occur of great horizontal extent and of considerable depth, which are at one point in a state of fusion, as beneath some active volcano, at another red hot, and at a third comparatively cold, strong thermoelectric action may be excited. Some, perhaps, may object that this is reasoning in a circle, first to introduce electricity as one of the primary causes of volcanic heat, and then to derive the same heat from thermoelectric currents. But there must, in truth, be much reciprocal action between the agents now under consideration, and it is very difficult to decide which should be regarded as the prime mover, or to see where the train of changes once begun would terminate. Whether subterranean electric currents, if once excited, might sometimes possess the decomposing power of the voltaic pile is a question not perhaps easily answered in the present state of science. But such a power, if developed, would at once supply us with a never-failing source of chemical action from which volcanic heat might be derived. Recapitulation Before entering, in the next chapter, still farther into the inquiry, how far the phenomena of volcanoes and earthquakes accord with the hypothesis of a continued generation of heat by chemical action, it may be desirable to recapitulate in a few words the conclusions already obtained. First, the primary causes of the volcano and the earthquake are, to a great extent, the same, and must be connected with the passage of heat from the interior to the surface. Secondly, this heat has been referred, by many, to a supposed state of igneous fusion of the central parts of the planet when it was first created, of which a part still remains in the interior, but is always diminishing in intensity. Thirdly, the spheroidal figure of the Earth, adduced in support of this theory, does not of necessity imply a universal and simultaneous fluidity in the beginning. For supposing the original figure of our planet had been strictly spherical, which, however, is a gratuitous assumption resting on no established analogy. Still, the statical figure must have been assumed, if sufficient time be allowed, by the gradual operation of the centrifugal force, acting on the materials brought successively within its action by aqueous and igneous causes. Fourthly, it appears, from experiment, that the heat in mines increases progressively with their depth, and if the ratio of increase be continued uniformly from the surface to the interior, the whole globe, with the exception of a small external shell, must be fluid, and the central parts must have a temperature many times higher than that of melted iron. Fifthly, but the theory adopted by M. Cordier and others, which maintains the actual existence of such a state of things, seems wholly inconsistent with the laws which regulate the circulation of heat through fluid bodies. For, if the central heat were as intense as is represented, there must be a circulation of currents, 
tending to equalize the temperature of the resulting fluids, and the solid crust itself would be melted. Sixthly, instead of an original central heat, we may, perhaps, refer the heat of the interior to chemical changes constantly going on in the Earth's crust. For the general effect of chemical combination is the evolution of heat and electricity, which in their turn become sources of new chemical changes. End of chapter 31. Recording by Lisa S. Ware. Chapter 32, Part 1 of Principles of Geology. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sycamore Rockwell. Principles of Geology by Charles Lyell. Causes of Earthquakes and Volcanoes. Continued. Review of the Proofs of Internal Heat. Theory of an Unoxidated Metallic Nucleus whether the decomposition of water may be a source of volcanic heat, geysers of Iceland, causes of earthquakes, wave-like motion, expansive power of liquid gases, connection between the state of the atmosphere and earthquakes, permanent upheaval and subsidence of land, expansion of rocks by heat, the balance of dry land how preserved, subsidence in excess, conclusion. When we reflect that the largest mountains are but insignificant protuberances upon the surface of the earth, and that these mountains are nevertheless composed of different parts, which have been formed in succession, we may well feel surprised that the central fluidity of the planet should have been called into account for volcanic phenomena. To suppose the entire globe to be in a state of igneous fusion, with the exception of a solid shell, no more than from 30 to 100 miles thick, and to imagine that the central heat of this fluid spheroid exceeds by more than 200 times that of liquid lava, is to introduce a force altogether disproportionate to the effects which it is required to explain. The ordinary repose of the surface implies, on the contrary, an inertness in the internal mass which is truly wonderful. When we consider the combustible nature of the elements of the earth, so far as they are known to us, the facility with which their compounds may be decomposed and made to enter into new combinations, the quality of the heat which they evolve during these processes, when we recollect the expansive power of steam, and that water itself is composed of two gases which, by their union, produce intense heat, when we call to mind the number of explosive and detonating compounds which have been already discovered, we may be allowed to share the astonishment of Pliny that a single day should pass without a general conflagration. Excedit profecto omnia miracula, ulum diem fuisse quo non cuncta conflagarent. The signs of internal heat observable on the surface of the earth do not necessarily indicate the permanent existence of subterranean heated masses, whether fluid or solid by any means so vast as our continents and seas. Yet, how insignificant would these appear if distributed through an external shell of the globe one or two hundred miles in depth? The principal facts in proof of the accumulation of heat below the surface may be summed up in a few words. Several volcanoes are constantly in eruption, as Tromboli and Nicaragua. Others are known to have been active for periods of sixty or even a hundred and fifty years as those of Sangay in Quito, Popocatepetl in Mexico, and the volcano of the Isle of Bourbon. Many craters emit hot vapors in the intervals between eruptions, and sulfur towers evolve incessantly the same gases as volcanoes. Steam of high temperatures has continued for more than 20 centuries to issue from stufas, as the Italians call them, Thermal springs abound not only in regions of earthquakes, but are found in almost all countries, however distant from active vents. And, lastly, the temperature in the mines of various parts of the world is found to increase in proportion as we descend. The diagram, figure 93, in the next page, may convey some idea of the proportion which our continents and the ocean bear to the radius of the earth. If all the land were about as high as the Himalaya mountains and the ocean everywhere as deep as the Pacific, the whole of both might be contained within a space expressed by the thickness of a line AB, 
and masses of nearly equal volume might be placed in the space marked by the line CD in the interior. Seas of lava, therefore, of the size of the Mediterranean or even the Atlantic, would be as nothing if distributed through such an outer shell of the globe as is represented by the shaded portion of the figure ABCD. If throughout that space we imagine electrochemical causes to be continually in operation, even of very feeble power, they might give rise to heat, which, if accumulated at certain points, might melt or render red-hot entire mountains, or sustain the temperature of stufas and hot springs for ages. Theory of an unoxidated metallic nucleus When Sir H. Davy first discovered the metallic basis of the Earth's and alkalis, he threw out the idea that those metals might abound in an unoxidated state in the subterranean regions to which water must occasionally penetrate. Whenever this happens, gaseous matter would be set free, the metals would combine with the oxygen of the water, and sufficient heat might be evolved to melt the surrounding rocks. This hypothesis, although afterwards abandoned by its author, was at first very favorably received both by the chemist and the geologist, for silica, alumina, lime, soda, and oxide of iron, substances of which lavas are principally composed, would all result from the contact of the inflammable metals alluded to with water. But whence this abundant store of unsaturated metals in the interior? It was assumed that, in the beginning of things, the nucleus of the earth was mainly composed of inflammable metals, and that oxidation went on with intense energy at first, till at length, when a superficial crust of oxides had been formed, the chemical action became more and more languid. This speculation, like all others respecting the primitive state of the Earth's nucleus, rests unavoidably on arbitrary assumptions. But we may fairly inquire whether any existing causes may have the power of deoxidating the earthly and alkaline compounds formed from time to time by the action of water upon the metallic bases. If so, and if the original crust or nucleus of the planet contained, distributed through it here and there, some partial stores of potassium, sodium, and other metallic bases, these might be oxidated and again deoxidated so as to sustain for ages a permanent chemical action. Yet, even then, we should be unable to explain why such a continuous circle of operations, after having been kept up for thousands of years in one district, should entirely cease and why another region, which had enjoyed a respite from volcanic action for one or many geological periods, should become a theatre for the development of subterranean heat. It is well known to chemists that the metallization of oxides, the most difficult to reduce, may be affected by hydrogen brought into contact with them at a red heat, and it is more than probable that the production of potassium itself in the common gun barrel process is due to the power of nascent hydrogen derived from the water which the hydrated oxide contains. According to the recent experiments, also of Faraday, it would appear that every case of metallic reduction by voltaic agency from saline solutions in which water is present is due to the secondary action of hydrogen upon the oxide, both of these being determined to the negative pole and then reacting upon one another. It is admitted that intense heat would be produced by the occasional contact of water with the metallic bases, and it is certain that, during the process of saturation, vast volumes of hydrogen must be evolved. The hydrogen thus generated might permeate the crust of the earth in different directions and become stored up for ages in fissures and caverns, sometimes in liquid form, under the necessary pressure. Whenever, at any subsequent period, in consequence of the changes affected by earthquakes in the shell of the earth, this gas happened to come in contact with metallic oxides at high temperature, the reduction of these oxides might be the result. No theory seems, at first, more startling than that which represents water as affording an inexhaustible supply of fuel to the volcanic fires, yet is it by no means visionary. It is a fact that must not be overlooked that while a great number of volcanoes are entirely submarine, the remainder occur for the most part in islands or marine tracts. There are a few exceptions, but some of these, observes Dr. Delbeni, are near island salt lakes, as in central Tartary, while others form part of a train of volcanoes, the extremities of which are near the sea. 
Sir H. Davy suggested that when the sea is distant, as in the case of some of the South African volcanoes, they may still be supplied with water from subterranean lakes, since, according to Humboldt, large quantities of fish are often thrown out during eruptions. Mr. Dana also, in his valuable and original observations of the volcanoes of the Sandwich Islands, reminds us of the prodigious volume of atmospheric water which must be absorbed into the interior of such large and lofty domes, composed as they are entirely of porous lava. To this source alone he refers to the production of the steam by which the melted matter is propelled upwards even to the summits of cones three miles in height. When treating of springs and overflowing wells, I have stated that porous rocks are percolated by fresh water to great depths, and that sea water probably penetrates in the same manner through the rocks which form the bed of the ocean. But besides this universal circulation in regions not far from the surface, it must be supposed that, wherever earthquakes prevail, much larger bodies of water will be forced by the pressure of the ocean into fissures at great depths, or swallowed up in chasms, in the same manner as on the land, towns, houses, cattle and trees are sometimes engulfed. It will be remembered that these chasms often close again after houses have fallen into them, and for the same reason, when water has penetrated to a mass of melted lava, the steam into which it is converted may often rush out at a different aperture from that by which the water entered. The gases, it is said, exhaled from volcanoes, together with the steam, are such as would result from the decomposition of salt water, and the fumes which escape from the Vesuvian lava have been observed to deposit common salt. The emission of free muriatic acid gas in great quantities is also thought by many to favour the theory of the decomposition of the salt contained in seawater. It has been objected, however, that Monsieur Bosango did not meet with this gas in his examination of the elastic fluids evolved from the volcanoes of equatorial America, which only gave out aqueous vapour in very large quantity, carbonic acid gas, sulphurous acid gas, and sometimes fumes of sulphur. In reply, Dr. Dalbeni has remarked that muratic acid may have ceased to be disengaged because that volcanic action has become languid in equatorial America and seawater may no longer obtain admission. Monsieur Gay Lussac, while he avows his opinion that the decomposition of water contributes largely to volcanic action, called attention nevertheless to the supposed fact that hydrogen had not been detected in a separate form among the gaseous products of volcanoes. Nor can it, he says, be present, for, in that case, it would be inflamed in the air by the red-hot stones thrown out during an eruption. Dr. Davy, in his account of Graham Island, says, I watched when the lightning was most vivid, and the eruption of the greatest degree of violence, to see if there was any inflammation occasioned by this natural electric spark, any indication of the presence of inflammable gas, but in vain. May not the hydrogen, Guy Lussac inquires, be combined with chlorine and produce muriatic acid? For this gas has been observed to be evolved from Vesuvius, and the chlorine may have been derived from sea salt, which was, in fact, extracted by simple washing from the Vesuvius lava in 1822, in the proportion of 9%. But it was answered that Sir H. Davy's experiments had shown that hydrogen is not combustible when mixed with muriatic acid gas, so that if muriatic gas was evolved in large quantities, the hydrogen might be present without inflammation. Monsieur Orbich, on the other hand, assures us that although it be true that vapour illuminated by incandescent lava has often been mistaken for flame, Yet he clearly detected in the eruption of Vesuvius in 1834 the flame of hydrogen. Monsieur Gay-Lussac, in the memoir just alluded to, expressed doubt as to the presence of sulfurous acid, but the abundant disengagement of this gas during eruptions has been since ascertained. And thus, all difficulty in regard to the general absence of hydrogen in an inflammable state is removed. For, as Dr. Daubeny suggests, the hydrogen of decomposed water may unite with sulphur to form sulphuretted hydrogen gas, and this gas will then be mingled with the sulphurous acid as it rises to the crater. It is shown by experiment that these gases mutually decompose each other when mixed where steam is present, the hydrogen of the one immediately uniting with the oxygen of the other to form water, 
while the excess of sulfurous acid alone escapes into the atmosphere. Sulfur is at the same time precipitated. This experiment is sufficient, but it may also be observed that the flame of hydrogen would rarely be visible during an eruption, as that gas, when inflamed in a pure state, burns with a very faint blue flame, which even in the night could hardly be perceptible by the side of red-hot and incandescent cinders. Its immediate conversion into water when inflamed in the atmosphere might also account for its not appearing in a separate form. Dr. Daubeny is of opinion that water containing atmospheric air may descend from the surface of the Earth to the volcanic fossae, and that the same process of combustion by which water is decomposed may deprive such subterranean air of its oxygen. In this manner, he explains the great quantities of nitrogen evolved from volcanic vents in thermal waters and the fact that air disengaged from the Earth in volcanic regions is either wholly or part deprived of oxygen. Sir H. Davy, in his memoir on the phenomena of volcanoes, remarks that there was every reason to suppose in Vesuvius the existence of a descending current of air, and he imagined that subterranean cavities which threw out large volumes of steam during the eruption might afterwards, in the quiet state of the volcano, become filled with atmospheric air. The presence of ammoniacal salts in volcanic emanations and of ammonia, which is in part composed of nitrogen, in lava, favours greatly the notion of air as well as water being deoxidated in the interior of the earth. It has been alleged by Professor Bischoff that the slight specific gravity of the metals of the alkalis is fatal to Davy's hypothesis. For if the mean density of the Earth, as determined by astronomers, surpass that of all kinds of rocks, these metals cannot exist, at least not in great quantities in the interior of the Earth. But Dr. Dalbeny has shown that if we take the united specific gravity of potassium, sodium, silicon, iron, and all the materials which, when united with oxygen, constitute ordinary lava, and then compare their weight with lava of equal bulk, the difference is not very material, the specific gravity of the lava only exceeding by about one-fourth that of the unoxidized metals. Besides, at great depths the metallic bases of the earths and alkalis may very probably be rendered heavier by pressure. Nor is it fair to embarrass the chemical theory of volcanoes with a doctrine so purely gratuitous as that which supposes the entire nucleus of the planet to have been at first composed of unoxidized metals. Professor Bunsen at Marburg, after analyzing the gases which escape from the volcanic fumaroles and sulfur towers of Iceland, and after calculating the quantity of hydrogen evolved between two eruptions, affirms, in contradiction of opinions previously entertained, that the hydrogen bears a perfect relation in quantity to the magnitude of the streams of lava, assuming the fusion of the last to have been the result of the heat evolved during the oxidation of alkaline and earthly metals, and this to have been brought about by the decomposition of water. Yet, after having thus succeeded in removing the principal objection once so triumphantly urged against Davy's hypothesis, Bunsen concludes by declaring that the hydrogen evolved in volcanic regions cannot have been generated by the decomposition of water coming in contact with alkaline and earthly metallic bases. For, says the professor, this process presupposes the prevalence of a temperature in which carbonic acid cannot exist in contact with hydrogen without suffering a partial reduction to carbon oxide, and not a trace of carbonic oxide is ever found in volcanic exhalations. At the same time, it will be seen by consulting the able memoirs of the Marburg chemist that he supposes many energetic kinds of chemical action to be continually going on in the interior of the Earth, capable of causing the disengagement of hydrogen, and there can be no doubt that this gas may be a source of innumerable new changes capable of producing the local development of internal heat. Cause of Volcanic Eruptions the most probable causes of a volcanic outburst at the surface have been in a great degree anticipated in the preceding speculations on the liquefaction of rocks and the generation of gases. When a minute hole is bored in a tube filled with gas condensed into a liquid, the hole becomes instantly aeriform, or, as some writers have expressed it, flashes into vapor and often bursts the tube. Such an experiment may represent the mode in which gaseous matter may rush through a rent in the rocks. 
and continued to escape for days or weeks through a small orifice with an explosive power sufficient to reduce every substance which opposes its passage into small fragments or even dust. Lava may be propelled upwards at the same time and ejected in the form of scoriae. In some places where the fluid lava lies at the bottom of a deep fissure, communicating on one hand with the surface and on the other with a cavern in which a considerable body of vapour has been formed, there may be an efflux of lava, followed by the escape of gas. Eruptions often commence and close with the discharge of vapour, and when this is the case, the next outburst may be expected to take place by the same vent, for the concluding evolution of elastic fluids will keep open the duct and leave it unobstructed. The breaking out of lava from the side or base of a lofty cone, rather than from the summit, may be attributed to the hydrostatic pressure to which the flanks of the mountain are exposed when the column of lava has risen to a great height. Or if, before it has reached the top, there should happen to be any stoppage in the main duct, the upward pressure of the ascending column of gas and lava may burst a lateral opening. In the case, however, of Mount Lower in the Sandwich Islands, there appears to be a singular want of connection or sympathy between the eruptions of the central and the great lateral vent. The great volcanic cone alluded to rises to the height of 13,760 feet above the level of the sea, having a crater at its summit from which powerful streams of lava have flowed in recent times, and having another still larger crater called Kilauea on its southeastern slope, about 4,000 feet above the sea. This lateral cavity resembles a huge quarry cut in the mountain side, being about 1,000 feet deep when in its ordinary state. It is seven miles and a half in circuit, and scattered over its bottom at different levels are lakes and pools of lava, always in a state of ebullition. The liquid in one of these will sometimes sink 100 or 150 feet, while it is overflowing in another at a higher elevation, there being, it should seem, no communication between them. In like manner, lava overflows in the summit crater of Mount Lower, nearly 14,000 feet high, while the great lateral cauldron just alluded to, of Kilauea, continues as tranquil as usual, affording no relief to any part of the gases or melted matter which are forcing their way upwards in the centre of the mountain. How, asks Dr. Dana, if there were any subterranean channel connecting the two great vents, could this want of sympathy exist? How, according to the laws of hydrostatic pressure, can a column of fluid stand 10,000 feet higher in one leg of the siphon than in the other? The eruptions, he observes, are not proxismal. On the contrary, the lava rises slowly and gradually to the summit on the lofty cone, and then escapes there without any commotion manifesting itself in Kilauea, a gulf always open on the flanks of the same mountain. On conclusion, he says, is certain, namely that volcanoes are no safety valves as they have been called, for here two independent and apparently isolated centres of volcanic activity, only 16 miles distant from each other, are sustained in one and the same cone. Without pretending to solve this enigma, I cannot refrain from remarking that the supposed independence of several orifices of eruption in one crater like Kilauea when adduced in confirmation of the doctrine of two distinct sources of volcanic action underneath one mountain, proves too much. No one can doubt that the pools of lava in Kilauea have been derived from some common reservoir and have resulted from a combination of causes commonly called volcanic, which are at work in the interior at some unknown distance below. These causes have given rise in Mount Lower to eruptions from many points, but principally from one centre, so that a vast dome of ejected matter has been piled up. The subsidiary crater has evidently never given much relief to the imprisoned, heated and liquefied matter, for Kalawea does not form a lateral protuberance interfering with the general shape or uniform outline of Mount Lower. End of chapter 32, part 1. Recording by Sycamore Rockwell. Chapter 32, Part 2 of Principles of Geology. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sycamore Rockwell. Principles of Geology by Charles Lyell. Geysers of Iceland. As aqueous vapor constitutes the most abundant of the aeriform products of volcanoes in eruption, 
it may be well to consider attentively a case in which steam is exclusively the moving power, that of the geysers of Iceland. These intermittent hot springs occur in a district situated in the southwestern division of Iceland, where nearly 100 of them are said to break out within a circle of two miles. That the water is of atmospheric origin, derived from rain and melted snow, is proved, says Professor Bunsen, by the nitrogen which rises from them either pure or mixed with other gases. The springs rise through a thick current of lava, which may perhaps have flowed from Mount Hecla, the summit of that volcano being seen from the spot at the distance of more than 30 miles. In this district, the rushing of water is sometimes heard in chasms beneath the surface, for here, as on Etna, rivers flow in subterranean channels through the porous and cavernous lavas. It has more than once happened, after earthquakes, that some of the boiling fountains have increased or diminished in violence and volume, or entirely ceased, or that new ones have made their appearance. Changes which may be explained by the opening of new rents and the closing of pre-existing fissures. Few of the geysers play longer than five or six minutes at a time, although sometimes half an hour. The intervals between their eruptions are for the most part very irregular. The great geyser rises out of a spacious basin at the summit of a circular mound, composed of siliceous incrustations deposited from the spray of its waters. The diameter of this basin, in one direction, is 56 feet, and 46 in another. In the center is a pipe 78 feet in perpendicular depth, and from 8 to 10 feet in diameter, but gradually widening as it rises into the basin. The inside of the basin is whitish, consisting of a siliceous crust and perfectly smooth, as are likewise two small channels on the sides of the mound, down which the water escapes when the bowel is filled to the margin. The circular basin is sometimes empty, as represented in the following sketch, but is usually filled with beautifully transparent water in the state of ebullition. During the rise of the boiling water in the pipe, especially when the ebullition is most violent and when the water is thrown up in jets, subterranean noises are heard, like the distant firing of a cannon, and the earth is slightly shaken. The sound then increases and the motion becomes more violent, till at length a column of water is thrown up, with loud explosions to the height of one or two hundred feet. After playing for a time like an artificial fountain, and giving off great clouds of vapour, the pipe or tube is emptied, and a column of steam rushing up with amazing force and a thundering noise terminates the eruption. If stones are thrown into the crater, they are instantly ejected, and such is the explosive force that very hard rocks are sometimes shivered into small pieces. Henderson found that by throwing a great quantity of large stones into the pipe of Stoker, one of the geysers, he could bring on an eruption in a few minutes. The fragments of stone, as well as the boiling water, were thrown in that case to a much greater height than usual. After the water had been ejected, a column of steam continued to rush up with a deafening roar for nearly an hour, but the geyser, as if exhausted by this effort, did not send out a fresh eruption when its usual interval of rest had elapsed. The account given by Sir George Mackenzie of a geyser which he saw in eruption in 1810 agrees perfectly with the above description by Henderson. The steam and water rose for half an hour to the height of 70 feet, and the white column remained perpendicular, notwithstanding a brisk gale of wind which was blowing against it. Stones thrown into the pipe were projected to a greater height than the water. To leeward of the vapour, a heavy shower of rain was seen to fall. Among the different theories proposed to account for these phenomena, I shall first mention one suggested by Sir J. Herschel. An imitation of these jets, he says, may be produced on a small scale by heating red-hot the stem of a tobacco pipe, filling the bowl with water and so inclining the pipe as to let the water run through the stem. Its escape, instead of taking place in a continued stream, is then performed by a succession of violent explosions, at first of steam alone, then of water mixed with steam, and, as the pipe cools, almost wholly of water. At every such proxismal escape of the water, a portion is driven back, accompanied with steam, into the bowl. The intervals between the explosions depend on the heat, length, and inclination of the pipe, their continuance on its thickness and conducting power. The application of this experiment to the geysers merely requires that a subterranean stream flowing through the pores and crevices of lava, should suddenly reach a fissure in which the rock 
is red hot or nearly so. Steam would immediately be formed, which, rushing up the fissure, might force up water along with it to the surface, while at the same time, part of the steam might drive back the water of the supply for a certain distance towards its source. And when, after the space of some minutes, the steam was all condensed, the water would return and a repetition of the phenomena take place. There is, however, another mode of explaining the action of the geyser, perhaps more probable than the above described. Suppose water percolating from the surface of the Earth to penetrate into the subterranean cavity AD by the fissures FF, while at the same time, steam at an extremely high temperature, such as is commonly given out from the rents of lava currents during congelation, emanates from fissures C. A portion of the steam is at first condensed into water, while the temperature of the water is raised by the latent heat thus evolved, till, at last, the lower part of the cavity is filled with boiling water and the upper with steam under high pressure. The expansive force of the steam becomes, at length, so great that the water is forced up the fissure or pipe EB and runs over the rim of the basin. When the pressure is thus diminished, the steam in the upper part of the cavity A expands until the water D is driven into the pipe. And when this happens, the steam, being the lighter of the two fluids, rushes up through the water with great velocity. If the pipe be choked up artificially, even for a few minutes, a great increase of heat must take place, for it is prevented from escaping in a latent form in steam, so that the water is made to boil more violently, and this brings on an eruption. Professor Bunsen, before cited, adopts this theory to account for the play of the little geyser but says it will not explain the phenomena of the Great One. He considers this, like the others, to be a thermal spring, having a narrow funnel-shaped tube in the upper part of its course, where the walls of the channel have become coated with siliceous incrustations. At the mouth of this tube, the water has a temperature corresponding to the pressure of the atmosphere of about 212 degrees Fahrenheit, but at a certain depth below, it is much hotter. This the professor succeeded in proving by experiment. A thermometer suspended by a string in the pipe, rising to 266 degrees Fahrenheit, or no less than 48 degrees above the boiling point. After the column of water has been expelled, what remains in the basin and pipe is found to be much cooled. Previously to these experiments of Bunsen and Descloisacs, made in Iceland in 1846, it would scarcely have been supposed possible that the lower part of a free and open column of water could be raised so much in temperature without causing a circulation of ascending and descending currents, followed by an almost immediate equalization of heat. Such circulation is no doubt impeded greatly by the sides of the wall not being vertical and by numerous contractions of its diameter, but the phenomenon may be chiefly due to another cause. According to recent experiments on the cohesion of liquids by Mr. Donny of Ghent, it appears that, when water is freed from all admixture of air, its temperature can be raised, even under ordinary atmospheric pressure, to 275 degrees Fahrenheit. So much does the cohesion of its molecules increase when they are not separated by particles of air. As water long boiled becomes more and more deprived of air, it is probably very free from such intermixture at the bottom of the geysers. Among other results of the experiments of Bunsen and his companion, they convince themselves that the column of fluid filling the tube is constantly receiving accessions of hot water from below, while it becomes cooler above by evaporation on the broad surface of the basin. They also came to a conclusion of no small interest as bearing on the probable mechanism of ordinary volcanic eruptions, namely that the tube itself is the main seat of focus of mechanical force. This was proved by letting down stones suspended by strings to various depths. Those which were sunk to considerable distances from the surface were not cast up again, whereas those nearer to the mouth of the tube were ejected to great heights. Other experiments also were made, tending to demonstrate the singular fact that there is often scarce any motion below when a violent rush of steam and water is taking place above. It seems that when a lofty column of water possesses a temperature increasing with depth, any slight ebullition or disturbance of equilibrium in the upper portion may first force up water into the basin and then cause it to flow over the edge. A lower portion, thus suddenly relieved of part of its pressure, expands and is converted into vapor more rapidly than the first, 
owning to its greater heat. This allows the next subjacent stratum, which is much hotter, to rise and flash into a gaseous form, and this process goes on till the ebullition has descended from the middle to near the bottom of the funnel. In speculating, therefore, on the mechanism of an ordinary volcanic eruption, we may suppose that large subterranean cavities exist at the depth of some miles below the surface of the Earth, in which melted lava accumulates. And when water containing the usual mixture of air penetrates into these, the steam thus generated may press upon the lava and force it up the duct of a volcano, in the same manner as a column of water is driven up the pipe of a geyser. In other cases, we may suppose a continuous column of liquid lava mixed with red-hot water, for water may exist in that state, as Professor Bunsen reminds us, under pressure, and this column may have a temperature regularly increasing downwards. A disturbance of equilibrium may first bring on an eruption near the surface by the expansion and conversion into gas of entangled water and other constituents of what we call lava, so as to occasion a diminution of pressure. More steam would then be liberated, carrying up with it jets of melted rock, which being hurled up into the air may fall in showers of ashes on the surrounding country, and at length, by the arrival of lava and water more and more heated at the orifice of the duct or the crater of the volcano, expansive power may be acquired sufficient to expel a massive current of lava. After the eruption has ceased, a period of tranquility succeeds, during which fresh accessions of heat are communicated from below, and additional masses of rocks fused by degrees, while at the same time, atmospheric or seawater is descending from the surface. At length, the conditions required for a new outburst are obtained, and another cycle of similar changes is renewed. End of chapter 32, part 2. Recording by Sycamore Rockwell. Chapter 32, Part 3 of Principles of Geology. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sycamore Rockwell. www.voinovvoiceovers.com. Principles of Geology by Charles Lyell. Causes of Earthquakes and Volcanoes. Continued. Causes of Earthquakes. Wave like motion. I shall now proceed to examine the manner in which the heat of the interior may give rise to earthquakes. One of the most common phenomena attending subterranean movements is the undulatory motion of the ground, and this, says Mitchell, will seem less extraordinary if we can call to mind the extreme elasticity of the earth and the compressibility of even the most solid materials. Large districts, he suggests, may rest on fluid lava and when this is disturbed, its motions may be propagated through the incumbent rocks. He also adds the following igneous speculation. As a small quantity of vapor almost instantly generated at some considerable depth below the surface of the earth will produce a vibratory motion, so a very large quantity, whether it be generated almost instantly or in any small portion of time, will produce wave-like motion. The manner in which this wave-like motion will be propagated may in some measure be represented by the following experiment. Suppose a large cloth or carpet spread upon a floor to be raised at one edge, and then suddenly brought down again to the floor. The air under it, being by this means propelled, will pass along till it escapes at the opposite side, raising the cloth in a wave all the way as it goes. In like manner, a large quantity of vapor may be conceived to raise the earth in a wave as it passes along between the strata, which it may easily separate in a horizontal direction, there being little or no cohesion between one stratum and another. The part of the earth that is first raised being bent from its natural form will endeavor to restore itself by its elasticity, and the parts next to it being to have their weight supported by the vapor, which will insinuate itself under them, will be raised in their turn, till it either finds some vent, or is again condensed by the cold into water, and by that means prevented from proceeding any further. In a memoir published in 1843 on the structure of the Appalachian chain, by the professors Rogers, the following hypothesis is proposed as simpler and more in accordance with dynamical considerations and the recorded observations on earthquakes. In place, say they, of supposing it possible for a body of vapor or gaseous matter to pass horizontally between the strata, 
or even between the crust and the fluid lava upon which it floats, and with which it must be closely entangled, we are inclined to attribute the movement to an actual pulsation engendered in the molten matter itself by a linear disruption under enormous tension, giving vent explosively to elastic vapors escaping either to the surface or into cavernous spaces beneath. According to this supposition, the movement of the subterranean vapors would be towards and not from the disrupted belt, and the oscillation of the crust would originate in the tremendous and sudden disturbance of the previous pressure on the surface of the lava mass below, brought about by the instantaneous and violent rending of the overlaying strata. This theory requires us to admit that the crust of the Earth is so flexible that it can assume the form and follow the motion of an undulation in the fluid below. Even if we grant this, says Mr. Mallet, another more serious objection presents itself, namely the great velocity attributed to the transit of the wave in the subterranean sea of lava. We are called upon to admit that the speed of the wave below equals that of the true earthquake shock at the surface, which is so immense that it is not inferior to the velocity of sound in the same solids. But the undulation in the fluid below must follow the laws of a tidal wave, or of the great sea wave already spoken of. Its velocity, like that of the tidal wave of our seas, will be a function of its length and of the depth of the fluid, diminished in this case by certain considerations as to the density and degree of acidity of the liquid. And although it would be at present impossible, for want of data, to calculate the exact velocity with which this subterraneous lava wave could move, it may be certainly affirmed that its velocity would be immeasurably short of the observed or ethoric velocity of the great earth wave, or true shock, in earthquakes. Liquid gases. The rending and upheaving of continental masses are operations which are not difficult to explain. When we are once convinced that heat of sufficient power, not only to melt but to reduce to a gaseous form a great variety of substances, is accumulated in certain parts of the interior. We see that elastic fluids are capable of projecting solid masses to immense heights in the air, and the volcano of Cotopaxi has been known to throw out, to the distance of 8 or 9 miles, a mass of rock about 100 cubic yards in volume. When we observe these aeriform fluids rushing out from particular vents for months or even years, continuously, what power may we expect them to exert in other places where they happen to be confined under an enormous weight of rock? The experiments of Faraday and others have shown within the last 12 years that many of these gases, including all those which are most copiously disengaged from volcanic vents, as the carbonic, sulfurous and muriatic acids, may be condensed into liquids by pressure. At temperatures of from 30 to 50 degrees Fahrenheit, the pressure required for this purpose varies from 15 to 50 atmospheres, and this amount of pressure we may regard as very insignificant in the operations of nature. A column of Vesuvian lava that would reach from the lip of the crater to the level of the sea must be equal to about 300 atmospheres, so that at depths which may be termed moderate in the interior of the crust of the Earth, the gases may be condensed into liquids even at very high temperatures. The method employed to reduce some of these gases to a liquid state is to confine the materials from the mutual action of which they are evolved in tubes hermetically sealed so that the accumulated pressure of the vapor as it rises and expands may force some part of it to assume the liquid state. A similar process may, and indeed must, frequently take place in subterranean caverns and fissures, or even in the pores and cells of many rocks, by which means a much greater store of expansive power may be packed into a small space than could happen if these vapors had not the property of becoming liquid. For although the gas occupies much less room in a liquid state, yet it exerts exactly the same pressure upon the sides of the containing cavity as if it remained in the form of vapor. If a tube, whether of glass or other materials filled with condensed gas, have its temperature slightly raised, it will often burst, for a slight increment of the heat causes the elasticity of the gas to increase in a very high ratio. We have only to suppose certain rocks permeated by these liquid gases, as porous strata are sometimes filled with water, to have their temperature raised some hundred degrees, and we obtain a power capable of lifting superincumbent masses of almost any conceivable thickness.
While if the depth at which the gas is confined be great, there is no reason to suppose that any other appearances would be witnessed by the inhabitants of the surface than vibratory movement and rents from which no vapor might escape. In making their way through fissures a very few miles only in length, or in forcing a passage through soft yielding strata, the vapors may be cooled and absorbed by water, for water has a strong affinity to several of the gases and will absorb large quantities with a very slight increase of volume. In this manner, the heat or the volume of springs may be augmented and their mineral properties made to vary. Connection between the state of the atmosphere and earthquakes. The inhabitants of Stromboli, who are mostly fishermen, are said to make use of that volcano as a weather glass, the eruptions being comparatively feeble when the sky is serene, but increasing in turbulence during tempestuous weather, so that in winter the island often seems to shake from its foundations. Mr. P. Scrope, after calling attention to these and other analogous facts, first started the idea, as long ago as the year 1825, that the diminished pressure of the atmosphere, the concomitant of stormy weather, may modify the intensity of the volcanic action. He suggests that where liquid lava communicates with the surface, as in the crater of Stromboli, it may rise or fall in the vent on the same principle as mercury in a barometer, because the ebullition or expansive power of the steam contained in the lava would be checked by every increase and augmented by every diminution of weight. In like manner, if a bed of liquid lava be confined at an immense depth below the surface, its expansive force may be counteracted partly by the weight of the incumbent rocks, and also in part by atmospheric pressure acting contemporaneously on a vast superficial area. In that case, if the upheaving force increase gradually in energy, it will at length be restrained by only the slightest degree of superiority in the antagonist or repressive power and then the equilibrium may be suddenly destroyed by any cause such as an ascending draught of air. In this manner, we may account for the remarkable coincidence so frequently observed between the state of the weather and subterranean commotions. Although it must be admitted that earthquakes and volcanic eruptions react in their turn upon the atmosphere, so that disturbances of the latter are generally the consequences rather than the forerunners of volcanic disturbances. From an elaborate catalogue of the earthquakes experienced in Europe and Syria during the last 15 centuries, Monsieur Alexis Perret has deduced the conclusion that the number which happen in the winter season preponderates over those which occur in any one of the other seasons of the year, there being, however, some exceptions to this rule, as in the Pyrenees. Curious and valuable as are these data, Monsieur de Archiac justly remarks, in commenting upon them, that they are not as yet sufficiently extensive or accordant in different regions to entitle us to deduce any general conclusions from them respecting the laws of subterranean movements throughout the globe. Permanent elevation and subsidence. It is easy to conceive that the shattered rocks may assume an arched form during a convulsion so that the country above may remain permanently upheaved. In other cases, gas may drive before it masses of liquid lava, which may thus be injected into newly opened fissures. The gas having then obtained more room by the forcing up of the incumbent rocks may remain at rest, while the lava congealing in the rent may afford a solid foundation for the newly raised district. Experiments have recently been made in America by Colonel Totten to ascertain the ratio according to which some of the stones commonly used in architecture expand with given increments of heat. It was found impossible in a country where the annual variation of temperature was more than 90 degrees Fahrenheit to make a coping of stones 5 feet in length in which the joints should fit so tightly as not to admit water between the stone and the cement. The annual contraction and expansion of the stones causing, at the junctions, small crevices, the width of which varied with the nature of the rock. It was ascertained that fine-grained granite expanded with 1 degrees Fahrenheit at the rate of 0.00004825, while crystalline marble 0.00005668 and red sandstone 0.00009532 or about twice as much as granite. 
Now, according to this law of expansion, a mass of sandstone a mile in thickness, which should have its temperature raised 200 degrees Fahrenheit, would lift a superimposed layer of rock to the height of 10 feet above its normal level. But suppose a part of the Earth's crust, 100 miles in thickness and equally expansive, to have its temperature raised 600 degrees or 800 degrees. This might produce an elevation of between 2 to 3,000 feet. The cooling off of the same mass might afterwards cause the overlaying rocks to sink down again and resume their original position. By such agency, we might explain the gradual rise of Scandinavia or the subsidence of Greenland if this last phenomenon should also be established as a fact on further inquiry. It is also possible that as the clay in Wedgwood's pyrometer contracts, by giving off its water and then by incipient vitrification, so large masses of argillaceous strata on the Earth's interior may shrink when subjected to heat and chemical changes and allow the incumbent rocks to subside gradually. Moreover, if we suppose that lava cooling slowly at great depths may be converted into various granitic rocks, we obtain another source of depression, for according to the experiments of Deville and the calculations of Bischoff, the contraction of granite when passing from a melted or plastic to a solid and crystalline state must be more than 10%. The sudden subsidence of land may also be occasioned by subterranean caverns giving way when gases are condensed or when they escape through newly formed crevices. The subtraction, moreover, of matter from certain parts of the interior by the flowing of lava and of mineral springs must, in the course of ages, cause vacuities below so that the undermined surface may at length fall in. The balance of dry land, how preserved. In the present state of our knowledge, we cannot pretend to estimate the average number of earthquakes which may happen in the course of a single year. As the area of the ocean is nearly three times that of the land, it is probable that about three submarine earthquakes may occur for one exclusively continental. And when we consider the great frequency of slight movements in certain districts, we can hardly suppose that a day, if indeed an hour, ever passes without one or more shocks being experienced in some part of the globe. We have also seen that in Sweden and other countries, changes in the relative level of sea and land may take place without commotion, and these perhaps produce the most important geographical and geological changes. For the position of land may be altered to a greater amount by an elevation or depression of one inch over a vast area than by the sinking of a more limited tract such as the forest of Aripau to the depth of many fathoms at once. It must be evident from the historical details above given that the force of subterranean movement, whether intermittent or continuous, whether with or without disturbance, does not operate at random, but is developed in certain regions only. And although the alterations produced during the time required for the occurrence of a few volcanic eruptions may be inconsiderable, we can hardly doubt that during the ages necessary for the formation of large volcanic cones composed of thousands of lava currents, shoals might be converted into lofty mountains and low lands into deep seas. In a former chapter, page 198, I have stated that aqueous and igneous agents may be regarded as antagonist forces. The aqueous laboring incessantly to reduce the inequalities of the Earth's surface to a level, while the igneous are equally active in renewing the unevenness of the surface. By some geologists, it has been thought that the leveling power of running water was opposed rather to the elevating force of earthquakes than to their action generally. This opinion is, however, untenable for the sinking down of the bed of the ocean is one of the means by which the gradual submersion of land is prevented. The depth of the sea cannot be increased at any one point without a universal fall of the waters, nor can any partial deposition of sediment occur without the displacement of a quantity of water of equal volume, which will raise the sea, though in an imperceptible degree, even to the antipodes. The preservation, therefore, of the dry land may sometimes be affected by the subsidence of part of the Earth's crust, that part, namely, which is covered by the ocean, and in like manner an upheaving movement must often tend to destroy land, for if it render the bed of the sea more shallow, it will displace a certain quantity of water and thus tend to submerge low tracts. Astronomers having proved, see above, page 129, 
that there has been no change in the diameter of the Earth during the last 2,000 years, we may assume it as probable that the dimensions of the planet remain uniform. If then we inquire in what manner the force of earthquakes must be regulated, in order to restore perpetually the inequalities of the surface which the leveling power of water tends to efface, it will be found that the amount of depression must exceed that of elevation. It would be otherwise if the action of volcanoes and mineral springs were suspended, for then the forcing outwards of the Earth's envelope ought to be no more than equal to its sinking in. To understand this proposition more clearly, it must be borne in mind that the deposits of rivers and currents probably add as much to the height of the lands which are rising as they take from those which have risen. Suppose a large river to bring down sediment to a part of the ocean 2,000 feet deep, and that the depth of this part is gradually reduced by the accumulation of sediment till only a shore remains, covered by water at high tides. If now an upheaving force should uplift this shoal to the height of 2,000 feet, the result would be a mountain 2,000 feet high. But had the movement raised the same part of the bottom of the sea before the sediment of the river had filled it up, then instead of changing a shoal into a mountain 2,000 feet high, it would only have converted a deep sea into a shoal. It appears then that the operations of the earthquake are often such as to cause the leveling power of water to counteract itself. And although the idea may appear paradoxical, we may be sure, whenever we find hills and mountains composed of stratified deposits, that such inequalities of the surface would have had no existence if water, at some former period, had not been labelling to reduce the earth's surface to one level. But besides the transfer of matter by running water from the continents to the ocean, there is a constant transportation from below upwards by mineral springs and volcanic vents. As mountain masses are, in the course of ages, created by a pouring forth of successive streams of lava, so stratified rocks of great extent originate from the deposition of carbonite of lime and other mineral ingredients with which springs are impregnated. The surface of the land, and portions of the bottom of the sea being thus raised, the external accessions due to these operations would cause the dimensions of the planet to enlarge continuously, if the amount of depression of the Earth's crust were no more than equal to the elevation. In order, therefore, that the mean diameter of the Earth should remain uniform, and the unevenness of the surface be preserved, it is necessary that the amount of subsidence should be in excess. And such a predominance of depression is far from improbable on mechanical principles, since every upheaving movement must be expected either to produce caverns in the mass below, or to cause some diminution of its density. Vacuities must also arise from the subtraction of the matter poured out from volcanoes and mineral springs, or from the contraction of argillaceous masses by subterranean heat. And the foundations having been thus weakened, the Earth's crust shaken and rent by reiterated convulsions must in course of time fall in. If we embrace these views, important geological consequences will follow, since if there be, upon the whole, more subsidence than elevation, the average depth to which former surfaces have sunk beneath their original level must exceed the height which ancient marine strata have attained above the sea. If, for example, marine strata, about the age of our chalk and greensand, have been lifted up in Europe to an extreme height of more than 11,000 feet, and a mean elevation of some hundreds, we may conclude that certain parts of the surface which existed when those strata were deposited have sunk to an extreme depth of more than 11,000 feet below their original level, and to a mean depth of more than a few hundreds. In regard to faults, also, we must infer, according to the hypothesis now proposed, that a greater number have arisen from the sinking down than from the elevation of rocks. To conclude, it seems to be rendered probable by the views above explained that the constant repair of the land and the subserviency of our planet to the support of terrestrial as well as aquatic species are secured by the elevating and depressing power of causes acting in the interior of the earth which, although so often the source of death and terror to the inhabitants of the globe, 
visiting in succession every zone and filling the earth with monuments of ruin and disorder, are nevertheless the agents of a conservative principle above all others, essential to the stability of the system. End of chapter 32, part 3. Recording by Sycamore Rockwell. www.voinovoiceovers.com Chapter 33 of Principles of Geology. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Principles of Geology by Charles Lyell. Book 3 Changes of the Organic World Now in Progress. Division of the Subject Examination of the Question Whether Species Have a Real Existence in Nature. Importance of this Question in Geology. Sketch of Lamarck's arguments in favor of the transmutation of species and his conjectures respecting the origin of existing animals and plants. His theory of the transformation of the orangutan into the human species. The last book, from chapters 14 to 33 inclusive, was occupied with the consideration of the changes brought about on the Earth's surface within the period of human observation by inorganic agents, such, for example, as rivers, marine currents, volcanoes, and earthquakes. But there is another class of phenomena relating to the organic world which have an equal claim on our attention if we desire to obtain possession of all the preparatory knowledge respecting the existing course of nature, which may be available in the interpretation of geological monuments. It appeared from our preliminary sketch of the progress of the science that the most lively interest was excited among its earlier cultivators by the discovery of the remains of animals and plants in the interior mounds frequently remote from the sea. Much controversy arose respecting the nature of these remains, the causes which may have brought them into so singular a position, and the want of a specific agreement between them and known animals and plants. To qualify ourselves to form just views on these curious questions, we must first study the present condition of the animate creation on the globe. This branch of our inquiry naturally divides itself into two parts. First, we may examine the vicissitudes to which species are subject. Secondly, the processes by which certain individuals of these species have occasionally become fossil. The first of these divisions will lead us, among other topics, to inquire, first, whether species have a real and permanent existence in nature, or whether they are capable, as some naturalists pretend, of being indefinitely modified in the course of a long series of generations. Secondly, whether, if species have a real existence, the individuals composing them have been derived originally from many similar stocks or each from one only, the descendants of which have spread themselves gradually from a particular point over the habitable lands and waters. Thirdly, how far the duration of each species of animal and plant is limited by its dependence on certain fluctuating and temporary conditions in the state of the animate and inanimate world. Fourthly, whether there be proofs of the successive extermination of species in the ordinary course of nature, and whether there be any reason for conjecturing that new animals and plants are created from time to time to supply their place. Whether species have a real existence in nature. Before we can advance a step in our proposed inquiry, we must be able to define precisely the meaning which we attach to the term species. This is even more necessary in geology than in the ordinary studies of the naturalist, for they who deny that such a thing as a species exists concede nevertheless that a botanist or a zoologist may reason as if the specific character were constant, because they confine their observations to a brief period of time, just as a geographer in constructing his maps from century to century, may proceed as if the apparent places of the fixed stars remain absolutely the same, and as if no alteration were brought about by the precession of the equinoxes. So, it is said, in the organic world, the stability of a species may be taken as absolute if we do not extend our views beyond the narrow period of human history. But let a sufficient number of centuries elapse to allow of important revolutions in climate, physical geography, and other circumstances and the characters, say they, of the descendants of common parents may deviate indefinitely from their original type. Now, if these doctrines be tenable, we are at once presented with a principle of incessant change in the organic world, and no degree of dissimilarity in the plants and animals which may formerly have existed, and are found fossil, would entitle us to conclude that they have not been the prototypes and progenitors of the species now living. Accordingly, Geoffrey St. Hilaire has declared his opinion that there has been an uninterrupted succession in the animal kingdom, effected by means of generation, from the earliest ages of the world up to the present day, and that the ancient animals whose remains have been preserved in the strata, however different, 
may nevertheless have been the ancestors of those now in being. This notion is not very generally received. We are not warranted in assuming the contrary, without fully explaining the data and reasoning by which it may be refuted. I shall begin by stating as concisely as possible all the facts and ingenious arguments by which the theory has been supported, and for this purpose I cannot do better than offer the reader a rapid sketch of Lamarck's statement of the proofs which he regards as confirmatory of the doctrine, and which he has derived partly from the works of his predecessors and in part from original investigations. His proofs and inferences will be best considered in the order in which they appear to have influenced his mind, and I shall then point out some of the results to which he was led while boldly following out his principles to their legitimate consequences. Lamarck's Arguments in Favor of the Transmutation of Species The name of species, observes Lamarck, has been usually applied to every collection of similar individuals produced by other individuals like themselves. This definition, he admits, is correct because every living individual bears a very close resemblance to those from which it springs. But this is not all which is usually implied by the term species, for the majority of naturalists agree with Linnaeus in supposing that all the individuals propagated from one stock have certain distinguishing characters in common, which will never vary, and which have remained the same since the creation of each species. In order to shake this opinion, Lamarck enters upon the following line of argument. The more we advance in the knowledge of the different organized bodies which cover the surface of the globe, the more our embarrassment increases, to determine what ought to be regarded as a species, and still more how to limit and distinguish genera. In proportions as our collections are enriched, we see almost every void filled up, and all our lines of separation effaced. We are reduced to arbitrary determinations, and are sometimes feigned to seize upon the slight differences of mere varieties, in order to form characters for what we choose to call a species and sometimes we are induced to pronounce individuals but slightly differing, and which others regard as true species to be varieties. The greater the abundance of natural objects assembled together, the more do we discover proofs that everything passes by insensible shades into something else, that even the more remarkable differences are evanescent, and that nature has, for the most part, left us nothing at our disposal for establishing distinctions, save trifling, and in some respects, pure our particularities. We find that many genera amongst animals and plants are of such an extent, in consequence of the number of species referred to them, that the study and determination of these last has become almost impracticable. When the species are arranged in a series, and placed near to each other with due regard to their natural affinities, they each differ in so minute a degree from the next adjoining that they almost melt into each other, and are in a manner confounded together. If we see isolated species, we may presume the absence of some more closely connected which have not yet been discovered. Already are there genera, and even entire orders, nay, whole classes, which present an approximation to the state of things here indicated. If, when species have been thus placed in a regular series, we select one, and then, making a leap over several intermediate ones, we take a second, at some distance from the first, that these two will, on comparison, be seen to be very dissimilar. And it is in this manner that every naturalist begins to study the objects which are at his own door. He then finds it an easy task to establish generic and specific distinctions, and it is only when his experience is enlarged, and when he has made himself master of the intermediate links, that his difficulties and ambiguities begin. But while we are thus compelled to resort to trifling and minute characters in our attempt to separate the species, we find a striking disparity between individuals which we know to have descended from a common stock. And these newly acquired peculiarities are regularly transmitted from one generation to another, constituting what are called races. From a great number of facts, continues the author, we learn that in proportion as the individuals of one of our species change their situation, climate, and manner of living, they change also, by little and little, the consistence and proportions of their parts, their form, their faculties, and even their organization, in such a manner that everything in them comes at last to participate in the mutations to which they have been exposed. Even in the same climate, a great difference of situation and exposure causes individuals to vary. But if these individuals continue to live and to be reproduced under the same difference of circumstances, distinctions are brought about in them which become in some degree essential to their existence. In a word, at the end of many successive generations, these individuals, which originally belonged to another species, are transformed into a new and distinct species. Thus, for example, if the seeds of a grass, or any other plant which grows naturally in a moist meadow, be accidentally transported, 
first to the slope of some neighboring hill where the soil although at a greater elevation is damp enough to allow the plant to live and if after having lived there and having been several times regenerated it reaches by degrees the drier and almost arid soil of a mountain declivity it will then if it succeeds in growing and perpetuates itself for a series of generations be so changed that botanists who meet with it will regard it as a particular species the unfavorable climate in this case deficiency of nourishment exposure to the winds and other causes give rise to a stunted and dwarfish race with some organ more developed than others and having proportions often quite peculiar what nature brings about in a great lapse of time we occasion suddenly by changing the circumstances in which a species has been accustomed to live all are aware that vegetables taken from their birthplace and cultivated in gardens undergo changes which render them no longer recognizable as the same plants many which were naturally hairy became smooth or nearly so a great number of such were creepers and trailed along the ground reared our stalks and grow erect others lose their thorns or asperities others again from the ligneous state which their stem possessed in hot climates where they were indigenous pass to the herbaceous and among them some which were perennials became mere annuals so well do botanists know the effects of such changes of circumstance that they are averse to describe species from garden specimens unless they are sure that they have been cultivated for a very short period it is not the cultivated wheat triticum savitum asks lamarck a vegetable brought by man into the state which we now see it let any one tell me in what country a similar plant grows wild unless where it has escaped from cultivated fields where do we find in nature our cabbages lettuces and other culinary vegetables in the state in which they appear in our gardens is it not the same in regard to a great quantity of animals which domesticity has changed or considerably modified our domestic fowls and pigeons are unlike any wild birds our domestic ducks and geese have lost the faculty of raising themselves into the higher regions of the air and crossing extensive countries in their flight like the wild ducks and wild geese for which they were originally derived a bird which we breed in a cage cannot when restored to liberty fly like others of the same species which have always been free this small alteration of circumstances however has only diminished the power of flight without modifying the form of any part of the wings but when individuals of the same race are retained in captivity during a considerable length of time the form even of their parts is gradually made to differ especially of climate nourishment and other circumstances be also altered the numerous races of dogs which we have produced by domesticity are nowhere to be found in a wild state in nature we should seek for vain and mastiffs harriers spaniels greyhounds and other races between which the differences are sometimes so great that they would be readily admitted as specific between wild animals yet all these have sprung originally from a single race a first approaching very near to a wolf if indeed the wolf be not the true type which at some period or other was domesticated by man although important changes in the nature of the places which they inhabit modify the organization of animals as well as vegetables yet the former says lamarck require more time to complete a considerable degree of transmutation and consequently we are less sensible of such occurrences next to a diversity of the medium in which animals or plants may live the circumstances which have most influence in modifying their organs are differences in exposure climate the nature of the soil and other local particulars these circumstances are as varied as are the characters of the species and like them pass by insensible shades into each other there being every intermediate gradation between the opposite extremes but each locality remains for a very long time the same and is altered so slowly that we can only become conscious of the reality of the change by consulting geological monuments by which we learn that the order of things which how reigns in place has not always prevailed and by inference anticipate that it will not always continue the same every considerable alteration in the local circumstances in which each race of animals exists causes a change in their wants and these new wants excite them to new actions and habits these actions acquire the more frequent employment of some parts before but slightly exercised and then greater development follows as a consequence of their more frequent use other organs no longer in use are impoverished and diminished in size nay are sometimes entirely annihilated while in their place new parts are insensibly produced for the discharge of new functions i must here interrupt the author's argument by observing that no positive fact is cited to exemplify the substitution of some entirely new sense faculty or organ in the room of some other suppressed as useless 
all the instances adduced go only to prove that the dimensions and strength of members and the perfection of certain attributes may in a long succession of generations be lessened and enfeebled by disuse or on the contrary be matured and augmented by active exertion just as we know that the power of scent is feeble in the greyhound while its swiftness of pace and acuteness of sight are remarkable that the harrier and stag bound on the contrary are comparatively slow in their movements but excel in the sense of smelling it was necessary to point out to the reader this important chasm in the chain of evidence because he might otherwise imagine that i had merely omitted the illustrations for the sake of brevity but the plain truth is that there were no examples to be found and when lamarck talks of the efforts of internal sentiment the influence of subtle fluids and acts of organization as causes whereby animals and plants may acquire new organs he substitutes name for things and with a disregard to the strict rules of induction resorts to fictions as ideal as the plastic virtue and other phantoms of the geologists of the middle ages it is evident that if some well authenticated facts could have been induced to establish one complete step in the process of transformation such as the appearance and in individuals descending from a common stock of a sense or organ entirely new and a complete disappearance of some other enjoyed by their progenitors time alone might then be supposed sufficient to bring about any amount of metamorphosis the gratuitous assumption therefore of a point so vital to the theory of transmutation was unpardonable on the part of its advocate but to proceed with the system it is being assumed as an undoubted fact that a change of external circumstances may cause one organ to become entirely obsolete and a new one to be developed such as never before belonged to the species the following proposition is announced which however staggering and absurd it may seem is logically deduced from the assumed premises it is not the organs or in any other words the nature and form of the parts of the body of an animal which have given rise to its habits and its particular faculties but on the contrary its habits its manner of living and those of its progenitors have in the course of time determined the form of the body the number and condition of its organs in short the faculties which it enjoys thus otters beavers waterfowl turtles and frogs were not made to be web-footed in order that they might swim but their wants having attracted them to the water in search of prey they stretched out the toes of their feet to strike the water and move rapidly along its surface by the repeated stretching of their toes the skin which united them at the base acquired a habit of extension until in the course of time the broad membranes which now connect their extremities were formed in like manner the antelope and the gazelle were not endowed with light agile forms in order that they might escape by flight from carnivorous animals but having been exposed to the danger of being devoured by lions tigers and other beasts of prey they were compelled to exert themselves in running with great celerity a habit which in the course of many generations gave rise to the peculiar slenderness of their legs and the agility and elegance of their forms the camelopard was not gifted with a long flexible neck because it was destined to live in the interior of africa where the soil was arid and devoid of herbage but being reduced by the nature of that country to support itself on the foliage of lofty trees it contracted a habit of stretching itself up to reach the high boughs until its neck became so elongated that it could raise its head to the height of twenty feet above the ground another line of argument is then entered upon in farther corroboration of the instability of species in order it is said that individuals should perpetuate themselves unaltered by generation those belonging to one species ought never to ally themselves to those of another but such sexual unions do take place both among plants and animals and although the offspring of such irregular connections are usually sterile yet such is not always the case hybrids have sometimes proved prolific where the disparity between the species was not too great and by this means alone says lamarck varieties may gradually be created by near alliances which would become races and in the course of time would constitute what we term species but if the soundness of all these arguments and inferences be admitted we are next to inquire what were the original types of form organization and instinct from which the diversities of character as now exhibited by animals and plants have been derived we know that individuals which are mere varieties of the same species would if their pedigree to be traced back far enough terminate in a single stock so according to the train of reasoning before described the species of a genus and even the genera of a great family must have had a common point of departure what then was the single stem from which so many varieties of form have ramified were there many of these or are we to refer to the origin of the whole animate creation as the egyptian priest did of that universe to a single egg 
In the absence of any positive data for framing a theory on so obscure a subject, the following considerations were deemed of importance to guide conjecture. In the first place, if we examine the whole series of known animals, from one extremity to the other, when they are arranged in the order of their natural relations, we find that we may pass progressively, or, at least, with very few interruptions, from beings of more simple to those of a more compound structure, and, in proportion as the complexity of their organization increases, the number and dignity of their faculties increase also. Among plants, a similar approximation to a graduated scale of being is apparent. Secondly, it appears, from geological observations, that plants and animals of more simple organization existed on the globe before the appearance of those of more compound structure, and the latter were successively formed at more modern periods, each new race being more fully developed than the most perfect of the preceding era. Of the truth of the last-mentioned geological theory, Lamarck seemed to have been fully persuaded, and he also shows that he was deeply impressed with a belief prevalent among the older naturalists that the primeval ocean invested the whole planet long after it became the habitation of living beings. And thus he was inclined to assert the priority of the types of marine animals to those of the terrestrial, so as to fancy, for example, that the testacea of the ocean existed first, until some of them, by gradual evolution, were improved into those inhabiting the land. These speculative views had already been, in a great degree, anticipated by de Malier and his Teleomid, and by several modern writers so that the tables were completely turned on the philosophers of antiquity, with whom it was a received maxim, that created things were always most perfect when they came first from the hands of their maker, and that there was a tendency to progressive deterioration in sublunary things when left to themselves. Omnia fatis in peus ruere, ac retro sub lapsa referi. So deeply was the faith of the ancient schools of philosophy imbued with this doctrine, that, to check this universal proneness to degeneracy, nothing less than the re-intervention of the deity was thought adequate, and it was held that thereby the order, excellence, and pristine energy of the moral and physical world had been repeatedly restored. But when the possibility of the indefinite modification of individuals descending from common parents was once assumed, as also the geological inference respecting the progressive development of organic life, it was natural that the ancient dogma should be rejected or rather reversed, and that the most simple and imperfect forms and faculties should be conceived to have been the originals whence all others were developed. Accordingly, in conformity to these views, inert matter was supposed to have been first endowed with life, until, in the course of ages, sensation was superadded to mere vitality. Sight, hearing, and the other senses were afterwards acquired, then instinct and the mental faculties, until, finally, by virtue of the tendency of things to progressive improvement, the irrational was developed in the rational. The reader, however, will immediately perceive that when all the higher orders of plants and animals were thus supposed to be comparatively modern, and to have been derived in a long series of generations from those of more simple conformation, some farther hypotheses become indispensable in order to explain why, after an indefinite lapse of ages, there were so many beings of the simplest structure. Why have the majority of existing creatures remained stationary throughout this long succession of epochs, while others have made such prodigious advances? Why are there such multitudes of infusoria and polyps, or of confervae and other cryptogamic plants? Why, moreover, has the process of development acted with such unequal and irregular force on those classes of beings which have been greatly perfected, so that there are wide chasms in the series? gaps so enormous that Lamarck fairly admits that we can never expect to fill them up by future discoveries. The following hypothesis was provided to meet these objections. Nature, we are told, is not an intelligence, nor the deity, but a delegated power, a mere instrument, a piece of mechanism acting by necessity, an order of things constituted by the supreme being, and subject to laws which are the expressions of his will. This nature is obliged to proceed gradually in all her operations. She cannot produce animals and plants of all classes at once, but must always begin by the formation of the most simple kinds, and out of them elaborate the more compound, adding to them, successively, different systems of organs, and multiplying more and more their number and energy. This nature is daily engaged in the formation of the elementary rudiments of animal and vegetable existence, which correspond to what the ancients termed spontaneous generation. She is always beginning anew, day by day, the work of creation by forming monads, or rough draft, a box, which are the only living things she gives birth to directly. 
there are distinct primary rudiments of plants and animals, and probably of each of the great divisions of the animal and vegetable kingdoms. These are gradually developed into the higher and more perfect classes by the slow but unceasing agency of two influential principles. First, the tendency to progressive advancement in organization, accompanied by greater dignity in instinct, intelligence, etc. Secondly, the force of external circumstances, or variations in the physical condition of the earth, or the mutual relations of plants and animals. Four, as species spread themselves gradually over the globe, they are exposed from time to time to variations in climate, and the changes in the quantity and quality of their food. They meet with new plants and animals which assist or retard their development, by supplying them with nutriment or destroying their foes. The nature, also, of each locality is in itself fluctuating, so that, even if the relation of other plants and animals were invariable, the habits and organization of species would be modified by the influence of local revolutions. Now, if the first of these principles, the tendency to progressive development, were left to exert itself with perfect freedom, it would give rise, says Lamarck, in the course of ages, to a graduated scale of being, where the most insensible transition might be traced from the simplest to the most compound structure, from the humblest to the most exalted degree of intelligence. But, in consequence of the perpetual interference of the external causes before mentioned, this regular order is greatly interfered with, and an approximation only to such a state of things is exhibited by the animate creation, the progress of some races being retarded by unfavorable, and that of others accelerated by favorable, combinations of circumstances. Hence, all kinds of anomalies interrupt the continuity of the plan, and chasms, into which whole genera or families might be inserted, are seen to separate the nearest existing portions of the series. The Marx theory of the transformation of the orangutan into the human species. Such is the machinery of the Lamarckian system, but the reader will hardly, perhaps, be able to form a perfect conception of so complicated a piece of mechanism, unless it is exhibited in motion, so that we may see in what manner it can work out, under the author's guidance, all the extraordinary effects which we behold in the present state of the animate creation. I have only space for exhibiting a small part of the entire process by which a complete metamorphosis is achieved and shall therefore omit the mode by which, after a countless succession of generations, a small gelatinous body is transformed into an oak or an ape. Passing on at once to the last grand step on the progressive scheme, by which the orangutan, having been already evolved out of a monad, is made slowly to attain the attributes and dignity of man. One of the races of quadrumanous animals, which had reached the highest state of perfection, lost, by constraint of circumstances, Concerning the exact nature of which tradition is unfortunately silent, the habit of climbing trees, and of hanging on by grasping the boughs with their feet as with hands. The individuals of this race being obliged, for a long series of generations, to use their feet exclusively for walking, and ceasing to employ their hands as feet, were transformed into biminous animals, and what before were thumbs became mere toes, no separation being required when their feet were used solely for walking. Having acquired a habit of holding themselves upright, their legs and feet assumed, insensibly, the conformation fitted to support them in an erect attitude, till at last these animals could no longer go on all fours without much inconvenience. The Angola orang, Simia troglodytes Linnaeus, is the most perfect of animals, much more so than the Indian orang, Simia satyrus, which has been called the orangutan, although both are very inferior to man in corporeal powers and intelligence. These animals frequently hold themselves upright, but their organization has not yet been sufficiently modified to sustain them habitually in this attitude, so that the standing posture is very uneasy to them. When the Indian orang is compelled to take flight from pressing danger, he immediately falls down upon all fours, showing clearly that this was the original position of the animal. Even in man, whose organization, in the course of a long series of generations, has advanced so much farther, the upright posture is fatiguing, and can be supported only for a limited time, and by the aid of the contraction of many muscles. If the vertebral column formed the axis of the human body, and supported the head and all the other parts in equilibrium, then might the upper position be a state of repose. But, as the human head does not articulate in the center of gravity, as the chest, belly, and other parts press almost entirely forward with their whole weight, and as the vertebral column reposes upon an oblique base, a watchful activity is required to prevent the body from falling. Children who have large heads and prominent bellies can hardly walk at the end even of two years, 
and their frequent tumbles indicate the natural tendency in man to resume the quadrupedal state. Now, when so much progress has been made by the quadrumanous animals before mentioned, that they could hold themselves habitually in an erect attitude, and were accustomed to a wide range of vision, and ceased to use their jaws for fighting and tearing, or for clipping herbs for food, their snout became gradually shorter, their incisor teeth became vertical, and the facial angle grew more open. Among other ideas which the natural tendency to perfection engendered, the desire of ruling suggested itself, and this race succeeded at length in getting the better of the other animals, and made themselves master of all those spots on the surface of the globe which best suited them. They drove out the animals which approached nearest them in organization and intelligence, and which were in a condition to dispute with them the good things of this world, forcing them to take refuge in deserts, woods, and wildernesses, where their multiplication was checked, and the progressive development of their faculties retarded. While, in the meantime, the dominant race spread itself in every direction, and lived in large companies where new moths were successively created, exciting them to industry and gradually perfecting their means and faculties. In the supremacy and increased intelligence acquired by the ruling race, we see an illustration of the natural tendency of the organic world to grow more perfect, and, in their influence in repressing the advance of others, an example of one of those disturbing causes before enumerated, that force of external circumstances, which causes such wide chasms in the regular series of animated being. When the individuals of the dominant race become very numerous, their ideas greatly increased in number, and they felt the necessity of communicating them to each other, and of augmenting and varying the signs proper for the communication of ideas. Meanwhile, the inferior quadrumanous animals, although most of them were gregarious, acquired no new ideas, being persecuted and restless in the deserts, and obliged to fly and conceal themselves, so that they conceived no new wants. Such ideas as they already had remained unaltered, and they could dispense with the communication of the greater part of these. To make themselves, therefore, understood by their fellows, required merely a few movements of the body or limbs, whistling, and the uttering of certain cries varied by the inflections of the voice. On the contrary, the individuals of the ascendant race, animated with the desire of interchanging their ideas, which became more and more numerous, were prompted to multiply the means of communication, and were no longer satisfied with mere pantomimic signs nor even with all the possible inflections of the voice, but made continual efforts to acquire the power of uttering articulate sounds, employing a few at first, but afterwards varying and perfecting them according to the increase of their wants. The habitual exercise of their throat, tongue, and lips insensibly modified the conformation of these organs, until they became fitted for the faculty of speech. In effecting this mighty change, the exigencies of the individuals were the sole agents. They gave rise to efforts, and the organ proper for articulating sounds were developed by their habitual employment. Hence, in this peculiar race, the origin of the admirable faculty of speech. Hence also the diversity of languages, since the distances of places where the individuals composing the race established themselves soon favored the corruption of conventional signs. In conclusion, it may be proper to observe that the above sketch of the Lamarckian theory is no exaggerated picture, and those passages which have been probably excited the greatest surprise in the mind of the reader are literal translations from the original. End of chapter 33. Chapter 34, Part 1 of Principles of Geology. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Principles of Geology by Charles Lyell. Transmutation of Species. Continued. Recapitulation of the arguments in favor of the theory of transmutation of species, their insufficiency, causes of difficulty in discriminating species, some varieties possibly more distinct than certain individuals of distinct species, variability in a species consistent with the belief that the limits of the deviation are fixed, no facts of transmutation authenticated, varieties of the dog, the dog and wolf distinct species, mummies of various animals from Egypt identical in character with living animals, seeds and plants from the Egyptian tombs, modifications produced in plants by agriculture and gardening. The theory of the transmutation of species, considered in the last chapter, has met with some degree of favor from many naturalists, from their desire to dispense, as far as possible, with the repeated intervention of a first cause. As often as geological monuments attest the successive appearances of new races of animals and plants, and the extinction of those pre-existing. 
but, independently of a predisposition to account, if possible, for a series of changes in the organic world by the regular action of secondary causes, we have seen that in truth many perplexing difficulties present themselves to one who attempts to establish the nature and reality of the specific character. And if once there appears ground of reasonable doubt, in regard to the constancy of the species, the amount of transformation which they are capable of undergoing may seem to resolve itself into a mere question of the quantity of time, assigned to the past duration of animate existence. Before entering upon the reasons which may be adduced for rejecting Lamarck's hypothesis, I shall recapitulate in a few words the phenomena, and the whole train of thought, by which I conceive it to have been suggested, and which have gained for this and analogous theories, both in ancient and modern times, a considerable number of votaries. In the first place, the various groups into which plants and animals may be thrown seem almost invariably to a beginner to be so natural, that he is usually convinced at first, as was Linnaeus to the last, that genera are as much founded in nature as the species which compose them. When by examining the more numerous intermediate gradations the student finds all lines of demarcation to be in most instances obliterated, even when they at first appear most distinct, he grows more and more skeptical as to the real existence of genera, and finally regards them as mere arbitrary and artificial signs, invented, like those who serve to distinguish the heavenly constellations, for the convenience of classification, and having as little pretensions to reality. Doubts are then engendered in his mind as to whether species may not also be equally unreal. The student is probably first struck with a phenomenon that some individuals are made to deviate widely from the ordinary type by the force of such peculiar circumstances, and with the still more extraordinary fact that the newly acquired peculiarities are faithfully transmitted to the offspring. How far, he asks, may such variations extend in the course of indefinite periods of time, and during great vicissitudes in the physical condition of the globe. His growing incertitude is at first checked by the reflection that nature has forbidden the intermixture of the descendants of distinct original stocks, or has, at least, entailed sterility on their offspring, thereby preventing their being confounded together, and pointing out that a multitude of distinct types must have been created in the beginning, and must have remained pure and uncorrupted to this day. Relying on this general law, he endeavors to solve each difficult problem by direct experiment, until he is again astounded by the phenomenon of a prolific hybrid, and still more by an example of a hybrid perpetuating itself throughout several generations in the vegetable world. He then feels himself reduced to the dilemma of choosing between two alternatives, either to reject the test, or to declare that the two species, from the union of which the fruitful progeny has sprung, were mere varieties. If he prefer the latter, he is compelled to question the reality of the distinctness of all other supposed species which differ no more than the parents of such prolific hybrids. For although he may not be enabled immediately to procure, in all such instances, a fruitful offspring, yet experiments show that after repeated failures, the union of two recognized species may at last, under very favorable circumstances, give birth to a fertile progeny. Such circumstances, therefore, the naturalists may conceive to have occurred again and again, in the course of a great lapse of ages. His first opinions are now fairly unsettled, and every stay at which he has caught has given way one after another. He is in danger of falling into any new and visionary doctrine which may be presented to him, for he now regards every part of the animate creation as a void of stability and in a state of continual flux. In this mood he encounters the geologist, who relates to him how there have been endless vicissitudes in the shape and structure of organic beings in former ages, how the approach to the present system of things has been gradual, that there has been a progressive development of organization subservient to the purposes of life, from the most simple to the most complex state, that the appearance of man is the last phenomenon in a long succession of events, and, finally, that a series of physical revolutions can be traced in the inorganic world, coeval and coextensive with those of organic nature. These views seem immediately to confirm all his preconceived doubts as to the stability of the specific character, and he begins to think that there may exist an inseparable connection between a series of changes in the inanimate world, and the capability of the species to be indefinitely modified by the influence of external circumstances. Henceforth, the speculations know no definite bounds. He gives the rein to conjecture, and fancies that the outward form, internal structure, instinctive faculties, nay, that reason itself may have been gradually developed from some of the simplest states of existence. That all animals, that man himself, and the irrational beings, may have had one common origin, 
that all may be parts of one continuous and progressive scheme of development, from the most imperfect to the more complex. In fine, he renounces his belief in the high genealogy of his species, and looks forward, as if in compensation, to the future perfectibility of man in his physical, intellectual, and moral attributes. Let us now proceed to consider what is defective in evidence, and what fallacious in reasoning, in the grounds of these strange conclusions. Blumenbach judiciously observes that no general rule can be laid down for determining the distinctness of species, as there is no particular class of characters which can serve as criterion. In each case, we must be guided by analogy and probability. The multitude, in fact, and complexity of the proofs to be weighed is so great, we can only hope to obtain presumptive evidence, and we must, therefore, be the more careful to derive our general views as much as possible from those observations where the chances of deception are least. We must be on our guard not to tread in the footsteps of the naturalists of the Middle Ages, who believed the doctrine of spontaneous generation to be applicable to all those parts of the animal and vegetable kingdoms which they at least understood, in direct contradiction to the analogy of all the parts best known to them, and who, when at length they found that insects and cryptogamous plants were also propagated from eggs or seeds, still persisted in retaining their old prejudices respecting the infusory animalcules and other minute beings, the generation of which then had not been demonstrated by the microscope to be governed by the same laws. Lamarck has, indeed, attempted to raise an argument in favor of his system, out of the very confusion which has arisen in the study of some orders of animals and plants, in consequence of the slight shades of difference which separate the new species discovered within the last half-century. That is the embarrassment of those who attempt to classify and distinguish the new acquisitions, poured in such multitudes into our museums, should increase with the augmentation of their number, is quite natural. Since to obviate this, it is not enough that our powers of discrimination should keep pace with the increase of the objects, but we ought to possess greater opportunities of studying each animal and plant in all stages of its growth, and to know profoundly their history, their habits, and physiological characters throughout several generations. For, in proportion as a series of known animals grows more complete, none can doubt there is a near approximation to a graduated scale of being, and thus the most closely allied species will be found to possess a greater number of characters in common. Causes of the difficulty of discriminating species. But, in point of fact, our new acquisitions consist, more and more as we advance, of specimens brought from foreign and often very distant and barbarous countries. A large proportion have never even been seen alive by scientific inquirers. Instead of having specimens of the young, the adult, and the aged individual of each sex, and possessing means of investigating the anatomical structure, the peculiar habits, and the instincts of each, what is usually the state of our information? A single specimen, perhaps, of a dried plant, or a stuffed bird or a quadruped. A shell, without the soft parts of the animal, an insect in one stage of its numerous transformations. These are the scanty and imperfect data which the naturalist possesses. Such information may enable us to separate species which stand at a considerable distance from each other. We have no right to expect anything but difficulty and ambiguity if we attempt, from such imperfect opportunities, to obtain distinctive marks for defining the characters of species which are closely related. If Lamarck could introduce so much certainty and precision into the classification of several thousand species of recent and fossil shells, Notwithstanding the extreme remoteness of the organization of these animals from the type of those vertebrate species which are best known, and in the absence of so many of the living inhabitants of shells, we are led to form an exalted conception of the degree of exactness to which specific decisions are capable of being carried, rather than to call in question their reality. When our data are so defective, the most acute naturalist must expect to be sometimes at fault, and, like the novice, to overlook essential parts of difference passing unconsciously from one species to another, until, like one who is born along in a current, he is astonished on looking back at observing that he has reached a point so remote from that whence he set out. It is by no means improbable that, when the series of species of a certain genera is very full, they may be found to differ less widely from each other than do the mere varieties or races of certain species. If such a fact could be established, it would, undoubtedly, diminish the chance of our obtaining certainty in our results, but it would by no means overthrow our confidence in the reality of species. Some mere varieties possibly more distinct than certain individuals of distinct species. It is almost necessary, indeed, to suppose that varieties will differ in some cases more decidedly than some species, if we admit that there is a graduated scale of being, 
and assume that the following laws prevail in the economy of the animate creation. First, that the organization of individuals is capable of being modified to a limited extent by the force of external causes. Secondly, that these modifications are, to a certain extent, transmissible to their offspring. Thirdly, that there are fixed limits beyond which the descendants from common parents can never deviate from a certain type. Fourthly, that each species springs from one original stock and can never be permanently confounded by intermixing with the progeny of any other stock. Fifthly, that each species shall endure for a considerable period of time. Now let us assume for the present these rules hypothetically, and see what consequences may naturally be expected to result from them. We must suppose that when the author of nature creates an animal or plant, all the possible circumstances in which its descendants are destined to live are foreseen, and that an organization is conferred upon it which will enable the species to perpetuate itself and survive under all the varying circumstances to which it must be inevitably exposed. Now, the range of variation of circumstances will differ essentially in almost every case. Let us take, for example, any one of the most influential conditions of existence, such as temperature. In some extensive districts near the equator, the thermometer might never vary throughout several thousand centuries for more than 20 degrees Fahrenheit. So that if a plant or animal be provided with an organization fitting to it to endure such a range, it may continue on the globe for that immense period, although every individual might be liable at once to be cut off by the least possible excess of heat or cold beyond the determinable degree. But if a species be placed in one of the temperate zones, and have a constitution conferred on it capable of supporting a similar range of temperature only, it will inevitably perish before a single year has passed away. Humboldt has shown that, at Cumana, within the tropics, there is a difference of only 4 degrees Fahrenheit between the temperature of the warmest and coldest months, whereas in the temperate zones, the annual variation amounts to about 60 degrees, and the extreme range of the thermometer in Canada is not less than 90 degrees. The same remark might be applied to any other condition, as food, for example, it may be foreseen that the supply will be regular throughout indefinite periods, in one part of the world, and in another very precarious and fluctuating both in kind and quantity. Different qualifications may be required for enabling species to live for a considerable time under circumstances so changeable. If, then, temperature and food be among these external causes which, according to certain laws of animal and vegetable physiology, modify the organization, form, or faculties of individuals, we instantly perceive that the degrees of variability from a common standard must differ widely in the two cases above supposed, since there is a necessity of accommodating a species in one case to a much greater latitude of circumstances than in the other. If it be a law, for instance, that scanty sustenance should check these individuals in their growth which are unable to accommodate themselves to privations of this kind, and that a parent, prevented in this manner from attaining the size proper to its species, should produce a dwarfish offspring, a stunted race will arise, as is remarkably exemplified in some varieties of the horse and dog. The difference of stature in some races of dogs, when compared to others, is as one to five in linear dimensions, making a difference of a hundredfold in volume. Now, there is good reason to believe that species in general are by no means susceptible of existing under a diversity of circumstances, which may give rise to such a disparity in size, and, consequently, there will be a multitude of distinct species of which no two adult individuals can ever depart so wildly from a certain standard of dimensions as the mere varieties of a certain other species, the dog, for instance. Now, we have only to suppose that what is true of size may also hold in regard to color and many other attributes, and it will at once follow that the degree of possible discordance between varieties of the same species may, in certain areas, exceed the utmost disparity which can arise between two individuals of many distinct species. The same remarks may hold true in regard to instincts, for, if it be foreseen that one species will have to encounter a great variety of foes, it may be necessary to arm it with great cunning and circumspection, or with courage or other qualities capable of developing themselves on certain occasions, such, for example, as those migratory instincts which are so remarkably exhibited at particular periods, after they have remained dormant for many generations. The history and habits of one variety of such a species may often differ more considerably from some other than those of many distinct species which have no latitude of accommodation to circumstances. Extent of known variability in species. Lamarck has somewhat misstated the idea commonly entertained of a species, for it is not true that naturalists in general assume that the organization of an animal or plant remains absolutely constant, and that it can never vary in any of its parts. 
all must be aware that circumstances influence the habits, and that the habits may alter the state of the parts and organs, but the difference of opinion relates to the extent to which these modifications of the habits and organs of a particular species may be carried. Now, let us first inquire what positive facts can be adduced in the history of known species to establish a great and permanent amount of change in the form, structure, or instinct of individuals descending from some common stock. The best authenticated examples of the extent to which species can be made to vary may be looked for in the history of domesticated animals and cultivated plants. It usually happens that those species, both of the animal and vegetable kingdom, which have the greatest pliability of organization, those which are most capable of accommodating themselves to a great variety of new circumstances are most serviceable to man. These only can be carried by him into different climates, and can have their properties or instincts variously diversified by differences of nourishment and habits. If the resources of a species be so limited, and its habits and faculties be of such confined and local character that it can only flourish in a few particular spots, it can rarely be of great utility. We may consider, therefore, that in the domestication of animals and the cultivation of plants, mankind have first selected those species which have the most flexible frames and constitutions, and have then engaged for ages in conducting a series of experiments, with much patience and at great cost, to ascertain what may be the greatest possible deviation from a common type which can be elicited in these extreme cases. Varieties of the dog, no transmutation. The modifications produced in the different races of dog exhibit the influence of man in the most striking point of view. These animals have been transported into every climate and placed in every variety of circumstances. They have been made, as a modern naturalist observes, the servant, the companion, the guardian, and the intimate friend of man. And the power of superior genius has had a wonderful influence not only on their forms, but on their manners and intelligence. Different races have undergone remarkable changes in the quantity and color of their clothing. The dogs of Guinea are almost naked while those of the Arctic Circle are covered with a warm coat both of hair and wool, which enables them to bear the most intense cold without inconvenience. There are differences of another kind no less remarkable, as in size, the length of their muzzles, and the convexity of their foreheads. But, if we look for some of those essential changes which would be required to lend even the semblance of a foundation for the theory of Lamarck, respecting the growth of new organs and the gradual obliteration of others, we find nothing of the kind. For, in all these varieties of the dog, says Cuvier, the relation of the bones within each other remains essentially the same. The form of the teeth never changes in any perceptible degree, except that, in some individuals, one additional false grinder occasionally appears, sometimes on the one side and sometimes on the other. The greatest departure from a common type, and it constitutes the maximum of variation as yet known in the animal kingdom, is exemplified in those races of dogs which have a supernumerary toe on the hind foot with the corresponding tarsal bones, a variety analogous to one presented by six-fingered families of the human race. Lamarck has thrown out a conjecture that the wolf may have been the original of the dog, and eminent naturalists are still divided in opinion on this subject. It seems now admitted that both species agree in the period of gestation, and Mr. Ohn has been unable to confirm the alleged differences in the structure of a part of the intestinal canal. Mr. Bell inclines to the opinion that all the various races of dogs have descended from one common stock, of which the wolf is the original source. It is well known that the horse, the ox, the boar, and other domestic animals which have been introduced into South America and have one rowed in many parts, have entirely lost all marks of domesticity, and have reverted to the original characters of their species. The dogs have also become wild in Cuba, Haiti, and in all the Caribbean islands. In the course of the 17th century, they hunted in packs from 12 to 50, or more, in number, and fearlessly attacked herds of wild boars and other animals. It is natural, therefore, to inquire to what form they reverted. Now, they are said by many travelers to have resembled very nearly the shepherd's dog, but it is certain that they were never turned into wolves. They were extremely savage, and the ravages appeared to have been as much dreaded as those of wolves, but when any of their wolves were caught and brought from the woods to the towns, they grew up in the most perfect submission to man. Many examples might be adduced to prove that the extent to which the alteration of species can be pushed in the domestic state depends on the original capacity of the species to admit a variation. The horse has been as long domesticated as the dog, yet its different races depart much less widely from a common type. The ass has been still less changed, the camel scarcely at all, yet these species have probably been subjected to the influence of domestication as long as the horse.
End of chapter 34, part 1. Chapter 34, Part 2 of Principles of Geology. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Principles of Geology by Charles Lyell. Mummies of animals in Egyptian tombs identical with species still living. As the advocates of the theory of transmutation trust much to the slow and insensible changes which time may work, they are accustomed to lament the absence of accurate descriptions and figures of particular animals and plants handed down from the earliest periods of history, such as might have afforded data for comparing the condition of species at two periods considerably remote. But, fortunately, we are in some measure independent of such evidence, for, by a singular accident, the priests of Egypt have bequeathed to us in their cemeteries that information which the museums and works of the Greek philosophers have failed to transmit. For the careful investigation of these documents, we are greatly indebted to the skill and diligence of those naturalists who accompanied the French armies during their brief occupation of Egypt, the conquest of four years, from which we may date the improvement of the modern Egyptians in the arts and sciences, and the rapid progress which has been made of late in our knowledge of the arts and sciences of their remote predecessors, instead of wasting their whole time, as so many preceding travelers had done, in exclusively collecting human mummies, Mr. Geoffrey and his associates examined diligently and sent home great numbers of embalmed bodies of consecrated animals, such as the bull, the dog, the cat, the ape, the ichneumenon, the crocodile, and the ibis. To those who have never been accustomed to connect the facts of natural history with philosophical speculations, who have never raised their conceptions of the end and import of such studies beyond the mere admiration of isolated and beautiful objects, with the exertion of skill in detecting specific differences, it will seem incredible that amidst the din of arms and stirring excitement of political movements, so much enthusiasm could have been felt in regards to these precious remains. In the official report drawn up by the professors of the museum at Paris on the value of these objects, there are some eloquent passages, which may appear extravagant, unless we reflect how fully these naturalists could appreciate the bearing of the facts thus brought to light on the past history of the globe. It seems, say they, as if the superstition of the ancient Egyptians had been inspired by nature, with a view of transmitting to after ages a monument of her history. That extraordinary and eccentric people, by embalming with so much care the brutes which were the object of their stupid adoration, have left us in their secret grottoes, cabinets of zoology almost complete. The climate has conspired with the art of embalming to preserve the bodies from corruption, and we can now assure ourselves by our own eyes what was the state of a great number of species 3,000 years ago. We can scarcely restrain the transports of our imagination on the holding thus preserved, with their minutest bones, with the smallest portions of their skin, and in every particular most perfectly recognizable, many an animal, which at Thebes or Memphis, two or three thousand years ago, had its own priests and altars. Among the Egyptian mummies those procured were not only those of numerous wild quadrupeds, birds, and reptiles, but what was perhaps of still higher importance in deciding the great question under discussion, they were the mummies of domestic animals, among which those above mentioned, the bull, the dog, and the cat, were frequent. Now, such was the conformity of the whole of these species to those now living, that there was no more difference, says Cuvier, between them than between the human mummies and their embalmed bodies of men of the present day. Yet, some of these animals have since that period been transported by men to almost every climate, and forced to accommodate their habits to the greatest variety of circumstances. The cat, for example, has been carried over the whole earth, and within the last three centuries it has been naturalized in every part of the New World, from the cold regions of Canada to the tropical plains of Guiana. Yet it has scarcely undergone any perceptible mutation, and is still the same animal which was held sacred by the Egyptians. Of the ox, undoubtedly, there are many very distinct races. But the bull Apis, which was led in solemn processions by the Egyptian priests, did not differ from some of those now living. The black cattle that have run wild in America, where there were many peculiarities in the climate not to be found, perhaps, in any part of the old world, and where scarcely a single plant on which they fed was of precisely the same species, instead of altering their form and habits, have actually reverted to the exact likeness of the aboriginal wild cattle of Europe. In answer to the arguments drawn from the Egyptian mummies, Lamarck said they were identical with their living descendants in the same country, because the climate and physical geography of the banks of the Nile have remained unaltered for the last thirty centuries. But why, it may be asked, have other individuals of these species retained the same characters in many different quarters of the globe, where the climate and many other conditions are so varied. Seeds and Plants from the Egyptian Tombs The evidence derived from the Egyptian monuments was not confined to the animal kingdom. 
the fruits, seeds, and other portions of twenty different plants were faithfully preserved in the same manner, and among these the common wheat was procured by Delisle, from closed vessels in the sepulchres of the kings, the grain of which pertained not only their form but even their colour, so effectual has proved the process of embalming with vitamin in a dry and equable climate. No difference could be detected between this wheat and that which now grows in the east and elsewhere, and in regard to the barley, I am informed by Mr. Brown, the celebrated botanist, that its identity with the grain of our own times can be tested by the closest comparison. On examining, for example, one of the seeds from Mr. Sam's Egyptian collection in the British Museum, it is found that the structure of the husks, or that part of the flower which is persistent, agrees precisely with the barley of the present day, in having one perfect flower and the filiform rudiments of a second. Some naturalists believe that the perfect identification of the ancient Egyptian cerealia with the varieties now cultivated has been carried still further by sowing the seeds taken out of the catacombs and raising plants from them, but we want more evidence of this fact. Certain it is that when the experiment was recently made in the botanic garden at Kew with 100 seeds of wheat, barley, and lentils from the Egyptian collection before mentioned of the British Museum, not one of them would germinate. Native Country of the Common Wheat and here I may observe that there is an obvious answer to Lamarck's objection, that the botanist cannot point out a country where the common wheat grows wild, unless in places where it may have been derived from neighboring cultivation. All naturalists are well aware that the geographical distribution of a great number of species is extremely limited, that it was to be expected that every useful plant should first be cultivated successfully in the country where it was indigenous, and that, probably, every station which it partially occupied when growing wild would be selected by the agriculturalist as best suited to it when it artificially increased. Palestine has been conjectured by a late writer on the Cerealia to have been the original habitation of wheat and barley, a supposition which is rendered more plausible by Hebrew and Egyptian traditions and by tracing the migrations of the worship of Ceres as indicative of the migrations of the plant. If we are to infer that some one of the wild grasses has been transformed into the common wheat and that some animal of the genus Canis, still unreclaimed, has been metamorphosed into the dog, merely because we cannot find the domestic dog or the cultivated wheat in a state of nature, we may be next called upon to make similar admissions in regard to the camel, for it seems very doubtful whether any race of the species of quadruped is now wild. Changes in plants produced by cultivation. But if agriculture, it will be said, does not supply examples of extraordinary changes of form and organization, the horticulturalist can, at least, appeal to facts which may confound the preceding train of reasoning. The crab has been transformed into the apple, the slow into the plump. Flowers have changed their color and become double, and these new characters can be perpetuated by seed. A bitter plant with wavy sea-green leaves has been taken from the seaside where it grew like wild charlock and has been transplanted into the garden, lost its saltiness, and has been metamorphosed into two distinct vegetables, as unlike each other as is each to the parent plant, the red cabbage and the cauliflower. These, and a multitude of analogous facts, are undoubtedly among the wonders of nature, and attest more strongly, perhaps, the extent to which species may be modified, than any examples derived from the animal kingdom. But in these cases we find that we soon reach certain limits, beyond which we are unable to cause the individuals descending from the same stock to vary, while, on the other hand, it is easy to show that these extraordinary varieties could seldom arise, and can never be perpetuated in a wild state for many generations under any imaginable combination of accidents. They may be regarded as extreme cases, brought about by human interference and not as phenomena which indicate a capability of indefinite modification in the natural world. The propagation of a plant by buds or grafts and by cuttings is obviously a mode as which nature does not employ, and this multiplication, as well as that produced by roots and layers, seems to merely operate as an extension of the life of an individual and not as a reproduction of the species that just happens by seed. All plants increased by grafts or layers pertain precisely the peculiar qualities of the individual to which they owe their origin, and, like an individual, they have only a determinate existence, in some cases longer and in others shorter. It seems now admitted by horticulturalists that none of our garden varieties of fruit are entitled to be considered strictly permanent, but that they wear out after a time, and we are thus compelled to resort again to seeds in which case there is so decided the tendency in the ceilings to revert to the original type that our utmost skill is sometimes baffled in attempting to recover the desired variety. Varieties of the cabbage. The different races of cabbages afford, as was admitted, an astonishing example of deviation from a common type. We can scarcely conceive them to have originated, much less to have lasted for several generations, without the intervention of man. It is only by strong manures that these varieties have been obtained, and in poorer soils they instantly degenerate. If, therefore, 
We suppose in a state of nature the seed of the wild Brassica oleracea to have been wafted from the seaside to some spot enriched by the dung of animals, and to have there become a cauliflower, it would soon diffuse its seed to some comparatively sterile soils around, and that offspring would relapse to the likeness of the parent stock. But if we go so far as to imagine the soil in the spot first occupied to be constantly manured by herds of wild animals, so as to continue as rich as that of the garden, still the variety could not be maintained, because we know that each of these races is prone to fecundate others, and gardeners are compelled to exert the utmost diligence to prevent crossbreeds. The intermixture of the pollen of varieties growing in the poorer soil around would soon destroy the peculiar characters of the race which occupied the highly manured tract, for, if these accidents so continually happen, in spite of our care, among the culinary varieties, it is easy to see how soon this cause might obliterate every marked singularity in a wild state. Besides, it is well known that, although the pampered races which we rear in our gardens for use or ornament may be often perpetuated by seed, yet they rarely produce seed in such abundance, or so prolific in quality, as wild individuals. So that if the care of man were withdrawn, the most fertile variety would always, in the end, prevail over the more sterile. Similar remarks may be applied to the double flowers, which present such strange anomalies to the botanist. The ovarium, in such cases, is frequently abortive, and the seeds, when prolific, are generally much fewer than where the flowers are single. Changes caused by soil. Some curious experiments, recently made on the production of blue instead of red flowers in hydrangea hortensis, illustrate the immediate effect of certain soils on the colors of the calyx and petals. In garden mold or compost, the flowers are invariably red. In some kinds of bog earth, they are blue, and the same change is always produced by a particular sort of yellow loam. Varieties of the primrose. Linnaeus was of opinion that the primrose, oxlip, cowslip, and polyanthus were only varieties of the same species. The majority of the modern botanists, on the contrary, consider them to be distinct, although some conceive that the oxlip might be a cross between the cowslip and the primrose. Mr. Herbert has lately recorded the following experiment. I raised from the natural seed of one umbel of a highly manured red cowslip a primrose, a cowslip, oxlips of the usual and other colors, a black polyanthus, a hose and hose cowslip, and the natural primrose bearing its flower on a polyanthus stalk. From a seed of that very hose and hose cowslip I have since raised hose and hose primrose. I therefore consider all these to be only local varieties, depending on soil and situation. Professor Henslow of Cambridge since confirmed this experiment to Mr. Herbert, so that we have an example, not only of the remarkable varieties which the floras can obtain from a common stock, but of the distinctness of analogous races found in a wild state. On what particular ingredient, or quality in the earth, these changes depend, has not yet been ascertained. But gardeners are well aware that particular plants, when placed under the influence of certain circumstances, are changed in various ways, according to the species, and as often as the experiments are repeated, similar results are obtained. The nature of these results, however, depends upon the species, and they are, therefore, part of the specific character. They exhibit the same phenomena again and again, and indicate certain fixed and invariable relations between the physiological peculiarities of the plant and the influence of certain external agents. They afford no ground for questioning the instability of species, but rather the contrary. They present us with a class of phenomena, which, when they are more thoroughly understood, may afford some of the best tests for identifying species and proving that the attributes originally conferred endure so long as any issue of the original stock remains upon the earth. End of chapter 34, part 2. Chapter 35 of Principles of Geology. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Principles of Geology by Charles Lyell Whether Species Have a Real Existence in Nature Continued Limits of the Variability of Species Species susceptible of modification may be altered greatly in a short time and in a few generations, after which they remain stationary. The animals now subject to man had originally an aptitude to domesticity, Acquired peculiarities which become hereditary have a close connection with the habits or instincts of the species in a wild state. Some qualities in certain animals have been conferred with the view of their relation to man. Wild elephant domesticated in a few years, but its faculties incapable of further development. The variability of a species compared to that of an individual. I endeavored, in the last chapter, to show 
that a belief in the reality of species is not inconsistent with the idea of a considerable degree of variability in the specific character. This opinion, indeed, is little more than an extension of the idea which we must entertain of the identity of an individual throughout the changes which it is capable of undergoing. If a quadruped, inhabiting a cold northern latitude and covered with a warm coat of hair or wool, be transported to a southern climate, he will often, in the course of a few years, shed a considerable portion of its coat, which it gradually recovers on being again restored to its native country. Even there, the same changes are, perhaps, superinduced to a certain extent by the return of winter and summer. We know that the alpine hare and the ermine, or stoat, become white during winter, and again obtain their full color during the warmer season, and that the plumage of a ptarmigan undergoes a like metamorphosis in color and quantity, and that the change is equally temporary. We are aware that, if we reclaim some wild animal and modify its habits and instincts by domestication, it may, if it escapes, become in a few years nearly as wild and untractable as ever. If the same individual be again retaken, it may be reduced to its former tame state. A plant is sown in a prepared soil, in order that the petals of its flowers may multiply, and their color be heightened or changed. If we then withhold our care, the flowers of the same species become again single. And these, and innumerable other instances, we must suppose that the species was produced with a certain number of qualities, and in the case of animals, with a variety of instincts, some of which may or may not be developed according to circumstances, or which, after having been called forth, may again become latent when the exciting causes are removed. Now, the formation of races seems the necessary consequence of such a capability in species to vary. If it be a general law that the offspring should very closely resemble the parent, but before we can infer that there are no limits to the deviation from an original type which may be brought about in the course of an indefinite number of generations, we are to have some proof that, in each successive generation, individuals may go on acquiring an equal amount of new peculiarities under the influence of equal changes or circumstances. The balance of evidence, however, inclines most decidedly on the opposite side for in all cases we find that the quantity of divergence diminishes after a few generations in a very rapid ratio. Species susceptible of modification may be greatly altered in a few generations. It cannot be objected that it is out of our power to go on varying the circumstances in the same manner as might happen in the natural course of events during some great geological cycle. For in the first place, where a capacity is given to individuals to adapt themselves to new circumstances, it does not generally require a very long period for its development. If, indeed, such were the case, it is not easy to see how the modifications would answer the ends proposed, for all the individuals would die before new qualities, habits, or instincts were conferred. When we have succeeded in naturalizing some tropical plant in a temperate climate, nothing prevents us from attempting gradually to extend its distribution to higher latitudes, or to greater elevations above the level of the sea allowing equal quantities of time, or an equal number of generations, for habituating the species to successive increments of cold. But every husbandman and gardener is aware that such experiments will fail. We are more likely to succeed in making some plants in the course of the first two generations support a considerable degree of difference of temperature than a very small difference afterwards, though we persevere for many centuries. It is the same if we take any other cause instead of temperature, such as the quality of the food, or the kind of dangers to which an animal is exposed, or the soil in which a plant lives. The alteration in habits, form, or organization is often rapid during a short period, when the circumstances are made to vary farther, though in ever so slight a degree, all modification ceases, and the individual perishes. Thus some herbivorous quadrupeds may be made to feed partially on fish or flesh, but even these can never be taught to live on some herbs which they reject and which would poison them, although the same may be very nutritious to other species of the same natural order. So when man uses force or stratagem against wild animals, the persecuted race soon becomes more cautious, watchful, and cunning. New instincts seem often to be developed, and to become hereditary in the first two or three generations. But let the skill and address of men increase, however gradually, no farther variation can take place, no new qualities are elicited by the increasing dangers. 
the alteration of the habits of the species has reached a point beyond which no ulterior modification is possible, however indefinite the lapse of ages during which the new circumstances operate. Extirpation then follows, rather than such a transformation as could alone enable the species to perpetuate itself under the new state of things. Animals now subject to man had originally an aptitude to domesticity. It has been well observed by M. F. Cuvier and M. Duro de la Mal that unless some animals had manifested in a wild state an aptitude to second the efforts of man, their domestication would never have been attempted. If they had all resembled the wolf, the fox, and the hyena, the patience of the experimentalist would have been exhausted by innumerable failures before he at last succeeded in obtaining some imperfect results. So if the first advantages derived from the cultivation of plants would have been elicited by as tedious and costly a process that is by which we now make some slight additional improvements in certain races, we should have remained to this day in ignorance of the greater number of their useful qualities. Acquired instincts of some animals become hereditary. It is undoubtedly true that many new habits and qualities have not only been acquired in recent times by certain races of dogs, but have been transmitted to their offspring. But in these cases it will be observed that the new peculiarities have an intimate relation to the habits of the animal in a wild state, and therefore do not attest any tendency to a departure to an indefinite extent from the original type of the species. A race of dogs employed for hunting deer in the platform of Santa Fe in Mexico affords a beautiful illustration of a new hereditary instinct. In the mode of attack, observed M. Roland, which they employ consists in seizing the animal by the belly and overturning it in a sudden effort taking advantage of the moment when the body of this deer rests upon only the forelegs. The weight of the animal thus thrown over is often six times that of its antagonist. A dog of pure breed inherits a disposition to this kind of chase, and never attacks a deer from before while running. Even should the deer, not perceiving him, come directly upon him, the dog steps aside and makes his assault on the flank, whereas other hunting dogs, though of superior strength and general sagacity, which are brought from Europe, are destitute of this instinct. For want of similar precautions, they are often killed by the deer on the spot, the vertebrae of their neck being dislocated by the violence of the shock. A new instinct has also become hereditary in a mongrel race of dogs employed by the inhabitants of the banks of the Magdalena, almost exclusively in hunting the white-lipped picari. The address of these dogs consists in restraining their ardor and attaching themselves to no animal in particular, but keeping the whole herd in check. Now, among these dogs some are found, which the very first time they are taken to the woods are acquainted with this mode of attack, whereas a dog of another breed starts forward at once, is surrounded by the picari, and whatever may be his strength, is destroyed in a moment. Some of our countrymen, engaged of late in conducting one of the principal mining associations in Mexico, that of Real de Monte, carried out with them some English greyhounds of the best breed, to hunt the hares which abound in that country. The great platform which is the scene of sport is at an elevation of about 9,000 feet above the level of the sea, and the mercury in the barometer stands habitually at the height of about 19 inches. It was found that the greyhounds could not support the fatigues of a long chase in this attenuated atmosphere, and before they could come up with their prey, they lay down gasping for breath. But these same animals have produced whelps which have grown up and are not in the least degree incommoded by the want of density in the air, but run down the hairs which as much each as the fleetest of their race in this country. The fixed and deliberate stand of the pointer has with propriety been regarded as a mere modification of a habit, which may have been useful to a wild race accustomed to win game, and steal upon it by surprise, first pausing for an instant in order to spring with unerring aim. The faculty of the retriever, however, may justly be regarded as more inexplicable and less easily referable to the instinctive passions of the species. M. Mahendia, says a French writer in a recently published memoir, having learned that there is a race of dogs in England which stopped and brought back game of their own accord, procured a pair, and having obtained a wolf from them, kept it constantly under his eyes, until he had an opportunity of assuring himself that, without having received any instruction, and on the very first day that it was carried to the chase, it brought back game with as much steadiness as dogs which had been schooled into the same maneuver by means of the whip and collar. Attributes of animals and their relation to man. Such attainments, as well as the habits and disposition which the shepherd's dog and many others inherit, 
seems to be of a nature and extent which we can hardly explain by supposing them to be modifications of the instincts necessary for the preservation of the species in a wild state. When such remarkable habits appear in races of the species, we may reasonably conjecture that they were given with no other view than for the use of man and the preservation of the dog, which thus obtains protection. As a general rule, I fully agree with M. F. Cuvier that, in studying the habits of animals, we must attempt, as far as possible, to refer their domestic qualities to modifications of instincts which are implanted in them in a state of nature and that writer has successfully been pointed out in an admirable essay on the domestication of the mammalia, the true origin and many dispositions which are vulgarly attributed to the influence of education alone. But we should go too far if we did not admit that some of the qualities of particular animals and plants may have been given solely with a view to the connection which it was foreseen would exist between them and man, especially when we see that connection to be in many cases so intimate that the greater number, and sometimes, as in the case of the camel, all the individuals of the species which exist on earth are in subjugation to the human race. All the individuals of the species which exist on the earth are in subjection to the human race. We can perceive in the multitude of animals, especially in some of the parasitic tribes, that certain instincts and organs are conferred for the purpose of defense or attack against some other species. Now, if we are reluctant to suppose that the existence of similar relations between man and the instincts of many of the inferior animals, we adopt an hypothesis no less violent, though in the opposite extreme to that which has led some to imagine the whole animate and inanimate creation to have made been solely for the support, gratification, and instruction of mankind. Many species, most hostile to our persons or property, multiply, in spite of our efforts to repress them. Others, on the contrary, are intentionally augmented many hundredfold in number by our exertions. In such instances, we must imagine the relative resources of man, and of species friendly or inimical to him, to have been prospectively calculated and adjusted. To withhold assent to this supposition would be to refuse what we must grant in respect to the economy of nature in every other part of the organic creation. For the various species of contemporary plants and animals have obviously the relative forces nicely balanced, and their respective tastes, passions, and instincts so contrived that they are all in perfect harmony with each other. In no other manner could it happen that each species, surrounded as it is by countless danger, should be enabled to maintain its ground for periods of considerable duration. The docility of the individuals of some of our domestic species, extending as it does, to attainments foreign to the natural habits and faculties, may, perhaps, have been conferred with a view to their association with man. But, lest species should be thereby made to vary indefinitely, we find that such habits are never transmissible by generation. A pig has been trained to hunt and point game with great activity and steadiness, and other learned individuals of the same species have been taught to spell but such fortuitous acquirements never become hereditary, for they have no relation whatever to the exigencies of the animal in a wild state, and cannot, therefore, be developments of any instinctive propensities. Influence of domestication An animal of domesticity, says M. F. Cuvier, is not essentially in a different situation in regard to the feeling of restraint from one left to itself. It lives in society without constraint because, without doubt, it was a social animal and conforms itself to the will of man, because it has a chief, to which, in a wild state, it would have yielded obedience. There is nothing in its new situation that is not conformable to its propensities. It is satisfying its wants by submission to a master, and makes no sacrifice of its natural inclinations. All the social animals, when left to themselves, form herds more or less numerous, and all the individuals of the same herd know each other, are mutually attached, and will not allow a strained individual to join them. In a wild state, moreover, they obey some individual which, by its superiority, has become the chief of the herd. Our domestic species had originally the sociability of disposition, and no solitary species, however easy it may be to tame it, has yet afforded the true domestic races. We merely, therefore, develop, to our own advantage, propensities which propel the individuals of certain species to draw near to their fellows. The sheep which we have reared is induced to follow us as it would be led to follow the flock among which it was brought up. When individuals of gregarious species have been accustomed to one master, it is he alone whom they acknowledge as their chief, he only whom they obey. 
The elephant allows himself to be directed only by the Karnak whom he has adopted. The dog itself, reared in solitude with its master, manifests a hostile disposition towards all others, and everybody knows how dangerous it is to be in the midst of a herd of cows, in pastures that are little frequented, when they have not at their head the keeper who takes care of them. Everything, therefore, tends to convince us that formerly men were only with regard to the domestic animals, but those who are particularly charged with the care of them still are, namely, members of the society which these animals form among themselves, and that they are only distinguished in the general mass by the authority which they have been enabled to assume from their superiority of intellect. Thus, every social animal which recognizes man as a member and as the chief of its herd is a domestic animal. It might even be said that from the moment when such an animal admits man as a member of its society, it is domesticated, as man could not enter into such society without becoming the chief of it. But the ingenious author whose observations I have here cited admits that the obedience which the individuals of many domestic species yield indifferently to every person is without analogy in any state of things which could exist previously to their subjugation by man. Each troop of wild horses, it is true, has some stallion for its chief, who draws after him all the individuals of which the herd is composed. When a domesticated horse has passed from hand to hand and has served several masters, he becomes equally docile towards any person and is subjected to the whole human race. It seems fair to presume that the capability and the instinct of the horse to be thus modified was given to enable the species to render greater services to man, and, perhaps, the facility with which many other acquired characters become hereditary in various races of the horse may be explicable only on a like supposition. The amble, for example, a pace to which the domestic races in some parts of Spanish America are exclusively trained, has, in the course of several generations, become hereditary, and is assumed by all the young colts before they are broken in. It seems also reasonable to conclude that the power bestowed upon the horse, the dog, the ox, the sheep, the cat, and many species of domestic fowls of supporting almost every climate was given expressly to enable them to follow man throughout all parts of the globe, and in order that we might obtain their services and their protection. If it be objected that the elephant which, by the union of strength, intelligence, and docility, can render the greatest services to mankind, it is incapable of living in any but the warmest latitudes. We may observe that the quantity of vegetable food required by this quadruped would render its maintenance in the temperate zones too costly, and in the Arctic impossible. Among the changes superinduced by man, none appear, at first sight, more remarkable than the perfect tameness of certain domestic races. It is well known that, at however early an age, we obtain possession of the young of many unreclaimed races, they will retain, throughout life, a considerable timidity and apprehensiveness of danger, whereas, after one or two generations, the descendants of the same stock will habitually place the most implicit confidence in man. There is good reason, however, to suspect that such changes are not without analogy in a state of nature, or to speak more correctly, in situations where man has not interfered. We learn from Mr. Darwin that in the Galapagos archipelago, placed directly under the equator and nearly 600 miles west of the American continent, all the terrestrial birds, as the finches, doves, hawks, and others, are so tame that they may be killed with a switch. One day, says its author, a mockingbird alighted on the edge of a pitcher which I held in my hand and began to quietly sip the water and allowed me to lift it with a vessel from the ground. Yet formerly, when the first Europeans landed and found no inhabitants in these islands, the birds were even tamer than now. Already they are beginning to acquire that salutary dread of man which in countries long settled is natural even to young birds, which have never received any injury. So in the Falkland Islands, both the birds and foxes are entirely without fear of man, whereas in the adjoining mainland of South America, many of the same species of birds are extremely wild for there they have for ages been persecuted by the natives. Dr. Richardson informs us, in his able history of the habits of North American mammals, that, in the retired parts of the mountains where the hunters had seldom penetrated, there is no difficulty in approaching the Rocky Mountain sheep, which there exhibit the simplicity of a character so remarkable in the domestic species. But where they have been often fired at, they are exceedingly wild, alarm their companions on the approach of danger by a hissing noise, 
and scale the rocks with a speed and agility that baffle pursuit. It is probable, therefore, that as man, in diffusing himself over the globe, has tamed many wild races, so also he has made many tame races wild. Had some of the larger carnivorous beasts capable of scaling the rocks made their way into the North American mountains before our hunters, a similar alteration in the instincts of the sheep would doubtless have been brought about. Wild elephants domesticated in a few years. No animal affords a more striking illustration of the principal points which I have been endeavoring to establish than the elephant. For, in the first place, the wonderful sagacity with which he accommodates himself to the society of men, and the new habits which he contracts, are not the result of time, nor of modifications produced in the course of many generations. These animals will breed in captivity, as is now ascertained, in opposition to the vulgar opinion of many modern naturalists, and in conformity to that of those Asians, Alien, and Columella. Yet it has always been the custom, as the least expensive mode of attaining them, to capture wild individuals in the forest, usually when full-grown, and in a few years after they are taken, sometimes, it is said, in the space of a few months, their education is completed. Had the whole species been domesticated from an early period in the history of man, like the camel, their superior intelligence would, doubtless, have been attributed to their long and familiar intercourse with the lord of the creation. But we know that a few years is sufficient to bring about this wonderful change of habits. And although the same individual may continue to receive tuition for a century afterwards, yet it makes no farther progress in the general development of its faculties. Were it otherwise, indeed, the animal would soon deserve more than the poet's epithet of half-reasoning. From the authority of our countrymen employed in the late Burmese war, it appears, in corroboration of older accounts, that when elephants are required to execute extraordinary tasks, they be made to understand that they will receive unusual rewards. Some favorite dainty is shown to them, in the hope of acquiring which the work is done, and so perfectly does the nature of their contract appear to be understood, that the breach of it, on the part of the master, is often attended with danger. In this case, a power has been given to the species to adapt their social instincts to new circumstances, with surprising rapidity. The extent of this change is defined by strict and arbitrary limits. There is no indication of a tendency to continue diversions from certain attributes with which the elephant was originally endued. No ground whatever for anticipating that, in thousands of centuries, any material alteration could ever be effected. All that we can infer from analogy is that some more useful and peculiar races might probably be formed if the experiment were fairly tried and that some individual characteristic, now only casual and temporary, might be perpetuated by a generation. In all cases, therefore, where the domestic qualities exist in animals, they seem to require no lengthened process for their development, and they appear to have been wholly denied to some classes, which, from their strength and social disposition, might have rendered great services to man, as, for example, the greater part of the quadrumana. The orangutan, indeed, which, for its resemblance in form to man, and apparently for no other good reason, has been assumed by Lamarck to be the most perfect of the inferior animals, has been tamed by the savages of Borneo, and made to climb lofty trees and to bring down the fruit. But he is said to yield to his masters an unwilling obedience, and to be held in subjection only by a severe discipline. We know nothing of the faculties of this animal which can suggest the idea that it rivals the elephant in intelligence much less anything which can countenance the dreams of those who fancied that it might have been transmuted into the dominant race. One of the baboons of Sumatra appears to be more docile, and is frequently chained by the inhabitants to ascend trees for the purpose of gathering coconuts, a service in which the animal is very expert. He selects, says Sir Stanford Raffles, the ripe nuts, with great judgment, and pulls no more than he is ordered. The capuchin and cacaja monkeys are, according to Humboldt, taught to ascend trees in the same manner, and to throw down fruit on the banks of the lower Orinoco. It is for the Marians to explain how it happens that those same savages of Borneo have not themselves acquired by dint of longing for many generations, but the power of climbing trees, the elongated arms of the orang, or even the prehensile tails of some American monkeys, instead of being reduced to the necessity of subjugating stubborn and untractable roots we should naturally have anticipated that their wants would have excited them to efforts, and that continued efforts would have given rise to new organs, or rather to the reacquisition of organs which, 
in a manner irreconcilable with the principle of the progressive system, have grown obsolete in tribes of men which have such constant need of them. Recapitulation. It follows, then, from the different facts which have been considered in this chapter, that a short period of time is generally sufficient to effect nearly the whole change which an alteration of external circumstances can bring about in the habits of a species, and that such capacity of accommodation to new circumstances is enjoyed in very different degrees by different species. Certain qualities appear to be bestowed exclusively with a view to the relations which are destined to exist between different species, and, among others, between certain species and man, but these latter are always so nearly connected with the original habits and propensities of each species in a wild state, that they imply no indefinite capacity of varying from the original type. The acquired habits derived from human tuition are rarely transmitted to the offspring, and when this happens, it is almost universally the case with those merely which have some obvious connection with the attributes of a species when in a state of independence. End of chapter 35. Chapter 36 of Principle of Geology. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Emanuela. Principle of Geology by Charles Leal. Whether species have a real existence in nature. Continued. Phenomena of hybrids. Hunter's opinions. Mews not strictly intermediate between parent species. Hybrid plants. Experiments of Kerreuter and Wigman. Vegetable hybrids, prolific throughout several generations. Why rare in a wild state? De Candol on hybrid plants. The phenomena of hybrids confirm the distinctness of species. Theory of degradation in the intelligence of animals as indicated by the facial angle. Doctrine that certain organs of the fetus in mammalia assume successively the form of fish, reptile and bird. Recapitulation Phenomena of hybrids We have yet to consider another class of phenomena those relating to the production of hybrids, which have been regarded in a very different light with reference to their bearing to the question of the permanent distinctness of species, some naturalists considering them as affording the strongest of all proofs in favour of the reality of species, others, on the contrary, appealing to them as countenancing the opposite doctrine that all the varieties of organization and instinct now exhibited in the animal and vegetable kingdoms may have been propagated from a small number of original types. In regard to the mammifers and birds, it is found that no sexual union will take place between races which are remote from each other in the habits and organization, and it is only in species that are very nearly allied that such unions produce offspring. It may be laid down as a general rule, admitting of very few exceptions among quadrupeds, that the hybrid progeny is sterile, and there seem to be no well-authenticated examples of the continuance of the new race beyond one generation. The principal number of observations and experiments relate to the mixed offsprings of the horse and the ass. And in this case, it is well established that the he mule can generate and the she mule produce. Such cases occur in Spain and Italy, and much more frequently in the West Indies and New Holland. But these mules have never bred in cold climates, seldom in warm regions, and still more rarely in temperate countries. The hybrid offspring of the she ass and the stallion the Hinoche of Aristotle and the Hinnos of Pliny differs from the mule or the offsprings of the ass and mare. In both cases, says Buffon, these animals retain more of the dam than of the sire, not only in the magnitude but in the feature of the body, whereas in the form of the head, limbs and tail, 
they bear a greater resemblance to the sire. The same naturalist infers from various experiments respecting crossbreeds between the he-goat and the ewe, the dog and she-wolf, the goldfinch and canary bird, that the male transmits his sex to the greatest number, and that the preponderance of males over females exceeds that which prevails where the parents are of the same species. Hunter's Opinion The celebrated John Hunter has observed that the true distinction of species must ultimately be gathered from their incapacity of propagating with each other and producing offspring capable of again continuing itself. He was unwilling, however, to admit that the horse and the ass were of the same species, because some rare instances had been adduced of the breeding of mules, although he maintained that the wolf, the dog and the jackal were all of one species, because he had found, by two experiments, that the dog would breed both with the wolf and the jackal and that the mule, in each case, would breed again with the dog. In these cases, however, it may be observed that there was always one parent at least of pure breed, and no proof was obtained that the true hybrid race could be perpetuated, a fact of which, I believe, no examples are yet recorded, either in regard to mixtures of the horse and ass, or any other of the mammalia. Should the fact be hereafter ascertained, that two mules can propagate their kind, we must still inquire whether the offspring may not be regarded in the light of a monstrous birth, proceeding from some accidental cause, or, rather, to speak more philosophically, from some general law not yet understood, but which may not be permitted permanently to interfere with those laws of generation by which species may, in general, be prevented from becoming blended. If, for example, we discovered that the progeny of a mule race degenerated greatly in the first generation, in force, sagacity, or any attribute necessary for its preservation in a state of nature, we might infer that, like a monster, it is a mere temporary and fortuitous variety. Nor does it seem probable that the greater number of such monsters could ever occur unless obtained by art, for... In hunter's experiments, stratagem or force was, in most instances, employed to bring about the irregular connection. Mules not strictly intermediate between the parent species. It seems rarely to happen that the mule offspring is truly intermediate in character between the two parents. Thus, Hunter mentions that, in his experiments, one of the hybrid poops resembled the wolf much more than the rest of the litter, and we are informed by Wigman that, in a litter lately obtained in the Royal Menagerie at Berlin, from a white pointer and a she-wolf, two of the cubs resembled the common wolf dog, but the third was like a pointer with a hanging ears. There is, undoubtedly, a very close analogy between this phenomena and those presented by the intermixture of distinct races of the same species, both in the inferior animals and in men. Dr. Pritchard, in his Physical History of Mankind, cites examples where the peculiarities of the parents have been transmitted very unequally to the offspring, as where children entirely white or perfectly black have sprung from the union of the European and the Negro. Sometimes the color or other peculiarities of one parent, after having failed to show themselves in the immediate progeny, reappear in a subsequent generation, as where a white child is born of two black parents, the grandfather having been a white. The same author judiciously observes that if different species mix at their breed, and hybrid races were often propagated, the animal world would soon present a scene of confusion. Its tribes would be everywhere blended together, and we should perhaps find more hybrid creatures than genuine and uncorrupted races. Hybrid Plants 
kill Reuters experiments. The history of the vegetable kingdom has been thought to afford more decisive evidence in favor of the theory of the formation of new and permanent species from hybrid stocks. The first accurate experiments in illustration of this curious subject appear to have been made by Kolreuter, who obtained a hybrid from two species of tobacco, Nicotiana rustica and Nicotiana paniculata, which differ greatly in the shape of their leaves, the color of the corolla and the height of the stem. The stigma of a plant of Nicotiana rustica was impregnated with the pollen of a plant of Nicotiana paniculata. The seed ripened and produced a hybrid which was intermediate between the two parents and which, like all the hybrids which this botanist brought up, had imperfect stamens. He afterwards impregnated this hybrid with the pollen of Nicotiana paniculata and obtained plants which much more resembled the last. This he continued through several generations, until, by due perseverance, he actually changed the Nicotiana rustica into the Nicotiana paniculata. The plan of impregnation adopted was the cutting off of the anthers of the plant intended for fructification before they had shed pollen, and then laying on foreign pollen upon the stigma. Wickman's experiments. The same experiment has since been repeated with success by Wickman, who found that he could bring back the hybrids to the exact likeness of their parent by crossing them a sufficient number of times. The blending of the characters of the parent stocks in many other of Wickman's experiments was complete. The color and shape of the leaves and flowers and even the scent being intermediate, as in the offspring of the two species of Berbascum, an intermarriage also between the common onion and the leek, Allium cepa and Allium porrum, gave a mule plant, which, in the character of its leaves and flowers, approached most nearly to the garden onion, but had the elongated bulbous root and smell of the leek. The same botanist remarks that vegetable hybrids, when not strictly intermediate, more frequently approach the female than the male parent species, but they never exhibit characters foreign to both. A recross with one of the original stocks generally causes the mule plant to revert towards that stock, but it is not always the case, the offspring sometimes continuing to exhibit the character of a full hybrid. In general, the success attending the production and perpetuity of hybrids among plants depends, as in the animal kingdom, on the degree of proximity between the species and intermarried. If their organization be very remote, impregnation never takes place. If somewhat less distant, seeds are formed, but always imperfect and sterile. The next degree of relationship yields hybrid seedlings, but these are barren. And it is only when the parent species are very nearly allied that the hybrid race may be perpetuated for several generations. Even in this case, the best authenticated examples seem confined to the crossing of hybrids with individuals of pure breed. In none of the experiments most accurately detailed, does it appear that both the parents were mules. Wigman diversified as much as possible his mode of bringing about these irregular unions among plants. He often saw with parallel rows near to each other of the species from which he desired to breed, and instead of mutilating, after Kroiter's fashion, the plants of one of the parent stocks, he merely washed the pollen off their anthers. The branches of the plants in each row were then gently bent towards each other and intertwined, so that the wind and numerous insects, as they passed from the flowers of one to those of the other species, carried the pollen and produced fecundation. 
vegetable hybrids were rare in a wild state. The same observer saw a good simplification of the manner in which hybrids may be formed in a state of nature. Some wallflowers and pinks had been growing in a garden, in a dry sunny situation, and their stigmas had been ripened so as to be moist and to absorb pollen with avidity, although their anthers were not yet developed. These stigmas became impregnated by pollen blown from some other adjacent plants of the same species, but had they been of different species, and not too remote in their organization, mill races must have resulted. When, indeed, we consider how busily some insects have been shown to be engaged in conveying anther dust from flower to flower, especially bees, flower-eating beetles, and the like, it seems a most enigmatical problem how it can happen that promiscuous alliances between distinct species are not perpetually occurring. How continually do we observe the bees diligently employed in collecting the red and yellow powder by which the stamens of flowers are covered, loading it on their hind legs and carrying it to their hive for the purpose of feeding their young? In thus providing for their own progeny, these insects assist materially the process of fortification. Few persons need be reminded that the stamens in certain plants grow on different blossoms from the pistils, and unless the summit of the pistil be touched with the fertilizing dust, the fruit does not swell, nor the seed arrive at maturity. It is by the help of bees chiefly that the development of the fruit of many such species is secured, the powder which they have collected from the stamens being unconsciously left by them in visiting the pistils. How often, during the heat of a summer's day, do we see the maize of the issues plants, such as the U3, standing separate from the females and sending off into the air, upon the slightest breath of wind, clouds, of Boyan pollen, that the zephyr should so rarely intervene so fecundate the plants of one species with the anther dust of others seems almost to realize the converse of the miracle believed by the credulous herdsmen of the Lusitanian mares. Ore omnes verse in zephyrum, stant rupibus altis, exceptanque leves auras, et sepes in eullis, Coniugis, vento gravide, mirabile dictu. But, in the first place, it appears that there is a natural aversion in plant, as well as in animals, to regular sexual unions. And in most of the successful experiments in the animal and vegetable world, some violence has been used in order to procure impregnation. The stigma imbibes, slowly and reluctantly, the granules of the pollen of another species even when it is abundantly covered with it, and if it happened that, during this period, ever so slightly a quantity of the anther dust of its own species alight upon it, this is instantly absorbed, and the effect of the foreign pollen destroyed. Besides, it does not often happen that the male and female organs of fructification in different species arrive at the state of maturity at precisely the same time. Even where such synchronisms thus prevail, so that a cross impregnation is effected, the chances are very numerous against the establishment of a hybrid race. If we consider the vegetable kingdom generally, it must be recollected that even of the seeds which are well ripened, a great part are either eaten by insects, birds and other animals, or decay for want of room and opportunity to germinate. Unearthly plants are the first which are cut off by causes prejudicial to the species, being usually stifled by more vigorous individuals of their own kind. If, therefore, the relative fecundity or hardiness of hybrids be in the least degree inferior, they cannot maintain their footing for many generations, even if they were ever produced beyond one generation in a wild state. In the universal struggle for as extensive 
the right of the strongest eventually prevails, and the strength and durability of a race depend mainly on its prolificness, in which hybrids are acknowledged to be deficient. Centaurea hybrida, a plant which never bears seed, and is supposed to be produced by the frequent intermixture of two well-known species of Centaurea, grows wild upon a hill near Turin. Ranunculus lacerus, also sterile, has been produced accidentally at Grenoble, and near Paris by the union of two ranunculi, but this occurred in gardens. Mr. Herbert's Experiments Mr. Herbert, in one of his ingenious papers on new plants, endeavours to account for their non-occurrence in a state of nature, from the circumstance that all the combinations that were likely to occur have already been made many centuries ago, and have formed the various species of botanists. But in our gardens, he says, whenever species, having a certain degree of affinity to each other, are transported from different countries, and brought, for the first time, into contact, they give rise to hybrid species. But we have no data, as yet, to warrant the conclusion that a single permanent hybrid race has ever been formed, even in gardens, by the intermarriage of two allied species brought from distant habitations. Until some fact of this kind is fairly established, and a new species, capable of perpetuating itself in a state of perfect independence of man, can be pointed out, it seems reasonable to call in question entirely this hypothetical source of new species. That varieties do sometimes spring up from cross-breeds in a natural way can hardly be doubted, but they probably die out even more rapidly than races propagated by graphs or layers. Opinion of De Candolle De Candolle, whose opinion on a philosophical question of this kind deserves the greatest attention, has observed, in his Essay on Botanical Geography, that the varieties of plants range themselves under two general heads, those produced by external circumstances and those formed by hybridity. After adducing various arguments to show that neither of these causes can explain the permanent diversity of plants indigenous in the different regions, he says, in regard to the crossing of races, I can perfectly comprehend, without altogether sharing the opinion, that, where many species of the same genera occur near together, hybrid species may be formed, and I am aware that the great number of species of certain genera which are found in particular region may be explained in this manner, but I am unable to conceive how anyone can regard the same explanation as applicable to species which live naturally at great distances. If the three larches, for example, now known in the world, lived in the same localities, I might then believe that one of them was the produce of the crossing of the two others, but I never could admit that the Siberian species has been produced by the crossing of those of Europe and America. I see, then, that there exist in organized beings permanent differences, which cannot be referred to any one of the actual causes of variation, and these differences are what constitute species. Reality of species confirmed by the phenomena of hybrids The most decisive arguments, perhaps, amongst many others, against the probability of the derivation of permanent species from crossbreeds are to be drawn from the fact alluded to by De Candolle, of species having a close affinity to each other occurring in distinct botanical provinces or countries inhabited by groups of distinct species of indigenous plants. For in this case, naturalists, who are not prepared to go the whole length of the transmutationists, are under the necessity of admitting that, in some cases, Species which approach very near to each other in their characters were so created from their origin, an admission fatal to the idea of its being a general law of nature that a few original types only should be formed, and that all intermediate races 
should spring from the intermixture of those stocks. This notion, indeed, is wholly at variance with all that we know of hybrid generation, for the phenomenon entitled us to affirm that had the types been at first somewhat distinct, no cross-breeds would ever have been produced, much less those prolific races which we now recognize as the instinct species. In regard, moreover, to the permanent propagation of hybrid races among animals, insuperable difficulties present themselves, when we endeavor to conceive the blending together of the different instincts and properties of two species, so as to ensure that preservation of the intermediate race. The common mule, when obtained by human art, may be protected by the power of man, but, in a wild state, it would not have precisely the same wants either as the horse or the ass, and, if in consequence of some difference of this kind, it strayed from the herd, it would soon be hunted down by beasts for prey and destroyed. If we take some genus of insects, such as the bee, we find that each of the numerous species have some difference in its habits, its mode of collecting honey, or constructing its dwelling, or providing for its young, and other particulars. In the case of the common hive bee, the workers are described, by Kirby and Spence, as being endowed with no less than 30 distinct instincts. So, also, we find that amongst a most numerous class of spiders, there are nearly as many different modes of spinning their webs as there are species. When we recollect how complicated are the relations of these instincts with coexisting species, both of the animals and vegetable kingdoms, it is scarcely possible to imagine that a bastard race could spring from the union of two of these species and retain just so much of the qualities of each parent stock as to preserve its ground in spite of the dangers which surround it. We might also ask if a few generic types alone have been created among insects and the intermediate species have proceeded from hybridity. Where are those original types combining, as they ought to do, the elements of all the instincts which have made their appearance in the numerous derivative races? So, also in regard to animals of all classes and of plants, if species are in general of hybrid origin, where are the stocks which combine in themselves the habits, properties and organs of which all the intervening species ought to afford us mere modifications? Recapitulation of the arguments from hybrids I shall now conclude this subject by summing up, in a few words, the result to which I have been led by the consideration of the phenomena of hybrids. It appears that the aversion of individuals of the instinct species to the sexual union is common to animals and plants, and that it is only when the species approach near to each other in their organization and habits that any offspring are produced from their connection. Mews are of extremely rare occurrence in a state of nature, and no examples are yet known of their having procreated in a wild state. But it has been proved that hybrids are not universally sterile, provided the parent stocks have a near affinity to each other, although the continuation of the mixed race for several generations appears hitherto to have been obtained only by crossing the hybrids with individuals of pure species, an experiment which by no means bears out the hypothesis that a true hybrid race could ever be permanently established. Hence, we may infer that aversion to sexual intercourse is, in general, a good test of the distinctness of original stocks, or of a species, and the procreation of hybrids is a proof of the near affinity of species. Perhaps, hereafter, the number of generations for which hybrids may be continued, before the race dies out, for it seems usually to generate rapidly, may afford the zoologist and botanist an experimental test of the difference in the degree of affinity of allied species. I may also remark that if it could have been shown that a single permanent species 
had ever been produced by hybridity, of which there is no satisfactory proof, it might certainly have lent some countenance to the notions of the ancients, respecting the gradual deterioration of created things, but none whatever to Lamarck's theory of their progressive perfectibility, for observations have hitherto shown that there is a tendency in mule animals and plants to degenerate in organization. It was before remarked that the theory of progressive development arose partly from an attempt to ingraft the doctrines of the transmutationists upon one of the most popular generalizations in geology. But we have seen in the ninth chapter that the modern researches of geologists have broken at many points the chain of evidence once supposed to exist in favor of the doctrine that, at each successive period in the earth history, animals and plants of a higher grade or more complex organization have been created. The recent origin of man and the absence of all signs of any rational being holding an analogous relation to former states of the animate world affords one, and perhaps in the present state of science, the only argument of much weight in support of the hypothesis of a progressive scheme, but none whatever in favor of the fancied evolution of one species out of another. Theory of Degradation of Intellect as shown by the facial angle. When the celebrated anatomist Kemper first attempted to estimate the degrees of sagacity of different animals and of the races of men by the measurement of the facial angle, some speculators were bold enough to affirm that certain simiae or apes differed as little from the more savage races of men as those do from the human race in general and that a scale might be traced from apes with foreheads villanus low to the African variety of the human species, and from that to the European. The facial angle was measured by drawing a line from the prominent centre of the forehead to the most advanced part of the lower jawbone, and observing the angle which it made with the horizontal line and it was affirmed that there was a regular series of such angles from birds to the mammalia. The gradation from the dog to the monkey was said to be perfect, and from that again to man. One of the ape tribe has a facial angle of 42 degrees, and another, which approximated the nearest to man in figure, an angle of 50 degrees. To this succeeds longo sed proximus intervallo, the head of the African negro, which, as well as that of the Kalmuk, forms an angle of 70 degrees, while that of the European contains 80 degrees. The Roman painters preferred the angle of 95 degrees, and the character of beauty and sublimity so striking in some works of Grecian sculpture, as in the head of the Apollo, and in the Medusa of Sisocles is given by an angle which amounts to 100 degrees. A great number of valuable facts and curious analogies in comparative anatomy were brought to light during the investigations which were made by Kemper, John Hunter and others to illustrate the scale of organization, and their facts and generalizations must not be confounded with the fanciful systems which White and others deduce from them. That there is some connection between an elevated and capacious forehead in certain races of men and the large development of the intellectual faculties seems highly probable, and that a low facial angle is frequently accompanied with inferiority of mental powers is certain. But the attempt to trace a gradual scale of intelligence through the different species of animals accompanying the modifications of the form of the skull is a mere visionary speculation. It has been found necessary to exaggerate the sagacity of the ape tribe at the expense of the dog, and strange contradictions have arisen in the conclusions deduced from the structure of the elephant. 
some anatomist being disposed to deny the quadrupedity intelligence which he really possesses because they found that the volume of his brain was small in comparison to that of the other mammalia while others were inclined to magnify extravagantly the superiority of his intellect because the vertical height of his skull is so great when compared to its horizontal length different races of men are all of one species it would be irrelevant to our subject if we were to enter into further discussion on these topics because even if a graduated scale of organization and intelligence could have been established it would prove nothing in favor of a tendency in each species to attain a higher state of perfection i may refer the reader to the writings of blumenbach pritchard lawrence and more recently latham for convincing proofs that the variety of form color and organization of different races of men are perfectly consistent with the generally received opinion that all the individuals of the species have originated from a single pair and while they exhibit in man as many diversities of a physiological nature as appear in any other species they confirm also the opinion of the slight deviation from a common standard of which species are capable the power of existing and multiplying in every latitude and in every variety of situation and climate which has enabled the great human family to extend itself over the habitable globe is partly says lawrence the result of physical constitution and partly of the mental prerogative of man if he did not possess the most enduring and flexible corporeal frame his arts would not enable him to be the inhabitant of all climates and to brave the extremes of heat and cold and the other destructive influences of local situation yet notwithstanding the flexibility of bodily frame we find no signs of indefinite departure from a common standard and the intermarriages of individuals of the most remote varieties are not less fruitful than between those of the same tribe. Tiedman on the brain of the fetus in vertebrated animals. There is yet another department of anatomical discovery to which I must allude, because it has appeared to some persons to afford a distant analogy, at least, to that progressive development by which some of the inferior species may have been gradually perfected into those of more complex organization. Tiedemann found, and his discoveries have been most fully confirmed and elucidated by Serre, that the brain of the fetus in the highest class of vertebrated animals assumes in succession forms bearing a certain degree of resemblance to those which belong to fishes, reptiles and birds before it acquires the additions and modifications which are peculiar to the mammiferous tribe, so that, in the passage from the embryo to the perfect mammifer, there is a typical representation, it is said, of all those transformations which the primitive species are supposed to have undergone during a long series of generations between the present period and the remotest geological era. If you examine the brain of the mammalia, says Serre, at an early stage of uterine life, you perceive the cerebral hemispheres consolidated, as in fish, into vesicles isolated one from the other. At a later period, you see them affect the configuration of the cerebral hemispheres of reptiles. Still later again, they present you with the forms of those of birds. Finally, they acquire, at the era of birth, and sometimes later, the permanent forms which the adult mammalia present. The cerebral hemispheres, then, arrive at the state which we observe in the higher animals only by a series of successive metamorphoses. If we reduce the whole of these evolutions to four periods, we shall see that the first are born the cerebral lobes of the fishes, and this takes place homogeneously in all classes. The second period will give us the organization of reptiles, the third, the brain of birds, and the fourth, the complex hemispheres of mammalia. If we could develop the different parts of the brain in the inferior classes, we should make in succession a reptile out of a fish, 
a bird out of a reptile and a mammiferous quadruped out of a bird. If, on the contrary, we could starve this organ in the mammalia, we might reduce it successively to the condition of the brain of the three inferior classes. Nature often presents us with this last phenomenon in monsters, but never exhibits the first. Among the various deformities which organized beings may experience, they never pass the limits of their own classes to put on the forms of the class above them. Never does a fish elevate itself so as to assume the form of the brain of a reptile, nor does the latter even attain that of birds, nor the bird that of the mammifer. It may happen that a monster may have two heads, but the conformation of the brain always remains circumscribed narrowly within the limits of its class. Dr. Clark of Cambridge, in a memoir on fetal development, 1845, has shown that the current labors of Valentin, Racke and Bischoff disprove the reality of the supposed anatomical analogy between the embryo condition of certain organs in the higher orders and the perfect structure of the same organs in animals of an inferior class. The hearts and brains, for example, of birds and mammals, do not pass through forms which are permanent in fishes and reptiles. There is only just so much resemblance as may point to a unity of plan running through the organization of the whole series of vertebrate animals, but which lends no support whatever to the notion of a gradual transportation of one species into another, least of all of the passage, in the course of many generations, from an animal of a more simple to one of a more complex structure. Recapitulation For the reasons, therefore, detailed in this and the two preceding chapters, we may draw the following inferences in regard to the reality of species in nature. First, that there is a capability in all species to accommodate themselves, to a certain extent, to a change of external circumstances, this extent varying greatly according to the species. Secondly, when the change of situation which they can endure is great, it is usually attended by some modifications of the form, color, size, structure, or other particulars, but the mutations thus superinducted are governed by constant laws, and the capability of sovereign forms part of the permanent specific character. Thirdly, some acquired peculiarities of form, structure, and instinct are transmissible to the offspring, but this consists of such qualities and attributes only as are intimately related to the natural wants and propensities of the species. Fourthly, the entire variation from the original type which any given kind of change can produce may usually be affected in a brief period of time, after which no further deviation can be obtained by continuing to alter the circumstances, though ever so gradually. A definite divergence, either in the way of improvement or deterioration, being prevented, and the least possible excess beyond the defined limits being fatal to the existence of the individual. Fifthly, the intermixture of distinct species is guarded against by the aversion of the individuals composing them to sexual union, or by the sterility of the new offspring. It does not appear that true hybrid races have ever been perpetuated for several generations, even by the assistance of men, for the cases usually cited relate to the crossing of mules with individuals of pure species, and not to the intermixture of hybrid with hybrid. Sixthly, from the above considerations, it appears that species have a real existence in nature and that each was endowed, at the time of its creation, with the attributes and organization by which it is now distinguished. End of chapter 36 Recording by Emanuela Chapter 37, Part 1 of Principles of Geology. This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Principles of Geology by Charles Lyell, Section 84. Chapter 37. Laws which regulate the geographical distribution of species. Analogy of climate not attended with identity of species. Botanical geography. Stations. Habitations. Distinct provinces of indigenous plants. Vegetation of islands. Marine vegetation. In what manner plants become diffused. Effects of wind, rivers, marine currents. Agency of animals. Many seeds pass through the stomachs of animals and birds undigested. Agency of man in the dispersion of plants, both voluntary and involuntary. Its analogy to that of the inferior animals. Next to determining the question whether species have a real existence, the consideration of the laws which regulate their geographical distribution is a subject of primary importance to the geologist. It is only by studying these laws with attention, by observing the positions which groups of species occupy at present, and inquiring how these may be varied in the course of time by migrations, by changes in physical geography and other causes, that we can hope to learn whether the duration of species be limited, or in what manner the state of the animate world is affected by the endless vicissitudes of the inanimate. Different regions inhabited by distinct species. That different regions of the globe are inhabited by entirely distinct animals and plants is a fact which has been familiar to all naturalists since Buffon first pointed out the want of specific identity between the land quadrupeds of America and those of the Old World. The same phenomenon has, in later times, been forced in a striking manner upon our attention by the examination of New Holland, where the indigenous species of animals and plants were found to be, almost without exception, distinct from those known in other parts of the world. But the extent of this parceling out of the globe amongst different nations, as they have been termed, of plants and animals, the universality of a phenomenon so extraordinary and unexpected may be considered as one of the most interesting facts clearly established by the advance of modern science. Scarcely 1,400 species of plants appear to have been known and described by the Greeks, Romans, and Arabians. At present, more than 3,000 species are enumerated as natives of our own island, 841. In other parts of the world, there have been now collected, 1846, upward of 100,000 species, specimens of which are preserved in European herbariums. It was not to be supposed, therefore, that the ancients should have acquired any correct notions of respecting what may be called the geography of plants, although the influence of climate on the character of the vegetation could hardly have escaped their observation. Antecedently to investigation, there was no reason for presuming that the vegetable production growing wild in the eastern hemisphere should be unlike those of the western, in the same latitude, nor that the plants of the Cape of Good Hope should be unlike those of the south of Europe, situations where the climate is little dissimilar. The contrary supposition would have seemed more probable, and we might have anticipated an almost perfect identity in the animals and plants which inhabit corresponding parallels of latitude. The discovery, therefore, that each separate region of the globe, both of the land and water, is occupied by distinct groups of species, and that most of the exceptions to this general rule may be referred to disseminating causes now in operation, is eminently calculated to excite curiosity, and to stimulate us to seek some hypothesis respecting the first introduction of species which may be reconcilable with such phenomena. Botanical Geography A comparison of the plants of different regions of the globe affords results more to be depended upon in the present state of our knowledge than those relating to the animal kingdom, because the science of botany is more advanced and probably comprehends a great proportion of the total number of the vegetable productions of the whole earth. Humboldt, in several eloquent passages of his personal narrative, was among the first to promulgate philosophical views on this subject. Every hemisphere, says this traveler, produces plants of different species, and it is not by the diversity of climates that we can attempt to explain why equinoctial Africa has no Laurinae, and the New World no heaths, why the Calciariae are found only in the southern hemisphere, why the birds of the continent of India glow with colors less splendid than the birds of the hot parts of America, finally, why the tiger is peculiar to Asia, and the Orinthorhynchus to New Holland. We can conceive, he adds, that a small number of the families of plants, for instance, the Musaceae and the palms, cannot belong to very cold regions on account of their internal structure and the importance of certain organs, but we cannot explain why no one of the family of Melastomus vegetates north of the parallel of thirty degrees, or why no rose tree belongs to the southern hemisphere, 
Analogy of climates is often found in the two continents without identity of productions. 843. The luminous essay of De Candolle on botanical geography presents us with the fruits of his own researches and those of Humboldt, Brown, and other eminent botanists so arranged that the principal phenomena of the distribution of plants are exhibited in connection with the causes to which they are chiefly referable. 844. It might not perhaps be difficult, observes this writer, to find two points in the United States and in Europe, or in equinoctial America and Africa, which present all the same circumstances, as, for example, the same temperature, the same height above the sea, a similar soil, an equal dose of humidity, yet nearly all, perhaps all, the plants in these two similar localities shall be distinct. A certain degree of analogy, indeed, of aspect, and even of structure, might very possibly be discoverable between the plants of the two localities in question. But the species would in general be different. Circumstances, therefore, different from those which now determine the stations, have had an influence on the habitations of plants. Stations and Habitations of Plants As I shall frequently have occasion to speak of the stations and habitations of plants in the technical sense in which the terms are used in the above passage, I may remind the geologist that stations indicates the peculiar nature of the locality where each species is accustomed to grow, and has reference to climate, soil, humidity, light, elevation above the sea, and other analogous circumstances whereas by habitation is meant a general indication of the country where a plant grows wild. Thus the station of a plant may be a salt marsh, a hillside, the bed of the sea, or a stagnant pool. Its habitation may be Europe, North America, or New Holland between the tropics. The study of stations has been styled the topography, that of habitations, the geography of botany. The terms thus defined express each a distinct class of ideas, which have been often confounded together and which are equally applicable in zoology. In farther illustration of the principle above alluded to, that differences of longitude, independently of any influence of temperature, is accompanied by a great and sometimes a complete diversity in the species of plants, De Candolle observes that out of 2,891 species of phenogamous plants described by Persh in the United States, there are only 385 which are found in northern or temperate Europe. M. M. Humboldt and Bonpland, in all their travels through equinoctial America, found only 24 species, these being all Cyperaceae and Graminae, common to America and any part of the Old World. They collected, it is true, chiefly on the mountains, or the proportion would have been larger, for Dr. J. Hooker informs me that many tropical plants of the New World are identical with African species. Nevertheless, the general discordance of these floras is very striking. On comparing New Holland with Europe, Mr. Brown ascertained that out of 4,100 species discovered in Australia, there were only 166 common to Europe, and of this small number there were some few which may have been transported thither by man. Almost all of the 166 species were cryptogamic, and the rest consist, in nearly every case, of phenogamous plants which also inhabit intervening regions. But what is still more remarkable, in the more widely separated parts of the ancient continent, notwithstanding the existence of an uninterrupted land communication, the diversity in the specific character of the respective vegetations is almost as striking. Thus there is found one assemblage of species in China, another in the countries bordering the Black Sea and the Caspian, a third in those surrounding the Mediterranean, a fourth in the great platforms of Siberia and Tartary, and so forth. The distinctness of the groups of indigenous plants in the same parallel of latitude is greatest where continents are disjoined by a wide expanse of ocean. In the northern hemisphere, near the pole, where the extremities of Europe, Asia, and America unite or approach near to one another, a considerable number of the same species of plants are found, common to the three continents. But it has been remarked that these plants, which are thus so widely diffused in the Arctic regions, are also found in the chain of the Aleutian Islands, which stretch almost across from America to Asia, and which may probably have served as the channel of communication for the partial blending of the floras of the adjoining regions. It has indeed been observed to be a general rule that plants found at two points very remote from each other occur also in places intermediate. Dr. J. Hooker informs me that in high latitudes in the southern ocean, in spite of the great extent of the sea, floras of widely disconnected islands contain many species in common, perhaps icebergs transporting to vast distances not only stones but soil with the seeds of plants, may explain this unusually wide diffusion of insular plants. In islands very distant from continents, the total number of plants is comparatively small, but a large proportion of the species are such as occur nowhere else. 
insofar as the flora of such islands is not peculiar to them, it contains, in general, species common to the nearest mainlands, 845. The islands of the great southern ocean exemplify these rules, the easternmost containing more American and the western more Indian plants, 846. Madeira and Tenerife contain many species and even entire genera peculiar to them, but they have also plants in common with Portugal, Spain, the Azores, and the northwest coast of Africa, 847. In the Canaries, out of 533 species of phenogamous plants, it is said that 310 are peculiar to these islands, and the rest identical with those of the African continent. But in the flora of St. Helena, which is so far distant even from the western shores of Africa, there have been found, out of 30 native species of the phenogamous class, only one or two which are found in any other part of the globe. On the other hand, of 60 cryptogamic plants, collected by Dr. J. Hooker in the same island, 12 only were peculiar. The Natural History of the Galapagos Archipelago, described by Mr. Darwin, affords another very instructive illustration of the laws governing the geographical distribution of plants and animals in islands. This group consists of 10 principal islands situated in the Pacific Ocean under the equator about 600 miles westward of the coast of South America. As they are all formed of volcanic rocks, many of the craters, of which there are about 2,000 in number, having a very fresh aspect, we may regard the whole as much more modern in origin than the mass of the adjoining continent. Yet neither has the flora nor fauna been derived from South America, but consist of species for the most part indigenous, yet stamped with a character decidedly South American. What is still more singular, there is a difference between the species inhabiting the different islands. Of flowering plants, for example, there are 185 species at present known, and 40 cryptogamic, making together 225. 100 of the former class are new species, probably confined to this archipelago, and of the rest, 10 at least have been introduced by man. Of 21 species of Compositae, all but one are peculiar, and they belong to 12 genera, no less than 10 of which genera are confined to the Galapagos. Dr. Hooker observes that the type of this flora has an undoubted relation to that of the western side of South America, and he detects in it no affinity with that of the numerous islands scattered over other parts of the Pacific. So in regard to the birds, reptiles, land shells, and insects, this archipelago, standing as it does in the Pacific Ocean, is zoologically part of America. Although each small island is not more than 50 or 60 miles apart, and most of them are in sight of each other, formed of precisely the same rocks, rising nearly to an equal height, and placed under a similar climate, they are tenanted each by a different set of beings, the tortoises, mocking thrushes, finches, beetles, scarcely any two of them ever ranging over the whole, and often not even common to any two of the islands. The archipelago, says Mr. Darwin, is a little world within itself, or rather a satellite attached to America, whence it has derived a few stray colonists, and has received the general character of its indigenous productions. One is astonished, he adds, at the amount of creative force displayed on so many small, barren, and rocky islands, and still more so at its diverse yet analogous action on points so near each other. I have said that the Galapagos archipelago might be called a satellite attached to America, but it should rather be called a group of satellites physically similar, organically distinct, yet intimately related to each other, and all related in a marked, though much lesser degree, to the great American continent. 848. Number of Botanical Provinces De Candolle has enumerated twenty great botanical provinces inhabited by indigenous or aboriginal plants, and although many of these contain a variety of species which are common to several others, and sometimes to places very remote, yet the lines of demarcation are, upon the whole, astonishingly well defined. 849. Nor is it likely that the bearing of the evidence on which these general views are founded will ever be materially affected since they are already confirmed by the examination of nearly 100,000 species of plants. The entire change of opinion which the contemplation of those phenomena has brought about is worthy of remark. The first travelers were persuaded that they should find, in distant regions, the plants of their own country, and they took a pleasure in giving them the same names. It was some time before this illusion was dissipated, but so fully sensible did botanists at last become of the extreme smallness of the number of phenogamous plants common to different continents, that the ancient floras fell into disrepute. All grew diffident of the pretended identifications, and we now find that every naturalist is inclined to examine each supposed exception with scrupulous severity. 850. 
If they admit the fact, they begin to speculate on the mode whereby the seeds may have been transported from one country into the other, or inquire on which of two continents the plant was indigenous, assuming that a species like an individual cannot have two birthplaces. Marine Vegetation The marine vegetation is divisible into different systems like those prevailing on the land, but they are much fewer, as we might have expected, the temperature of the ocean being more uniform than that of the atmosphere, and consequently the dispersion of species from one zone to another being less frequently checked by the intervention of uncongenial climates. The proportion also of land to sea throughout the globe being small, the migration of marine plants is not so often stopped by barriers of land, as is that of the terrestrial species by the ocean. The number of hydrophytes, as they are termed, is very considerable, and their stations are found to be infinitely more varied than could have been anticipated. For while some plants are covered and uncovered daily by the tide, others live at the depth of several hundred feet. Among the known provinces of algae, we may mention, first, the north circumpolar, from latitude 60 degrees north to the pole, Secondly, the North Atlantic, or the region of Fucus proper and Delisarie, extending from latitude 40 degrees north to latitude 60 degrees north. Thirdly, that of the Mediterranean, which may be regarded as a subregion of the fourth, or warmer temperate zone, of the Atlantic, between latitude 23 degrees north and latitude 40 degrees north. Fifthly, the tropical Atlantic, in which the Sargassum, Rhodomelia, Corallinia, and Siphonia abound. Sixthly, the South Atlantic, where the Fucus reappears. Seventhly, the Antarctic American, comprehending from Chile to Cape Horn, the Falkland Islands, and thence round the world south of latitude 50 degrees south. Eighthly, the Australian and New Zealand, which is very peculiar, being characterized, among other generic forms, by Cystocereae and Fuciae. Ninthly, the Indian Ocean and Red Sea. And tenthly, the Chinese and Japanese Seas, 851. In addition to the above provinces, there are several others not yet well determined in the Pacific Ocean and elsewhere. There are, however, many species which range through several of these geographical regions of subaqueous vegetation, being common to very remote countries, as, for example, to the coasts of Europe and the United States and others, to Cape Horn and Van Diemen's Land, the same plants extending also for the most part to the New Zealand Sea of the species strictly Antarctic, excluding the New Zealand and Tasmanian groups, Dr. Hooker has identified not less than a fifth part of the whole of the British algae. Yet is there a much smaller proportion of cosmopolite species among the algae than among the terrestrial cellular plants, such as lichens, mosses, and hepaticae. It must always be borne in mind that the distinctness alluded to between the provinces, whether of subaqueous or terrestrial plants, relates strictly to species and not to forms. In regard to the numerical preponderance of certain forms, and many peculiarities of internal structure, there is usually a marked agreement in the vegetable productions of districts placed in corresponding latitudes, and under similar physical circumstances, however remote their position. Thus there are innumerable points of analogy between the vegetation of the Brazils, Equinoctial Africa, and India, and there are also points of difference wherein the plants of these regions are distinguishable from all extratropical groups, but there is a very small proportion of the entire number of species common to the three continents. The same may be said if we compare the plants of the United States with that of the middle of Europe. The species are distinct, but the forms are often so analogous as to have been styled geographical representatives. There are very few species of phanogamous plants, says Dr. J. Hooker, common to Van Diemen's Land, New Zealand, and Fuegia, but a great many genera, and some of them are confined to those three distant regions of the southern hemisphere, being in many instances each severally represented by a single species. The same naturalist also observes that the southern temperate as well as the Antarctic regions possesses each of them representatives of some of the genera of the analogous climates of the opposite hemisphere, but very few of the species are identical unless they be such as are equally diffused over other countries, or which inhabit the Andes by the aid of which they have evidently effected their passage southwards. Manner in which plants become diffused. Winds. Let us now consider what means of diffusion, independently of the agency of man, are possessed by plants, whereby, in the course of ages, they may be enabled to stray from one of the botanical provinces above mentioned to another, and to establish new colonies at a great distance from their birthplace. 
The principle of the inanimate agents provided by nature for scattering the seeds of plants over the globe are the movements of the atmosphere and of the ocean, and the constant flow of water from the mountains to the sea. To begin with the winds, a great number of seeds are furnished with downy and feathery appendages, enabling them, when ripe, to float in the air, and to be wafted easily to great distances by the most gentle breeze. Other plants are fitted for dispersion by means of an attached wing, as in the case of the fir tree, so that they are caught up by the wind as they fall from the cone and are carried to a distance. Amongst the comparatively small number of plants known to Linnaeus, no less than 138 genera are enumerated as having winged seeds. As winds often prevail for days, weeks, or even months together in the same direction, these means of transportation may sometimes be without limits, and even the heavier grains may be borne through considerable spaces in a very short time during ordinary tempests, for strong gales which can sweep along grains of sand often move at the rate of about 40 miles an hour, and if the storm be very violent at the rate of 56 miles, 852. The hurricanes of tropical regions which root up trees and throw down buildings sweep along at the rate of 90 miles an hour, so that forever how short a time they prevail, they may carry even the heavier fruits and seeds over friths of seas of considerable width, and doubtless are often the means of introducing into islands the vegetation of adjoining continents. Whirlwinds are also instrumental in bearing along heavy vegetable substances to considerable distances. Slight ones may frequently be observed in our fields, in summer carrying up haycocks into the air, and then letting fall small tufts of hay far and wide over the country. But they are sometimes so powerful as to dry up lakes and ponds, and to break off the boughs of trees and carry them up in a whirling column of air. Franklin tells us in one of his letters that he saw in Maryland a whirlwind which began by taking up the dust which lay in the road, in the form of a sugar loaf with the pointed end downwards, and soon after grew to the height of forty or fifty feet, being twenty or thirty in diameter. It advanced in a direction contrary to the wind, and although the rotary motion of the column was surprisingly rapid, its onward progress was sufficiently slow to allow a man to keep pace with it on foot. Franklin followed it on horseback, accompanied by his son, for three-quarters of a mile, and saw it enter a wood where it twisted and turned round large trees with surprising force. These were carried up in a spiral line, and were seen flying in the air, together with boughs and innumerable leaves, which, from their height, appeared reduced to the apparent size of flies. As this cause operates at different intervals of time throughout a great portion of the Earth's surface, it may be the means of bearing not only plants but insects, land testaceae, and their eggs, with many other species of animals, to points which they could never otherwise have reached, and from which they may then begin to propagate themselves again as from a new center. Distribution of Cryptogamous Plants It has been found that a great numerical proportion of the exceptions to the limitation of species to certain quarters of the globe occur in the various tribes of cryptogamic plants. Linnaeus observed that, as the germs of plants of this class, such as mosses, fungi, and lichens, consist of an impalpable powder, the particles of which are scarcely visible to the naked eye, there is no difficulty to account for their being dispersed throughout the atmosphere and carried to every point of the globe where there is a station fitted for them. Lichens in particular ascend to great elevations, sometimes growing 2,000 feet above the line of perpetual snow, at the utmost limits of vegetation, and where the mean temperature is nearly at the freezing point. This elevated position must contribute greatly to facilitate the dispersion of those buoyant particles of which their fructification consists. 853. Some have inferred from the springing up of mushrooms wherever particular soils and decomposed organic matter are mixed together, that the production of fungi is accidental, and not analogous to that of perfect plants. But Fries, whose authority on these questions is entitled to the highest respect, has shown the fallacy of this argument in favor of the old doctrine of equivocal generation. The sporules of fungi, says this naturalist, are so infinite that in a single individual of reticularia maxima I have counted above ten millions, and so subtle as to be scarcely visible, often resembling thin smoke, so light that they may be raised perhaps by evaporation into the atmosphere, and dispersed in so many ways by the attraction of the sun, by insects, wind, elasticity, adhesion, and etc., that it is difficult to conceive a place from which they may be excluded. 854. The club moss called Lycopodium cernuum, 
affords a striking example of a cryptogamous plant universally distributed over all equinoctial countries. It scarcely ever passes beyond the northern tropic, except in one instance, where it appears around the hot springs in the Azores, although it is neither an inhabitant of the Canaries nor Madeira. Doubtless its microscopic sporules are everywhere present, ready to germinate on any spot where they can enjoy throughout the year the proper quantity of warmth, moisture, light, and other conditions essential to the species. Almost every lichen brought home from the southern hemisphere by the Antarctic expedition under Sir James Ross, amounting to no less than 200 species, was ascertained to be also an inhabitant of the northern hemisphere, and almost all of them European. End of chapter 37, part 1. Chapter 37, part 2 of Principles of Geology. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Principles of Geology by Charles Lyell. Section 85. Agency of Rivers and Currents In considering, in the next place, the instrumentality of the aqueous agents of dispersion, I cannot do better than cite the words of one of our ablest botanical writers. The mountain stream or torrent, observes Keith, washes down to the valley the seeds which may accidentally fall into it, or which it may happen to sweep from its banks when it suddenly overflows them. The broad and majestic river, winding along the extensive plain and traversing the continents of the world, conveys to the distance of many hundreds of miles the seeds that may have vegetated at its source. Thus the southern shores of the Baltic are visited by seeds which grew in the interior of Germany, and the western shores of the Atlantic by seeds that have been generated in the interior of America. Fruits, moreover, indigenous to America and the West Indies, such as that of a mimosa scandens, the cashew nut, and others, have been known to be drifted across the Atlantic by the Gulf Stream, on the western coasts of Europe, in such a state that they might have vegetated had the climate and soil been favorable. Among these, the Geolandina bonduc, a leguminous plant, is particularly mentioned, as having been raised from a seed found on the west coast of Ireland. Sir Hans Sloan states that several kinds of beans cast ashore on the Orkney Isles and Ireland, but none of which appear to have naturalized themselves, are derived from trees which grow in the West Indies, and many of them in Jamaica. He conjectures that they might have been conveyed by rivers into the sea, and then by the Gulf Stream to greater distances, in the same manner as the seaweed called Lenticula marina, or sargasso, which grows on the rocks about Jamaica, is known to be carried by the winds and current toward the coast of Florida, and thence into the North American Ocean, where it lies very thick on the surface of the sea. The absence of liquid matter in the composition of seeds renders them comparatively insensible to heat and cold, so that they may be carried without detriment through climates where the plants themselves would instantly perish. Such is their power of resisting the effects of heat that Spallanzani mentions some seeds that germinated after having been boiled in water. Sir John Herschel informs me that he has sown at the Cape of Good Hope the seeds of the Acacia lofanta after they had remained for twelve hours in water of 140 degrees Fahrenheit, and they germinated far more rapidly than unboiled seeds. He also states that an eminent botanist, Baron Ludwig, could not get the seeds of a species of cedar to grow at the Cape till they were thoroughly boiled. When, therefore, a strong gale, after blowing violently off the land for a time, dies away, and the seeds alight upon the surface of the waters, or wherever the ocean, by eating away the sea cliffs, throws down into its waves plants which would never otherwise reach the shores, the tides and currents become active instruments in assisting the dissemination of almost all classes of the vegetable kingdom. The pandanus and many other plants have been distributed in this way over the islands of the Pacific. I have before called attention, page 618, to the interesting fact that one-fifth of all the algae found in the Antarctic regions in 1841-3 by Dr. J. Hooker were of species common to the British seas. He has suggested that cold currents which prevail from Cape Horn to the equator and are there met by other cold water may by their direct influence as well as by their temperature facilitate the passage of Antarctic species to the Arctic Ocean. 
In like manner, the migration of certain marine animals from the southern to the northern hemisphere may have been brought about by the same cause. In a collection of 600 plants from the neighborhood of the river Zaire in Africa, Mr. Brown found that 13 species were also met with on the opposite shores of Guiana and Brazil. He remarked that most of these plants were found only on the lower parts of the river Zaire, and were chiefly such as produced seeds capable of retaining their vitality a long time in the currents of the ocean. Dr. J. Hooker informs me that after an examination of a great many insular floras, he has found that no one of the large natural orders is so rich in species common to other countries as the leguminosae. The seeds in this order, which comprises the largest proportion of widely diffused littoral species, are better adapted than those of any other plants for water carriage. The Migration of Plants Aided by Islands Islands, moreover, and even the smallest rocks, play an important part in aiding such migrations. For when seeds alight upon them from the atmosphere, or are thrown up by the surf, they often vegetate and supply the winds and waves with a repetition of new and uninjured crops of fruit and seeds. These may afterwards pursue their course through the atmosphere, or along the surface of the sea in the same direction. The number of plants found at any given time on an islet affords us no test whatever of the extent to which it may have cooperated toward this end, since a variety of species may first thrive there and then perish, and be followed by other chance comers like themselves. If neither St. Helena nor Ascension have promoted the botanical intercourse between the Old and New Worlds, we may easily account for the fact by remembering that they are not only extremely minute and isolated spots, but are also bounded by lofty and precipitous shores without beaches, where the seeds of foreign species could readily establish themselves. Currents and winds in the Arctic regions drift along icebergs covered with an alluvial soil on which herbs and pine saplings are seen growing, which may often continue to vegetate on some distant shore where the ice island is stranded. Dispersion of Marine Plants With respect to marine vegetation, the seeds, being in their native element, may remain immersed in water without injury for indefinite periods so that there is no difficulty in conceiving the diffusion of species wherever uncongenial climates, contrary currents, and other causes do not interfere. All are familiar with the sight of the floating seaweed, flung from the rock on ocean's foam to sail, where the surge may sweep, the tempest's breath prevail. Remarkable accumulations of that species of seaweed, generally known as gulfweed or sargasso, occur on each side of the equator in the Atlantic, Pacific, and Indian Oceans. Columbus and other navigators, who first encountered these banks of algae in the northern Atlantic, compared them to vast inundated meadows and state that they retarded the progress of their vessels. The most extensive bank is a little west of the meridian of Fayal, one of the Azores, between latitudes 35 degrees and 36 degrees. Violent north winds sometimes prevail in this space, and drive the seaweed to low latitudes, as far as the 24th or even the 20th degree. Along the northern edge of the Gulf Stream, Dr. Hooker found Fucus nodosus and F. serratus, which he traced all the way from latitude 36 degrees north to England. The hollow pod-like receptacle in which the seeds of many algae are lodged, and the filaments attached to the seed vessels of others, seem intended to give buoyancy, and I may observe that these hydrophytes are in general proliferous, so that the smallest fragment of a branch can be developed into a perfect plant. The seeds, moreover, of the greater number of species are enveloped with a mucous matter, like that which surrounds the eggs of some fish, and which not only protects them from injury, but serves to attach them to floating bodies or to rocks. Agency of Animals in the Distribution of Plants but we have as yet considered part only of the fertile resources of nature for conveying seeds to a distance from their place of growth. The various tribes of animals are busily engaged in furthering an object whence they derive such important advantages. Sometimes an express provision is found in the structure of seeds to enable them to adhere firmly by prickles, hooks, and hairs to the coats of animals, or feathers of the winged tribe, to which they remain attached for weeks or even months and are borne along into every region whither birds or quadrupeds may migrate. Linnaeus enumerates fifty genera of plants, and the number now known to botanists is much greater, 
which are armed with hooks, by which, when ripe, they adhere to the coats of animals. Most of these vegetables, he remarks, require a soil enriched with dung. Few have failed to mark the locks of wool hanging on the thorn bushes wherever the sheep pass, and it is probable that the wolf or lion never give chase to herbivorous animals without being unconsciously subservient to this part of the vegetable economy. A deer has strayed from the herd when browsing on some rich pasture, when he is suddenly alarmed by the approach of his foe. He instantly takes to flight, dashing through many a thicket and swimming across many a river and lake. The seeds of the herbs and shrubs which have adhered to his smoking flanks are washed off again by the waters. The thorny spray is torn off and fixes itself in its hairy coat until brushed off again in other thickets and copses. Even on the spot where the victim is devoured, many of the seeds which he had swallowed immediately before the chase may be left on the ground uninjured and ready to spring up in a new soil. The passage, indeed, of undigested seeds through the stomachs of animals is one of the most efficient causes of the dissemination of plants, and is, of all others, perhaps, the most likely to be overlooked. Few are ignorant that a portion of the oats eaten by a horse preserve their germinating faculty in the dung. The fact of their being still nutritious is not lost on the sagacious rook. To many, says Linnaeus, it seems extraordinary, and something of a prodigy, that when a field is well tilled and sown with the best wheat, it frequently produces darnel or the wild oat, especially if it be manured with new dung. They do not consider that the fertility of the smaller seeds is not destroyed in the stomachs of animals. Agency of Birds Some birds of the order Passeres devour the seeds of plants in great quantities, which they eject again in very distant places without destroying its faculty of vegetation. Thus a flight of larks will fill the cleanest field with a great quantity of various kinds of plants, as the Melilot trefoil, Medicago lupulina, and others whose seeds are so heavy that the wind is not able to scatter them to any distance. In like manner, the blackbird and missile thrush, when they devour berries in too great quantities, are known to consign them to the earth undigested in their excrement. Pulpy fruits serve quadrupeds and birds as food, while their seeds, often hard and indigestible, pass uninjured through the intestines and are deposited far from their original place of growth in a condition peculiarly fit for vegetation. So well are the farmers in some parts of England aware of this fact that when they desire to raise a quickset hedge in the shortest possible time, they feed turkeys with the haws of the common white thorn, Crotagus oxyacantha, and then sow the stones which are ejected in their excrement, whereby they gain an entire year in the growth of the plant. Birds, when they pluck cherries, sloes, and haws, fly away with them to some convenient place, and when they have devoured the fruit, drop the stone into the ground. Captain Cook, in his account of the volcanic island of Tanna, one of the New Hebrides, which he visited in his second voyage, makes the following interesting observation. Mr. Forster, in his botanical excursion this day, shot a pigeon, in the craw of which was a wild nutmeg. It is easy, therefore, to perceive that birds in their migrations to great distances, and even across seas, may transport seeds to new isles and continents. The sudden deaths to which great numbers of frugivorous birds are annually exposed must not be omitted as auxiliary to the transportation of seeds to new habitations. When the sea retires from the shore, and leaves fruits and seeds on the beach, or in the mud of estuaries, it might, by the returning tide, wash them away again, or destroy them by long immersion. But when they are gathered by land birds, which frequent the seaside, or by waders and waterfowl, they are often born inland, and if the bird, to whose crop they have been consigned, is killed, they may be left to grow up far from the sea. Let such an accident happen but once in a century, or a thousand years, it will be sufficient to spread many of the plants from one continent to another, for in estimating the activity of these causes, we must not consider whether they act slowly in relation to the period of our observation, but in reference to the duration of species in general. Let us trace the operation of this cause in connection with others. A tempestuous wind bears the seeds of a plant many miles through the air, and then delivers them to the ocean. The oceanic current drifts them to a distant continent. By the fall of the tide they become the food of numerous birds, and one of these is seized by a hawk or eagle which, soaring across hill and dale to a place of retreat, leaves, after devouring its prey, 
the unpalatable seeds to spring up and flourish in a new soil. The machinery before adverted to is so capable of disseminating seeds over almost unbounded spaces that were we more intimately acquainted with the economy of nature, we might probably explain all the instances which occur of the aberration of plants to great distances from their native countries. The real difficulty which must present itself to everyone who contemplates the present geographical distribution of species is the small number of exceptions to the rule of the non-intermixture of different groups of plants. Why have they not, supposing them to have been ever so distinct originally, become more blended and confounded together in the lapse of ages? Agency of Man in the Dispersion of Plants But in addition to all the agents already enumerated as instrumental in diffusing plants over the globe, we have still to consider man, one of the most important of all. He transports with him, into every region, the vegetables which he cultivates for his wants, and is the involuntary means of spreading a still greater number which are useless to him, or even noxious. When the introduction of cultivated plants, says de Candolle, is of recent date, there is no difficulty in tracing their origin, but when it is of high antiquity, we are often ignorant of the true country of the plants on which we feed. No one contests the American origin of the maize or the potato, nor the origin in the old world of the coffee tree, and of wheat. But there are certain objects of culture, of very ancient date, between the tropics, such for example as the banana, of which the origin cannot be verified. Armies in modern times have been known to carry, in all directions, grain and cultivated vegetables from one extremity of Europe to the other, and thus have shown us how, in more ancient times, the conquests of Alexander, the distant expeditions of the Romans, and afterward the Crusades, may have transported many plants from one part of the world to the other. But besides the plants used in agriculture, the numbers which have been naturalized by accident, or which man has spread unintentionally, is considerable. One of our old authors, Jocelyn, gives a catalogue of such plants as had, in his time, sprung up in the colony since the English planted and kept cattle in New England. They were two and twenty in number. The common nettle was the first which the settlers noticed, and the plantain was called by the Indians Englishman's foot, as if it sprung from their footsteps. We have introduced everywhere, observes de Candolle, some weeds which grow among our various kinds of wheat, and which have been received, perhaps, originally from Asia along with them. Thus, together with the Barbary wheat, the inhabitants of the south of Europe has sown, for many ages, the plants of Algiers and Tunis. With the wools and cottons of the east, or of Barbary, there are often brought into France the grains of exotic plants, some of which naturalize themselves. Of this I will cite a striking example. There is, at the gate of Montpellier, a meadow set apart for drying foreign wool, after it has been washed. There hardly passes a year without foreign plants being found naturalized in this drying ground. I have gathered there Centuriae parviflora, Sorolia palestina, and Ipericum crispum. This fact is not only illustrative of the aid which man lends inadvertently to the propagation of plants, but it also demonstrates the multiplicity of seeds which are borne about in the woolly and hairy coats of wild animals. The same botanist mentions instances of plants naturalized in seaports by the ballast of ships, and several examples of which have spread through Europe from botanical gardens, so as to have become more common than many indigenous species. It is scarcely a century, says Linnaeus, since the Canadian Erigeron, or fleabane, was brought from America to the botanical garden at Paris, and already the seeds have been carried by the winds so that it is diffused over France, the British Islands, Italy, Sicily, Holland, and Germany. Several others are mentioned by the Swedish naturalist as having been dispersed by similar means. The common thorn apple, Datura stramonium, observes Wildenau, now grows as a noxious weed throughout all Europe, with the exception of Sweden, Lapland, and Russia. It came from the East Indies and Abyssinia to us, and was thus universally spread by certain quacks, who used its seeds as an emetic. The same plant is now abundant throughout the greater part of the United States, along roadsides and about farmyards. The yellow monkey flower, Mimulus luteus, a plant from the northwest region of America, 
has now established itself in various parts of England and is spreading rapidly. In hot and ill-cultivated countries, such naturalization takes place more easily. Thus the Chenopodium ambrosioides, sown by Mr. Burchell on a point of St. Helena, multiplied so fast in four years as to become one of the commonest weeds in the island, and it has maintained its ground ever since 1845. The most remarkable proof, says De Candolle, of the extent to which man is unconsciously the instrument of dispersing and naturalizing species is found in the fact that in New Holland, America, and the Cape of Good Hope, the aboriginal European species exceed in number all the others which have come from any distant regions, so that in this instance the influence of man has surpassed that of all the other causes which tend to disseminate plants to remote districts. Of nearly 1,600 British flowering plants, it is supposed that about 300 species are naturalized, but a large proportion of these would perish with the discontinuance of agriculture. Although we are but slightly acquainted, as yet, with the extent of our instrumentality in naturalizing species, yet the facts ascertained afford no small reason to suspect that the number which we introduce unintentionally exceeds all those transported by design. Nor is it unnatural to suppose that the functions which the inferior beings, extirpated by man, once discharged in the economy of nature, should devolve upon the human race. If we drive many birds of passage from different countries, we are probably required to fulfill their office of carrying seeds, eggs of fish, insects, mollusks, and other creatures to distant regions. If we extirpate quadrupeds, we must replace them not merely as consumers of the animal and vegetable substances which they devour, but as disseminators of plants and of the inferior classes of the animal kingdom. I do not mean to insinuate that the very same changes which man brings about would have taken place by means of the agency of other species, but merely that he supersedes a certain number of agents, and so far as he disperses plants unintentionally or against his will, his intervention is strictly analogous to that of the species so extirpated. I may observe, moreover, that if at former periods the animals inhabiting any given district have been partially altered by the extinction of some species and the introduction of others, whether by new creations or by immigration, a change must have taken place in regard to the particular plants conveyed about with them to foreign countries. As for example, when one set of migratory birds is substituted for another, the countries from and to which seeds are transported are immediately changed. Vicissitudes, therefore, analogous to those which man has occasioned, may have previously attended the springing up of new relations between species in the vegetable and animal worlds. It may also be remarked that if man is the most active agent in enlarging, so also is he in circumscribing the geographical boundaries of particular plants. He promotes the migration of some, he retards that of other species, so that while in many respects he appears to be exerting his power to blend and confound the various provinces of indigenous species, he is, in other ways, instrumental in obstructing the fusion into one group of the inhabitants of contiguous provinces. Thus, for example, when two botanical regions exist in the same great continent, such as the European region, comprehending the central parts of Europe, and those surrounding the Mediterranean, and the Oriental region, as it has been termed, embracing the countries adjoining the Black Sea and the Caspian, the interposition between these of thousands of square miles of cultivated lands opposes a new and powerful barrier against the mutual interchange of indigenous plants. Botanists are well aware that garden plants naturalize and diffuse themselves with great facility in comparatively unreclaimed countries, but spread themselves slowly and with difficulty in districts highly cultivated. There are many obvious causes for this difference. By drainage and culture, the natural variety of stations is diminished, and those stray individuals by which the passage of a species from one fit station to another is effected are no sooner detected by the agriculturalist than they are uprooted as weeds. The larger shrubs and trees in particular can scarcely ever escape observation when they have attained a certain size, and will rarely fail to be cut down if unprofitable. The same observations are applicable to the interchange of the insects, birds, and quadrupeds of two regions situated like those above alluded to. No beasts of prey are permitted to make their way across the intervening arable tracts. 
many birds and hundreds of insects, which would have found some palatable food amongst the various herbs and trees of the primeval wilderness, are unable to subsist on the olive, the vine, the wheat, and a few trees and grasses favored by man. In addition, therefore, to his direct intervention, man in this case operates indirectly to impede the dissemination of plants by intercepting the migration of animals, many of which would otherwise have been active in transporting seeds from one province to another. Whether in the vegetable kingdom the influence of man will tend, after a considerable lapse of ages, to render the geographical range of species in general more extended, as de Candolle seems to anticipate, or whether the compensating agency above alluded to will not counterbalance the exceptions caused by our naturalizations, admits at least of some doubt. In the attempt to form an estimate on this subject, we must be careful not to underrate, or almost overlook, as some appear to have done, the influence of man in checking the diffusion of plants and restricting their distribution to narrower limits. End of chapter 37, part 2